The tale unfolds in Manhattan, New York, USA, where a sudden alert signals the beginning of a crucial defense mission. Observing the heavens, players see the sky bleed crimson as an ominous entity shreds through the cosmos. A colossal beast, known as the Behemoth, emerges, its mere presence causing turmoil. With a deafening roar, it challenges humanity's defenders. Despite their fear, the players remain undeterred, rallying together to confront this formidable adversary. Trade their goal is clear, defeat the Behemoth or face the world's end. This dire scenario originated in 2010 with the inception of Fablinae, initially a friendly global competition. However, the narrative shifted dramatically in 2022 with the Space League's establishment, transforming the contest into an existential struggle against extraterrestrial foes. Humanity's resilience has been tested, and by 2023, only 10 nations persevere on Earth. The current assault by the behemoth marks yet another trial, as players from diverse backgrounds unite against a common enemy from the stars. In the midst of devastation, humanity's survival hung by a thread with many falling to the behemoth's might. It was then that a mysterious figure emerged, gazing upon the beast with disdain. The behemoth, sensing a new challenger, unleashed its fury upon him, and phased, the man charged forward, effortlessly parrying the assault with his arm before delivering a devastating punch. This strike caused the earth to fracture, leaving the other players in awe of the impact's aftermath. To their astonishment, this enigmatic individual had vanquished the behemoth single-handedly, signaling the completion of the USA Division's mission. This hero was identified as Song Jihan, securing the seventh rank among players globally. Amidst the victory, a voice echoed from a high vantage point. Baron Williams, the world's premier player and guild leader of our main protagonist, publicly celebrated their triumph and extolled their homeland's valor. As he spoke, a priestess approached Jahan. Though some players initially sought to intervene, Baron allowed her passage, hinting at a deeper contemplation stirred by the encounter with the behemoth's formidable strength. As the woman known as Sophia the Priestess, near Jahan, she noticed his wounded arm and promptly cast a healing spell, cautioning him of the discomfort it might cause due to the dark energy it countered. Jihan braved through the pain until a radiant golden light materialized before him, revealing a treasure chest, a bounty for conquering the formidable enemy. At this moment, Baron, overseeing the proceedings, advised restraint and declared his intention to allocate the spoils. Despite some players expressing discontent over Baron claiming the victory, his unparalleled strength left them no room to contest. Baron then addressed the first American guild, initiating the reward distribution process. Sophia and Jihan could only observe, hopeful yet anxious. Ultimately, only the elite five were honored, leaving Jihan unrewarded. Sophia attempted to voice their dissent, arguing the injustice, given Jihan's pivotal role in the monster's defeat. However, Baron remained firm, justifying his decision with the rationale that Jihan, despite being naturalized, was not regarded as a full-fledged member due to his foreign origins. Jihan, viewed as a valuable asset by his peers, received advice from Sophia to disregard the disdain. He was indifferent to the disregard and acknowledged Baron's point. After all, Jihan had fled as a refugee when his homeland was destroyed. Amidst these reflections, Jihan unlocked a triple S-ranked skill named Nameless Divine Arts, a power that had propelled him to seventh in the global rankings. Despite facing discrimination due to his nationality, such treatment scarcely affected him. What weighed heavily on him was the survivor's guilt, being the lone survivor from Korea, feeling powerless at the crucial time. He then focused on healing himself, as the mission's outcome was imminent. Shortly, a notification updated all players on the Bronze League demotion mission's results. This defense mission was critical for the remaining countries on Earth. The USA and China had successfully navigated through the challenge, whereas Russia had not. The fate of Japan and other nations followed a similar pattern, highlighting the global scale of the struggle for survival. Upon the conclusion of the defense mission, it was revealed that only two of the ten nations had prevailed, marking a significant loss in humanity's battle to avoid demotion. Subsequently, a notification was broadcasted, announcing that the survivors would next confront the orcs, a species that had similarly failed their mission. This revelation incited widespread alarm. Sophia urgently communicated to Baron the critical need for Jahan's participation in the upcoming final confrontation, given his unique victory over the orcs in the past. However, Baron, entrenched in his pride, dismissed the suggestion, asserting they would proceed without Jihan. The moment arrived to summon the champions from each surviving planet. Baron, alongside four other elite players, took the stage, openly deriding the orcs as adversaries and branding them with contempt. His team comprised the top players from his guild and an esteemed Chinese competitor. Clenching his fist, Baron exuded confidence, convinced of their ability to triumph without Jihan's aid. As the battle commenced, the number one ranked player radiated a formidable aura, signaling his readiness to single-handedly face the orcish threat. In the climax of the battle, Baron charged with full determination towards the Orc Horde, 
aiming to secure a victory in this final confrontation. Yet, in an unforeseen turn, a formidable orc swiftly outmaneuvered him, accomplishing what many thought impossible. The accompanying rankers and worldwide viewers, including Jihan, watched in shock as the Earth's strongest player was decapitated, a grim notification confirming Baron's demise shortly after. This event plunged humanity into despair, as one by one the other champions fell to the orcs' superior might. Ultimately, only the priestess remained, yet even she could not withstand their onslaught. With humanity's defeat imminent, the orcs mockingly thanked them for their weakness, sealing the fate of the human race in the Space League. With no lower league to be demoted to, humanity was deemed expendable, facing expulsion from the cosmic competition. A dark aura then enveloped Earth, expanding rapidly to consume everything in its path. Jihan, witnessing the unfolding disaster, found himself powerless against the engulfing darkness. As he was drawn into the void, he contemplated the grim reality that this could be the end of the world, reflecting on the harrowing journey and the ultimate demise of humanity's place among the stars. As the dark aura expanded, transforming into a devastating mini-black hole, Earth was on the brink of obliteration within seconds. No force seemed capable of withstanding such a cataclysm. Amidst this chaos, a notification declared humanity's complete erasure. Yet, in an unforeseen twist, an error surfaced. Jehan alone survived. His triple S-ranked skill, nameless divine arts, somehow defied this dire fate. Confused and bewildered, he pondered what could have been done differently, questioning whether this skill could have saved all if only he had been stronger. Suddenly, a flurry of notifications appeared. Resembling a dialogue, one message stood out, offering him a second chance. These communications originated from enigmatic entities, observers of the unfolding tragedy, who unanimously decided to grant Jehan a new beginning. Transported back to the initial area of the League, the engulfing darkness dissipated around him, signaling a fresh start. Jihan was then roused from this surreal experience by the familiar sound of his television, suggesting a return to a reality once thought lost. Verging from the throes of a hangover, Jihan found himself enveloped in confusion. His last memory was of Earth's annihilation. It took a moment for reality to settle in as he pieced together his surroundings, approaching the window to validate his suspicions. He recognized the landscape of South Korea in the year 2020. Observing children emulating the renowned sword King Yoon and overhearing conversations about gaming, clarity dawned on him. He had returned to the past. Checking his status window, Jihan discovered he was at level 2, precisely where he had started his first leak. A smile crept across his face, buoyed by the realization that he had been granted a second chance. Armed with the knowledge of his previous life, he recognized the unparalleled advantage he now possessed. With renewed determination, Jihan gazed at a family portrait, resolved to alter the future and safeguard everyone this time. Jihan, the sole witness to humanity's final moments, found himself back in 2020, poised to alter mankind's destiny. At this time, South Korea was a powerhouse in the global rankings, boasting a lineup of top players with one individual, Yeon Seijin, dominating the third spot. Known as the Sword King for his mastery with dual swords, Yeon was a pivotal force keeping South Korea at the forefront of competition. Celebrated as the nation's treasure and the strongest warrior worldwide, Yeon's reputation was unchallenged until a turning point in July 2020. In a move that sent shockwaves across Korea, he renounced his nationality to become a Japanese citizen, coinciding with Jihan's regression. This decision caused a stir, placing South Korea's standing in jeopardy. The media frenzy around Yoon's defection and the public's concern over their competitive edge underscored the gravity of his departure. Jihan, bearing the burden of knowledge from the future, understood the implications of losing such a formidable guardian for the nation's rank. In the aftermath of Yuan Saijin's departure, South Korea found itself in turmoil. While some journalists remained optimistic, believing the presence of other formidable rankers would stabilize the situation, this hopeful outlook ultimately contributed to the nation's downfall. The void left by Yeon could not be filled, a fact that became painfully evident with the advent of Battle.net's evolution into the Space League. This transformation from a mere game to a survival battleground, where the stakes included the players' lives in both the virtual and real world, escalated the intensity of competition. The inclusion of real-life peril and the emergence of monsters in lower-ranked countries precipitated a calamitous one-sided battle. Korea's descent in the ranking spell disaster leading to its eventual ruin. Survivors lamented, believing that if Yeon Saijin had remained, their fate could have been markedly different. His departure had a profound impact on the nation's morale and survival chances. Jihan, now understanding the full extent of this tragedy, discovered a personal connection to the Sword King. Yeon was his brother-in-law. Overcome with anger, he destroyed Yoon's portrait, reflecting on his sister's choices and questioning how she could have loved such a man. He pondered on the different outcomes had she been alive, 
indicating a complex web of familial and national loyalties intertwined with the fate of South Korea amidst the global crisis. Confronting the stark reality, Jihan acknowledged his insufficient strength, attributing it to his past indulgences in gambling and drinking rather than honing his abilities. In a world where turning 18 meant becoming a player, with a select few receiving special gift, Jihan's F-rank gift had been squandered on trivial pursuits like betting on matches. Only when his gift awoke did its true potential begin to dawn on him, leaving him to wonder how he managed to ascend to level 2 amidst his low stats. His journey to this realization was marked by a comedic mishap, inadvertently consuming an experienced potion among his liquor stash, which unexpectedly elevated his level, and the discovery of a hundred thousand achievement points in his possession further mystified him, especially given their perceived insignificance due to their non-monetary value. His inventory held an even greater surprise, an achievement points exchange coupon, a boon for being the sole survivor of a dire challenge. Opting to utilize the coupon, Jihan unlocked an achievement store, yet found the initial offerings underwhelming and deterred. He upgraded the store, reaching level 3 only to find the available items still lacking in utility. With each upgrade demanding an escalating number of points, the next requiring 40,000, Jihan faced a dilemma. Inherently a gambler, he contemplated his next move. Take a risk or secure all accessible items in hopes of turning his fortunes around. Opting for the strategic upgrade, Jihan unlocked a feature named Urgent Restoration, enabling the restoration of any damaged item to its pristine condition. With access to Yon Seijin's game room via fingerprint recognition, he was amused to find the security system still granted him entry in the absence of the original owner. Within the game room, his target was the Battlenic Connector's inventory, specifically Dom Fong Xu's damaged brush. Though originally in a rank item, its value was diminished due to its broken state. Utilizing his newly acquired Urgent Restoration ability, Jahan swiftly repaired the item. In moments, the once defective brush transformed into a formidable double S rank artifact, now linked to the Martial God. The artifact resonated with Jihan's touch, delivering a prompt message about the commencement of the Bronze League's teaching phase. Time was of the essence, and with urgency, Jihan accessed his status window. Employing the brush, he fine-tuned his stats, recalling this pivotal action that once propelled him to the seventh rank globally and bestowed upon him the esteemed title of Martial Saint. Now Jihan was in the process of merging his fundamental attributes into a singular, exceptional stat, leveraging his second chance to rewrite his destiny and alter the course of humanity. Utilizing the unique brush, Jihan endeavored to reclaim the martial prowess that once defined him. The artifact's restoration, pivotal to his awakening, was once again his focus. As he manipulated its power, his foundational stats began merging into a singular force. However, time was against him. The transformation remained ambiguous until the final second. As the countdown concluded, Jihan was thrust into the Battle Net League's Coliseum, alongside 100 other players and various monsters, to revival until half were eliminated. Jihan found himself among competitors of far superior levels. His anxiety peaked, uncertain of his awakening's completion. Yet, upon reviewing his status window, relief washed over him. His stats had unified. This accomplishment not only awarded him 10,000 points from the system, but also reignited a sense of familiarity and anticipation. With this singular stat, Jihan was closer to reclaiming the nameless divine art, an achievement that once propelled him to the world's seventh rank. This special stat, now at his command, held the promise of a renewed path to greatness. Aware of the Bronze League's forthcoming challenges, Jihan learned from the system that he had entered the game without a battle connector. This omission meant experiencing the full extent of pain within the game, a realization that brought a resigned sigh. He reflected on the game's mechanics, which seemed to favor those who could afford to mitigate pain through advanced technology. The only individual he knew who had reduced pain sensation to nearly non-existent levels was Yun Saijin, thanks to his access to cutting-edge equipment. Jihan planned to utilize such a connector himself once he gained entry to Sejin's quarters. The system presented Jihan with a concise mission in the tutorial with a reward of 1,000 achievement points. His confidence surged, recognizing the unique opportunity this mission presented, especially now that he wielded substantial martial capabilities. As the game commenced, an unexpected challenge quickly arose. Another player, attempting a surprise attack, mockingly bid Jihan farewell. However, astonishment replaced the attacker's mockery as Jihan halted the assault with merely two fingers, demonstrating his newfound power and readiness for the trials ahead. Jihan rekindled his passion for the game, rediscovering the exhilarating thrill derived from outmaneuvering and defeating other players. Within this virtual world, guilds played a pivotal role, acting as collectives that nurtured and managed the careers of numerous contenders. The global excitement surrounding Battle.net had led to substantial investments, particularly in South Korea, 
where renowned corporations expedited the formation of formidable guilds. These entities were instrumental in cultivating a roster of adept players from the outset. Presently, the Bronze League served as a fertile ground for these guilds to scout for emerging talent. As the commencement of the game neared, Jihan assessed his competitors, mentally placing the Gangam League a notch above in terms of skill level. Despite the burgeoning pressure, he reminded himself of his unique position. Known in the arena as Duhuchu, he boasted an affiliation with the Divergent Guild, an organization under the Divergent Group banner, celebrated for propelling numerous players to stardom. Fortuitously, Duhuchu had been endowed with a high-ranking gift of agility, enhancing his agility stat by 25 points. This boon bolstered his confidence, recognizing the rarity and value of such a gift among the players. With renewed vigor, he surveyed his surroundings, identifying potential rivals, his very presence instilling a sense of unease among the other participants. Upon recognizing Du Hukju's formidable presence, the other contenders grew apprehensive, but Du Hukju himself was amused, confident in his superiority over most. His primary mission, to survive, seemed attainable from the onset. Yet he also noted competitors from well-established guilds, equipped with high-ranking items. Among them, he spotted an anomaly Jihan seemingly underprepared without any visible gear. Du Hukju speculated Jihan's presence might have been an error, presenting what appeared to be an effortless target, gratefully acknowledging what he perceived as fortune, Du Hukju poised himself for what he assumed would be an easy victory. As the game initiated, Du Hukju charged at Jihan, only to realize his gross miscalculation. The moment Jihan thwarted his assault with mere fingers and matched his agility, Du Hukju's arrogance turned to shock. Jihan's subsequent maneuver releasing the sword sent Du Hukju reeling. Mockingly, Jihan expressed gratitude for Du Hukju's misplaced confidence, despite his evident high-ranking agility gift. This taunt incensed Du Hukju, transforming his initial annoyance into serious contention. With his pride wounded and resolve hardened, Du Hukju prepared to engage with all his might, signaling a pivotal clash. Anticipating his adversary's tactics, Jihan braced for Du Hukju's speed, a trait he presumed still surpassed his own. However, he was momentarily taken aback as Du Hukju rapidly closed the distance between them, skillfully evading the onslaught. Jihan found himself struggling to adapt to his comparatively sluggish form. Despite Du Hukju's swift movements, his attack patterns were predictably straightforward, allowing Jihan to anticipate and counter every move. Du Hukju's final attempt to dominate was effortlessly neutralized by Jihan, who responded with a mere slap. This simple act left Du Hukju's confidence shattered, his hands trembling from the unexpected defeat. Seizing the opportunity, Jihan quickly reclaimed the sword Du Hukju had inadvertently discarded. Caught unprepared by Jihan's swift countermeasure, Du Hukju was left grappling with the reality of his underestimated opponent. This encounter underscored Jihan's tactical prowess and adaptability, even when faced with the limitations of his current physical state. With a swift and decisive strike, Jihan eliminated his opponent, aware that the pain experienced in the game would resonate fully with the player's real body. Du Hukju, although defeated, vowed vengeance against Jihan in their next encounter, a statement that brought a nostalgic smile to Jihan's face. It reminded him of times when fallen players would resurrect after battles in Battle.net. For achieving the first kill in the mission, the system rewarded Jihan with 100 achievement points. However, the weapon he had used, borrowed from his vanquished foe, vanished post-victory. Surveying the arena for his next challenge, Jihan noted the player's collective avoidance of the monsters. Given that each monster accounted for merely 0.1 points, engaging them was generally deemed inefficient. Despite this common strategy, Jihan's perspective shifted when a quest emerged, tasking him with the elimination of all orcs for a reward of 500 points. This substantial incentive compelled him to reconsider his approach, now seeing value in confronting these creatures to bolster his standing in the league. With a grin, Jihan reflected on the disparity between these virtual orcs and the formidable adversaries he had encountered in his past life. His demeanor shifted from amusement to determination as he advanced towards the orc horde. The orcs observing his rapid approach were initially bewildered. A lone human challenging their multitude seemed reckless, Yet undeterred by their numerical advantage, they launched their attack, hurling two axes towards Jihan. Demonstrating superior skill, he effortlessly caught the axes, then showcased their intended use with precision, instilling fear with a single demonstration. Jihan's strategy was methodical. He positioned himself at the core of the orc group, an optimal spot for swiftly diminishing their ranks. His mastery over the axe sent adversaries to their demise, each swing severing heads with lethal efficiency. Despite the orcs' concerted efforts to overwhelm him, Jihan anticipated their every move, pairing attacks with ease. The noise of the battle, particularly the orcs' clamorous outbursts, was the only aspect that grated on him. However, this minor irritation did not hinder his progress. 
If anything, it fueled his resolve to silence their cacophony with decisive action. Jihan advised the orcs to procure more formidable weapons for their next encounter, highlighting the inadequacy of their current arsenal. The moment his weapon shattered, it alerted the orcs, spurring them into a frenzied charge. However, their aggression only served to irritate Jihan further. His powerful stomp created a tremor, unsettling the orcs' stance and presenting him with an opportune moment to conclude the quest. Armed with his sword and newfound agility, he decimated the orc ranks, their attempts at defense futile against his onslaught. Eventually, wielding dual weapons with adeptness, he launched a spear with such force it impaled the remaining adversary. To the orcs, Jihan transcended humanity. His prowess elevated him to the status of a mythic entity. With the completion of the quest and the acquisition of 500 points, Jihan unexpectedly leveled up during the game. A rare occurrence as experience points are typically tallied post-match, this anomaly did not detract from his focus. Instead, he perused his status window for a skill upgrade, his attention drawn to martial power. This skill, enhancing strength, speed, and stamina, promised to double the efficacy of his basic attributes. By allocating points to martial power, he edged closer to regaining the nameless divine arts. Jihan's successful enhancement of this skill, despite conventional limitations, puzzled him. Yet he recognized the strategic advantage it conferred, further solidifying his dominance within the game. Jihan reveled in the newfound ease of enhancing his martial power skill, a stark departure from the traditional method of rigorous warrior training and battle experience previously required. His contemplation was swiftly interrupted by an incoming arrow, which he dodged effortlessly. The archer alongside a warrior companion, both members of the Turtle Guild, one of Korea's top ten guilds, were astonished by Jihan's agility. Despite the PvP nature of the map, alliances were not uncommon, and it seemed these two had formed such a pact. As the system announced the remaining 60 players, Jihan considered the possibility of survival by mere evasion. However, his observation of the duo's disregard for him, with the warrior attempting to court the archer, refocused his strategy. Glancing at the scoreboard, Jihan's tally stood at four kills, placing him in the lead. Yet to secure his dominant position and ensure victory, he recognized the necessity of further action. This realization propelled him to strategize beyond simple survival, aiming to actively engage and outmaneuver his competitors to clinch the top spot in this fiercely competitive environment. Devising a quick strategy, Jihan observed as the archer, distracted by her own mockery, failed to notice an impending strike. She was swiftly eliminated by Jihan, her derision cut short. The warrior now alone was engulfed by a mix of fear and anger upon witnessing his comrade's defeat. Despite his bravado, backed by superior equipment courtesy of his affiliation with the top guild, he boasted about the invincibility of his armor. Jihan, undeterred, focused his attacks on a singular point of the warrior's armor, exploiting a vulnerability that eventually led to its fracture and the warrior's downfall. Jihan's irritation grew, not just from the warrior's overconfidence in his gear, but from the frivolity with which both opponents treated the combat. Oblivious to the imminent danger, their defeat was marked by a scream echoing throughout the Colosseum, signaling yet another victory for Jihan. Meanwhile, outside the immediate frenzy of battle, Two individuals were engrossed in a recording of the game, witnessing the unfolding events in Jihan's tactical prowess from a distance. Li Haiyan, the third division head of the Divergent Guild, watched in surprise as the game unfolded. Accompanied by her bodyguard Lim Gan, she expressed relief that Gan had not encountered Jihan, fearing a potential defeat. The final scoreboard revealed Jihan's six kills to Gan's four, prompting a mix of annoyance and competitiveness in Gan. Despite initial doubts, Han boldly retracted her earlier sentiment asserting her ability to surpass Jihan in combat. Together, they schemed to challenge Jihan, aiming to dissect his combat strategy for future encounters. As they observed Jihan's dismantling of the Turtle Guild's high-level players, Heian pondered Jihan's familiarity, while Lim Gan, a noted talent within the Divergent Guild known for her S-rank gift and stellar performance, reflected on her own standing. Previously anticipated to dominate the Bronze League, her spotlight was usurped by RMC, who emerged as a dark horse, capturing the top position. This unexpected turn of events left the Turtle Guild's scout in disbelief, as their hopes were dashed by Jihan's prowess. The gaming community's focus abruptly shifted towards this enigmatic level 2 player, sparking widespread curiosity about his identity and the implications of his sudden rise to prominence within the competitive landscape. Perched high in a skyscraper, Jihan meticulously reviewed the scoreboard to affirm his leading position. The victory not only escalated his experience by 50, but also elevated his level to 6 a rapid ascent that brought him immense satisfaction. Reveling in the novelty of being a fledgling player enriched by an abundance of points, he allocated his accrued bonuses to enhance his martial power from six to nine. Furthermore, 
His achievements in the tutorial earned him the moniker Tutorial Conqueror, bestowing upon him a universal attribute boost and a 20 increase in experience gain within the Bronze League. Despite its temporary advantage, Jihan appreciated this early game elevation. His updated status, displaying 10 martial power points, promised a substantial edge in the Bronze League. The leap to the Silver League mandated players reach at least level 25, a criterion Jihan noted as he perused his status window. Remarkably, he had unlocked the opportunity for class advancement, a milestone attainable upon reaching level 5. This advancement was pivotal, offering a selection among archer, mage, support, and warrior classes, recalling his past experiences. Jahan understood the significance of this decision in shaping his journey forward. Opting for the warrior class, a path previously traversed, Jihan leveraged his experience for greater mastery. However, his strategic insight revealed another path. The opportunity to acquire an additional class via the achievement store. This revelation poised him at a pivotal crossroads, allowing him to potentially harness dual class capabilities. An unparalleled advantage. With this possibility in mind, Jihan anticipated further diversifying his skill set beyond his warrior expertise. As the next mission unfolded, the system ushered players into the Gangnam area's Bronze League, introducing a defense-themed mission. Participants found themselves atop towering structures, tasked with safeguarding a crystal while surviving against relentless zombie hordes. Among the summoned was Lim Gain, a fellow warrior class player, who despite her digital environment, found the zombies dauntingly realistic. Her team expanded with the arrival of two bright lights, signaling the addition of an archer affiliated with the Elk group, equipped with B-grade gear, and a guild independent mage boasting noteworthy equipment. Anticipation hung in the air as they awaited the arrival of their final teammate, expected to be pivotal in their collective success against the impending challenges. The emergence of a bright light heralded the arrival of the eagerly awaited support player. For a mission anticipated to be a drawn-out conflict, the role of support was deemed indispensable. Yet, the identity of this new support player brought a wave of confusion. It was Jihan, a choice that surprised his teammates despite the system's repeated queries about his unconventional class selection, given its apparent mismatch with his skill set and attributes. Jihan remained steadfast in his decision to pursue the support class. Jihan's choice was motivated by a strategic long-term goal, the divine power intrinsic to the support class. This power was essential for enhancing a unique stat he aimed to develop. However, elevating this divine power posed a significant challenge as conventional training methods were ineffective. The only feasible strategy to augment this power was through the allocation of points, a route Jihan was initially reluctant to take, suggesting he had alternative plans for enhancing his capabilities within this new role. Jihan remained committed to channeling his points into martial power, aiming to reclaim the nameless divine arts. His unique insight into enhancing divine powers without direct investment showcased his strategic depth. Amidst the team dynamics, Gan was taken aback by Jihan's choice of the support class, an unexpected development that provoked skepticism among the team. The mage openly criticized Jihan's equipment, dismissively branding him as underprepared and inept. Despite the archer's attempts to quell the derision, the mage persisted, drawing Gan's ire with the unnecessary noise. However, the situation escalated when Jihan, unfazed by the verbal jabs, demonstrated his physical prowess by hoisting the mage into the air. The mage's threats dissolved into fear as he was unceremoniously hurled into the zombie-infested battleground below. Gan and the archer watched in disbelief as Jihan made a resolute statement about the team's ability to progress without the mage if necessary. This bold act not only silenced the dissent, but also underscored Jihan's serious approach to the mission at hand, indicating his readiness to cut loose any element that threatened team cohesion. Following the unsettling encounter, the mage, Kim Chiu Hik, adopted a markedly respectful demeanor towards Jihan, earnestly seeking his pardon. This abrupt shift was prompted by a unique mechanic within battle in its defense game, where each player was allotted three lives. Kim Ju Huk's hasty reconciliation was driven by the loss of two lives to the zombies, courtesy of Jihan's decisive actions. Now teetering on his final life, Kim Ju Huk endeavored to curry favor with Jihan, acutely aware that another death would not only plummet his scoreboard ranking, but also result in significant setbacks including the potential loss of levels and the investments made towards his skills and equipment. Jihan remained cautious, pondering the possibility of Kim Jihook's retaliation. Yet, in a strategic move, he complimented Kim Jihook's use of fire magic, a gesture that seemed to mollify the mage. Void by Jihan's acknowledgement, Kim Jihook's confidence surged, and he began to boast about his level 15 status, convinced of his fire magic's efficacy against the encroaching zombie horde. This newfound camaraderie, albeit fragile, hinted at the potential for a more harmonious collaboration in overcoming the challenges ahead. You can observe the unfolding dynamics. 
recognizing the mage Kim Jehuk as a former luminary of a prestigious guild whose downfall was precipitated by his arrogance and repetitive blunders. Despite Jehan's initial willingness to collaborate for the mission's success, Kim Juhuk's insistence on an apology from Jehan overstepped the bounds, triggering a confrontation. The archer viewed this demand as a necessary step towards team cohesion, a perspective not shared by Jehan. In an unexpected turn, Jehan's patience snapped, leading to Kim Juhuk's abrupt expulsion for the second time. Kim Juhuk's pleas for mercy were unavailing as Jehan, undeterred, launched him once more into the fray, this time with a bat in hand. Jehan's refusal to apologize, coupled with a decisive strike, culminated in Kim Juhuk's final defeat. This action left Gan and the archer in disbelief, their concern mounting as the zombie horde advanced. While other players benefited from their mage's pyrotechnic defense, Gan Jihan and the archer faced a precarious situation. The archer lamented the loss of their mage, suggesting that humility on Jihan's part could have averted the crisis. However, Jihan remained resolute, undistracted by the criticism. Jihan's attention was captivated by a challenging mission within his status window, the task of eliminating 1,000 zombies single-handedly. Despite his seasoned prowess, the mission's daunting objective, coupled with a stringent time constraint, seemed an insurmountable feat. Yet the lure of accruing points sparked his determination to devise a strategy for completion. Gan, still reeling from Jahan's earlier actions, began to question his motives, labeling him as a potentially disruptive troll player. His unorthodox approach and exceptional strength juxtaposed with his selection of the support class, puzzled her, leading to doubts about his suitability for the Divergent Guild. Meanwhile, the archer's frustration with Jihan's dismissive attitude reached a tipping point, prompting him to challenge Jihan to confront the zombie menace solo. This challenge inadvertently inspired Jihan, igniting a spark of excitement at the prospect of tackling the mission head-on. However, Gan's proposition to take the forefront in battle, offering Jihan and the archer a defensive role, was met with an unexpected counterproposal from Jihan, Asserting his readiness to lead the vanguard, he instructed Gan to assume the protective role for the archer. As the zombie onslaught advanced, a peculiar foe emerged. A blood zombie, distinguished by its liquid head, rendering it impervious to conventional attacks. Against the odds, Yihan dispatched the formidable adversary with a singular, powerful strike, leaving Gan and the archer in a state of disbelief. Jihan's ability to vanquish such a unique threat single-handedly shattered their preconceived notions of support characters underscoring his unparalleled competence and versatility. Jihan unleashed his divine powers, facing the relentless onslaught of zombies with potent, precise strikes. Each blow was delivered with meticulous accuracy, underscoring his determination to fulfill the mission despite the overwhelming odds. Initially, the tally of vanquished zombies was modest, but as Jihan persevered, his count impressively escalated to 26. The presence of blood zombies posed a unique challenge necessitating the use of his divine powers for their defeat. Motivated by the need for a decisive victory, Jihan strategized to eliminate the zombie horde in a single, grand maneuver. Meanwhile, his teammates, mesmerized by his prowess, regarded him with newfound respect. The archer enveloped in a radiant aura, marveled at Jihan's professionalism, while Gan, equally impressed by his skillful precision, realized the critical role Jihan played in their survival. As Jihan's battle raged on, his divine powers became increasingly manifest, surrounding him in an ethereal glow. With a total of 210 zombies defeated, he edged closer to his ambitious target, his actions not just a testament to his strength, but also a beacon of hope for his team. Through his exceptional display of control and power, Jihan transformed the perilous mission into a spectacle of resilience and mastery. Jihan's successful enhancement of his divine power through an unconventional method marked a significant milestone. His knowledge of divine items, once highly prized artifacts scattered across Earth and revered as sacred in 2010, played a crucial role. Initially, these items commanded exorbitant prices, fueled by players' beliefs in their hidden potential. However, as the years passed without any discovery of their purported secrets, their value plummeted, leading to widespread disinterest and skepticism about their usefulness. To many contemporary players, the existence and potential of these divine items had become an obscure piece of history. Jihan's perspective on these divine items underwent a transformative shift following his encounter with Sophia. She disclosed her ability to augment her divine powers through these items, a revelation that piqued Jihan's interest. According to Sophia, divine objects could indeed amplify a player's divine powers, albeit this effect was most potent during the tutorial phase. Her ascension to sainthood was attributed to this very practice, holding a divine item in solemn prayer to gradually increase her divine power stat. Although the activation of these items varied, requiring distinct approaches, their efficacy was undeniable. Inspired by Sophia's insights, 
Jihan recognized the untapped potential of divine items as a means to bolster his own divine powers, a strategy that diverged from conventional leveling methods yet promised a unique advantage in his quest for mastery. Jihan was astounded by the simplicity of enhancing his divine stat, a process made feasible by the widespread disregard for divine items. Sophia's strategic acquisition of these artifacts at minimal cost was a testament to their underestimated value. Yet, she wasn't the sole purchaser, indicating another player's awareness of their potential. Upon returning home, Jihan's discovery in a penthouse room, dozens of divine objects devoid of power confirmed his suspicion. The other collector was none other than Xiang Jiu Hong, his sister and a revered support figure in South Korea's gaming realm. Renowned for her prowess and partnership with the Sword King, her husband, her legacy included not just her fame but also the divine items she amassed. Among these remnants was a steel pole, its divine power nearly depleted yet still holding potential. Jihan recognized its latent ability to be further empowered, notably through an unconventional method, striking the heads of cult members. This revelation not only illuminated the pole's unique capabilities, but also hinted at the broader strategies employed by those who had once harnessed the divine item's power, revealing a layer of complexity in their use and significance. Armed with the steel pole, Jihan adeptly navigated the battlefield, leveraging the weapon's unique ability to absorb divine power through the act of combating zombies. Despite the item's diminishing grade, it remained a potent tool against the monstrous horde. Gan witnessing Jihan's exceptional control and effectiveness couldn't help but be impressed. Amidst the chaos, the archer's alert about a nearby tower's failure brought a momentary distraction, only to be swiftly managed by Gan's display of swordsmanship, earning Jihan's attentive gaze. Recognizing her as the Plum Blossom Sword, a title from his past life, Jihan recollected Gan's reputation as the interim Sword King and her tragic fate at the hands of the original Sword King, Yeon Seijin. This moment of reminiscence was interrupted by Gan's inquiry about joining forces to combat the zombies suggesting that teamwork could expedite their ascent to the top ranking. Jihan, pondering this proposition, consulted the status window to evaluate their current standing, contemplating the potential of their combined efforts to navigate the challenges ahead. Position fifth with a total of 398 zombie eliminations to his name, and only one hour and 28 minutes. Remaining, Jihan assessed the urgency of their situation, recognizing Gan's capability to handle the defense. He consented to her participation, aiming to maximize their chances for ascension in the ranks. His subsequent plunge into the zombie fray, armed with the intent to unleash a singular devastating strike, showcased a daring strategy. Empowering his weapon with divine powers, Jihan orchestrated a formidable assault, culminating in a sweeping victory that left their adversaries in awe. The system's announcement confirmed their status as the sole survivors, catapulting them to the top spot. Although Jihan successfully completed the limited quest event, he fell short of annihilating the targeted 560 zombies, marking the quest as incomplete. Yet, the conclusion of the game saw them victorious. In the aftermath, the archer's effusive gratitude towards Jihan underscored the pivotal role he played in their triumph. Unfazed by the accolades, Jihan's focus remained unwavering, a testament to his dedication and skill that not only secured their victory, but also solidified his legacy as a formidable player in the realm of Battle.net. Jihan was contemplating a future attempt at this stage, pondering the possibility of the quest's reappearance once he had gained more strength. Meanwhile, Gan was rooted to the spot, puzzled by Jihan's extraordinary performance. His ability to overpower the monsters, despite being a lower-level support player, left her questioning the reality of what she had witnessed. She speculated on the possibility of a glitch, her attention so consumed by her thoughts that she didn't hear Jihan's inquiry about how she knew his name, given that they hadn't met prior to this mission. As the archer logged out, still buoyed by their success, Gan approached Jihan, her professional focus driving her to consider the potential benefits of recruiting him to her guild. Convinced that Jihan's inclusion could elevate the guild to unprecedented heights, she impulsively asked for his phone number. Her realization of the forwardness of her request only dawned on her after it was made, leading to a moment of embarrassment. Jihan's repeated question about her earlier comment only added to her fluster. In this moment of confusion, Gan's affiliation with the Divergent Guild became apparent to Jihan. This revelation shed light on her intense interest in him, underlining the strategic significance she placed on his capabilities and the potential impact his joining could have on the guild's future achievements. Apologizing for his lapse, Jihan explained his inability to recall his phone number, a detail that left Gan without the opportunity to rectify the awkward moment. She pondered the plausibility of someone forgetting their own number, interpreting it as a polite rejection. Meanwhile, as Jihan made his way home, he reflected on his genuine unfamiliarity with his Korean contact details due to his recent years in America recognizing how peculiar it would seem to inquire about such basic information. 
This interaction led Jahan to speculate that Gan's intention might have been to recruit him into a guild. His rising prominence within the gaming community was becoming evident, with guilds starting to take notice. Despite this growing attention, Jihan harbored no aspirations of guild affiliation at the moment. He then reviewed his status window, noting a two-level increase in the acquisition of 150 points, a commendable progression especially considering the enhancement of his divine powers. However, the GP he accumulated was still insufficient for any significant purchases within the GP store, a minor setback in his ongoing journey through the gaming world. Contemplating the cost of items in the GP store, Jihan resolved not to make impulsive purchases, opting instead to sift through his sister's belongings for potentially valuable finds. Upon arriving home, the sight of a pair of shoes at the doorstep halted him in his tracks, stirring a mix of confusion and apprehension. The presence suggested an unexpected visitor, evoking memories of a figure pivotal yet sorrowfully missed from his past life. A guardian who had once vowed to protect him, a promise unfulfilled due to tragic circumstances. This woman who had consistently shown concern for Jihan, symbolized a poignant chapter of his life marked by loss and regret, particularly the heart-wrenching memory of his niece's demise. Her reappearance, astonishingly standing before him, rekindled emotions of a bygone era, blending disbelief with a resurgence of old bonds. Jihan was confronted with the vivid recollection of their shared past, a reminder of the strength and promises that once defined their relationship. Now standing as a testament to time's relentless march and the unexpected chances for reconciliation it occasionally presents. The realization that his Nisyan Sia was not just a lie but flourishing filled Jahan with a mix of joy and nostalgia. Sia on the cusp of adulthood at 18 was a direct link to both the revered Sword King and Jihan's sister, embodying a beacon of resilience and hope in the wake of her family's complexities. Her early return from Jiju, driven by the turmoil surrounding her father's controversial decision, underscored her singular position in Jihan's heart. Despite the shadows cast by her father's actions, Sia's unwavering smile remained a source of light and significance in Jihan's life. Jihan's concern deepened upon learning of Yoon Saijan's distressing call to Sia, revealing his newfound love and plans to start anew in Japan. Sia's unsuccessful attempts to sway her father's decision only added to Jihan's growing resentment towards the Sword King. This unfolding narrative, marked by personal upheavals and the resilience of those caught in their wake, painted a complex portrait of familial ties, tested loyalties, and the enduring strength of unconditional love amidst life's tumultuous chapters. Exhaling deeply, Jahan restrained his frustration in Sia's presence, recognizing the profound disregard Yuan Saiyajin exhibited towards his paternal responsibilities. The discovery of a shattered family photograph prompted Sia to mistakenly accuse Jahan of the act, to which he admitted his unintended anger. Yet Sia's admission of her own desire to break the photograph revealed her long-standing practice of concealing her emotions, a facade maintained even through her mother's death and her father's departure. Jihan acknowledged Sia's resilience, understanding her sacrifices were made to shield him, yet he affirmed she no longer needed to shoulder such burdens alone. His promise of protection marked a new chapter in their relationship, offering Sia the solace of genuine support. Meanwhile, at the Divergent Guild, Gan's recounting of her interaction with Jihan induced amusement in her boss, Lee Heian. However, Heian's laughter gave way to empathy as Gan expressed feelings of inadequacy hinting at a deeper issue of self-perception within the competitive environment of the guild. Heian, aware of Gan's unrecognized appeal and the potential for misunderstanding her comments as humility, advised caution to prevent misinterpretation among their peers. This moment of vulnerability and camaraderie between them transitioned to a lighter setting as they moved to the lounge, reflecting the complex dynamics of professional and personal identities in their guild life. Gan inquired about the recruitment of Jihan, to which Heian affirmed the necessity citing persistent demands from their guild's upper echelons. While enjoying tea, Heian received a notification for a live show and eagerly tuned in to watch her favorite gambler stream. Both Gan and Heian were taken aback to find Jihan, known for his uncanny predictive abilities in matches, featuring in the broadcast. Unbeknownst to Heian, she had been a fan of Jihan's online persona without recognizing his true identity. The turning point of the stream arrived as Jihan disclosed his connection to the Sword King, capturing the audience's attention by revealing his relationship as the brother-in-law to the legendary figure. The credibility of his claim was further solidified when viewers were introduced to his backdrop, prominently featuring the esteemed Sword Palace, and more so when Sia, identified as the Sword King's daughter, made an appearance. The revelation was underscored by a dramatic demonstration of Jihan's power, manifesting as an aura around his feet that caused significant fissures directed towards the twin sword statue, a revered symbol atop the Sword Palace, leaving the audience in awe and affirming his storied familial ties. The destruction of the Twin Sword statue, a celebrated landmark in Korea, by Jihan on his stream left viewers in a state of disbelief. 
Despite the historic significance of the site, Jihan proceeded with his demonstrative act, generating a whirlwind of mixed reactions among the audience. As the twin sword statue crumbled, the spectacle drew an overwhelming influx of viewers, catapulting the stream's viewership from 20,000 to over a million. This unprecedented action on Battletube, the premier streaming platform within the Battle.net ecosystem, known for its dominant market share, earned Jihan multiple achievements. Turning to address the camera, Jihan poised himself to discuss Yuan Saiyajin's change of citizenship, leveraging the platform's vast audience. By incorporating Sword King into his stream title, he effortlessly secured the platform's available rewards, catapulting him to instant internet fame. However, this fame was not without its detractors. Many viewers expressed their disapproval through dislike particularly those with profile pictures featuring the Twin Sword logo, signifying their allegiance to the legacy Jihan had symbolically challenged. The Twin Sword logo was emblematic of allegiance to Yon Saijin, the Sword King, and his fervent fan club, the Sword King family. Initially, this group's adoration supported Seijin decisions, but over time, admiration morphed into animosity, particularly towards Sia, Seijin's direct kin. Tragically, this shift in sentiment played a pivotal role in the events leading to Sia's demise. Jihan's recollection of these events stoked a deep-seated anger, yet it also ignited a determination to alter the trajectory of the future, seeking to capture the collective attention of both supporters and detractors. With resolve, Jihan announced to his audience the Yuan Seijin, now adopting the name Ida Ruhue, had definitively chosen not to return. His presentation took on a grave tone as he unveiled a recording substantiating his statements, revealing Saijin's abandonment of his daughter for another relationship. This revelation broadcast live sent shockwaves through the viewership, including Hyun and Gan, who were among the audience. The chat's ensuing silence mirrored the national disbelief. As the country grappled with the ramifications of the Sword King's actions, unveiled to an unsuspecting public by Jihan's calculated reveal. After halting the recording, Jihan turned to gauge Sia's reaction. To his relief, she exhibited a sense of liberation, now that the truth behind their abandonment was public. Sia then took the spotlight on the stream, identifying herself as the Sword King's daughter. In a bold move, she announced her decision to relinquish the Sword Palace to the Korean government, renouncing the inheritance from someone who forsake both his country and family. She envisioned the estate serving a new purpose, aiding the country's players. Jihan remained silent during Sia's declaration, reflecting on their conversation 30 minutes prior when she was taken aback by his suggestion to donate the estate. Sia's incredulity, questioning his sobriety and the rationale behind his drastic proposal, highlighted her struggle to understand his motives. In his past life, Jihan witnessed the escalating resentment towards Seijing compel the government to seize his properties leaving Sia destitute, struggling with the complexity of his foresight and its implications. Jahan found himself at a loss for words, unable to articulate the impending fate he sought to prevent. Sia's unanimous acceptance of Jihan's radical proposal left him both puzzled and moved, revealing a deep-seated trust in her uncle, a side of him she hadn't seen in years. Jihan marveled at Sia's maturity, recognizing her growth beyond the shadows of their shared past. Despite the Sword King family's attempts to sow distrust, portraying Jihan as a deceiver, he strategically absorbed their animosity to shield Sia from further harassment. In a dramatic turn, Jihan seized control of the livestream, diverging from the agreed-upon script to further discuss Seijin's actions and their implications. His bold declaration that Seijin, once revered as the Sword King, had diminished in significance within Korea, challenged Seijin to acknowledge his failed legacy. Jihan's provocation, suggesting Seijin's retreat to Japan was a result of his inability to succeed in Korea, rendered the audience speechless. Jihan's audacious challenge to Seijin promising a future confrontation ignited widespread anticipation for a Korea versus Japan showdown. This bold assertion redefined the narrative, casting Jihan not just as a critic of Seijin's choices, but as a formidable adversary in his own right, eager to defend his family's honor and his country's pride on an international stage. As darkness enveloped the sky, marking the stream's conclusion, Sia questioned Jihan about the necessity of his actions, which had ignited considerable debate across Korea and Japan. The magnitude of change in Jihan's demeanor since his revival from death left Sia feeling as though her uncle had transformed into an entirely different person. A sentiment Jihan anticipated, acknowledging the impossibility of remaining unchanged after such a profound experience. Their conversation was abruptly interrupted by the doorbell, sparking anxiety in Sia, who feared for her uncle's safety. However, Jihan reassured her, expecting the visitor to be a potential ally in their forthcoming endeavors. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, the news of the escalating tension between Japan and Korea reached Yon Saijin. The revelation stirred Shizuru who was with him. Upon learning of the situation, she addressed Seijin by his former title, 
though he preferred his new identity, Hairu Hino. Her embrace and insistence on calling him Yonsei, Ijin suggested a complex blend of personal and cultural identities, intertwining their past with the unfolding events triggered by Jihan's provocative stance. In Tokyo, amidst an enigmatic aura, Shizuru affirmed her love for Saiji, insisting that regardless of the name he chose, he would always remain Korea's revered sword king to her. Their moment of intimacy, sealed with a kiss, underscored her desire to have the sword king's allegiance for herself, a commitment symbolized by her opening the door to their future together. Back in Korea, the arrival of an unexpected guest caught Jihan's attention. Though his composed reaction suggested a degree of anticipation, the visitor Park Yunsik, the department manager of the South Korean Battlenet branch, had a history of involvement with Jihan and Sia during their family's tumultuous times. Unlike others who distanced themselves following the Sword King's departure, Yunsik remained a steadfast support to both Jihan and Sia, embodying a rare constant in their lives. As Yunsik stepped into their home, Jihan and Sia greeted him warmly, with Jihan perceiving his arrival as the alignment of crucial elements in a larger plan. Yunsik's return not only signified a rekindling of past affiliations, but also marked a pivotal moment for Jihan who viewed it as setting the stage for forthcoming endeavors and resolutions. The dialogue between Jihan and the Battle.net branch's department manager, Yunzik delved into the complexities surrounding the Sword King, Seijin absence, and its repercussions. Yunzik revealed that while the government had resigned to Sashi Jin permanent departure following Jihan's livestream revelation, this stance was not publicized, given the potential uproar among the citizens. Moreover, Yunzik expressed apprehensions about the anticipated match between South Korea and Japan, a subject on which Jihan was already well informed, prompting him to steer the conversation towards the crux of the matter. Jihan's foreknowledge of the government's intentions regarding the Sword Palace, specifically the proposal to halt the donation process until Sajan's situation was fully resolved, caught Yunzik off guard. Yunzik pondered how Jihan, once known for his less constructive habits, seemed transformed, possessing insights seemingly beyond his prior capacity. Yunzik then disclosed that the government, while not completely abandoning hope for Saijin's return, suggested an alternative to the Donak Ascent, a signed management agreement allowing the Sword Palace's stewardship to be transferred, ensuring its continued relevance and utility within the community. This proposal marked a significant shift, indicating a preference for operational continuity over outright ownership change. A proposal for Jihan and Sia to oversee the Sword Palace during the Sword King's absence was a serious consideration as confirmed by manager Yunzik's consultation. Yunzik even prepared formal documentation to solidify this interim arrangement, underscoring the government's commitment to their welfare and the maintenance of the palace. The detailed clauses within the contracts were meticulously designed to ensure mutual benefits, impressing Jihan with the government's thoroughness and effort. Jihan, appreciating the practicality of this arrangement, over an immediate donation, consented to the terms, albeit with the caveat that an additional requirement was yet to be disclosed leaving Sia in suspense regarding her uncle's further conditions. Golden Light, perched atop the Colosseum statue, launched his stream with a charismatic presence, immediately captivating his audience with a vibrant smile and aura. Today, he declared the broadcast would emanate from the blood-stained and dust-laden Colosseum, accentuating his entrance with a flair reminiscent of a superhero. Upon formally introducing himself as Golden Light, a generous viewer's donation of 100 GP aimed at incentivizing lessons for Bronze League players visibly astonished him. However, the reception among the players physically near him was far from welcoming. They regarded him with disdain. Golden Light's reputation preceded him. While his handsome appearance and lively demeanor were well acknowledged, it was his notoriety as a troll player that defined him in the gaming community. Notably, despite achieving status in the Gold League, he had intentionally demoted himself to the Bronze League, sparking a blend of anticipation and skepticism among the viewers and players alike regarding his true intentions behind the stream. Golden Light, reveling in his notoriety as the epitome of a troll, embarked on what he termed deep sea traveling, a euphemism for targeting weaker players in the game for his amusement. Despite the backlash, his amusement remained his paramount concern, his gold league caliber stats and equipment allowing him to dominate within the bronze league with ease, earning him the label of a lunatic among the community. In an attempt to lighten the atmosphere of his stream, Golden Light declared his intention to find his first victim of the day. It was then that Jihan caught his eye. Clad in simple sweatpants and wielding an unusual tool, Jihan's appearance intrigued Golden Light, who saw an opportunity to feature Jihan as the day's highlight on his stream. Approaching Jihan, Golden Light bombarded him with inquiries related to the Sword King, but Jihan found the streamer's boisterous demeanor more distracting than engaging. Observing Golden Light's livestream prompted Jihan to consider a new approach, leading him to access his status window for a potential counter-strategy. 
Despite Golden Light's proclamation to his viewers about being disregarded by Jihan, it was clear that Jihan was preoccupied with a plan of his own, hinting at an unfolding dynamic between the seasoned player and the notorious streamer within the Colosseum's charged atmosphere. As Jihan initiated his own livestream, viewers swiftly diverted their attention from Golden Light to Jihan's broadcast, causing Golden Light to fret over the unintended promotion he had accorded to his rival. His concern escalated when he received a mission targeting Jihan, aimed at relegating him to the last place in the league, with a substantial reward of 2,000 GP on the line. Recognizing the Sword family's emblems among his viewers, Golden Light understood their involvement in orchestrating this mission, indicative of their deep-seated vendetta against Jihan. The bounty on Jihan surged as more members of the Sword family rallied, on Golden Light's stream, pledging additional GP to the cause. As the reward escalated to 31,978 GP, Golden Light struggled to conceal his growing anticipation, hopeful for the bounty to hit the 50,000 GP mark. However, his excitement was momentarily dampened by a system notification, signaling the commencement of the game, with the final bounty standing at 42,713 GP. In a dramatic turn, a Sword family member responded to Golden Light's desire through a higher reward, offering an extra 10,000 GP should he accomplish the task, significantly elevating the stakes. This promise transformed Golden Light's demeanor, intensifying his resolve as he prepared to confront the challenges ahead, with the eyes of the Colosseum's players and the Sword family's expectations bearing down upon him. Fueled by determination, Golden Light was confident in his strategic maneuver, focusing intently on Jihan, who he perceived as destined for defeat. Employing his skill charge, Golden Light enveloped himself in a radiant glow, propelling himself at an astonishing velocity directly behind Jihan. With a smirk, he anticipated an effortless victory and a lucrative reward. However, Jihan's swift defense, utilizing a seemingly modest cooking set club, surprisingly repelled Golden Light's advance. This unexpected resistance left Golden Light bewildered, questioning how such a lower-tier item could deflect a Gold League player's assault. Jihan, seizing the moment, prepared to retaliate with dignity and respect for his opponent, believing in giving due recognition, even in combat. As Golden Light hovered, Jihan unleashed a torrent of slashes, each strike landing with precision and force. The ensuing spectacle of Golden Light's pained reaction, amid the aerial assault captivated Jihan's audience, sending his viewers into a frenzy of excitement and admiration for the skillful display. This turn of events underscored the unpredictability and dynamism of their encounter, thrilling spectators on Jihan's stream. Spectators were astounded as a Bronze League player, Jihan, executed a move known as Sword Kai, clinching the first blood accolade of the match with a kitchen knife, no less. Questions swirled regarding the divine power emanating from him, a surprising feat for someone identified as a support class. His use of everyday cooking items as weapons added an element of the unexpected to his prowess. Remaining composed after vanquishing a Gold League player, Jahan humorously noted his hiatus from cooking. The arena fell silent as Golden Light's familiar voice announced his return, courtesy of the Crucifix of Revival, a powerful, one-time use item prohibited in National League games and group competitions. Despite his dramatic resurgence, the sight of Golden Light failed to impress his followers. His previous defeat had diminished their enthusiasm. Intent on redemption, Golden Light faced an uphill battle to regain his audience's favor, a task complicated by the immediate presence of an ominous figure that erased any semblance of confidence from his expression. Upon their encounter, a brief moment of acknowledgement passed between Jihan and Golden Light, before the latter fell once more, granting Jihan a rare double-kill notification, a sight he hadn't seen in some time due to its associated complications in his past life. Glancing towards the spectators of the match, Jihan recognized the presence of elves, a faction he knew had significantly contributed to humanity's challenges. He mentally bookmarked the necessity to address the elves' role, though his current priorities lay elsewhere. Observing the immediate reaction of the surrounding players, who had ceased their movements only to scatter upon his gaze, Jihan discerned their apprehension, their retreat, spurred by witnessing his triumph over a Gold League player, left Jihan with a tinge of disappointment due to the diminished opportunity for further confrontation. This dynamic shift highlighted not only Jihan's prowess, but also the underlying tension and strategies within the gaming world, revealing the complex interplay of power reputation and the intricate social hierarchy among players. While considering the strategic deployment of the Thirank Holy Artifacts in the match to tap into their divine power, Jihan was poised for more combat. Unexpectedly, a new task appeared, intriguing him with its timing the system assigned him the challenge of defeating all goblins near the goblin bus. The sight of Jihan sent one goblin into a frenzied retreat, not out of aggression but fear, employing his club for an initial strike followed by swift slashes from a kitchen knife. Jihan executed a flawless combination. 
The system affirmed his innovative use of the culinary set, validating his tactic of targeting heads before hearts. This revelation, discovered just as the game neared its end, made Jihan wish he had unearthed it sooner, though it proved timely enough to confront the last challenge, the goblin boss. Towering over Jihan, the goblin boss posed a formidable presence. The system offered detailed insights on this adversary, but Jihan, confident in his abilities, disregarded the information, believing it unnecessary for victory. With a singular, decisive blow, he brought the goblin boss to its knees, showcasing his prowess and reinforcing his reputation as a formidable player within the gaming world. With the kitchen knife once again at the ready, Jihan regarded the goblin boss as merely a larger variant of the common goblins, concluding their defeat with the same tactical approach. The use of the set items not only facilitated their vanquishment, but also enhanced his divine power. Despite recognizing the potential to extract one more divine power from these holy artifacts, Jihan found their efficacy lacking in speed for the efficient dispatch of monsters. His attention then turned to the other players, who had strategically distanced themselves, creating a considerable gap between them and Jihan. Although this separation irked him, Jihan remained unfazed, resolved to pursue his adversaries personally. The intensity of his determination was palpable to his stream's viewers, who sympathized with the plight of those sharing the arena with such a formidable opponent. Meanwhile, in Seoul Metropolitan City, a figure characterized by golden hair simmered with rage, a stark contrast to the calculating calm exhibited by Jihan in the virtual Colosseum. This juxtaposition highlighted the widespread impact of Jihan's actions, extending beyond the digital realm and into the heart of the city. Golden Light, amidst a wave of frustration, scoured the internet for commentary on his recent encounters. Critics labeled him as weak, yet he understood the disparity in strength wasn't about his own lack, but rather Jihan's exceptional prowess. Analysis by viewers suggested Jihan's stats were beyond the Bronze League's cap, proposing an improbable 35 points. Golden Light speculated on the possibility of Jihan manipulating the game, branding him a potential hacker. Returning to the stream out of curiosity, and alerted by an unusual sound from Jihan's attacks, Golden Light witnessed an astounding display. Jihan executed a rapid advance, dispatching multiple opponents simultaneously, turning the match into a showcase of dominance. The audience hailed the performance as a display of high-class art, as Jihan achieved a remarkable pentakill, drawing cheers from spectators. In response, other Colosseum contenders formed an alliance against Jihan, launching a coordinated assault with arrow spells. However, Jihan, undaunted, effortlessly deflected their attacks, maintaining his composure as he observed the unfolding resistance, a testament to his unparalleled skill and strategy in the face of overwhelming odds. Jihan, displaying a mix of boredom and mastery, easily overcame two additional challengers, sparking wild enthusiasm in the chat as he became the first to secure 10 consecutive kills in the arena. This feat activated his set items once more, granting him another divine power stat but also signaling their subsequent redundancy. The thrill of the combat was heightened by a hidden quest unlocked at the milestone of 10 kills, rewarding him with 5,000 achievement points, a testament to his skill and strategy. Amid his contemplation for greater strength, Jihan's attention was drawn to an unprecedented epic quest in his status window tasking him with locating the enigmatic Shadow Queen, who was clandestinely observing the fray. The nature of this quest, uncharacteristic for the Bronze League, piqued his curiosity, especially given the lavish reward of 50,000 achievement points and the attention of the constellation Shadow Queen. These constellations, revered as the celestial epitomes of power, underscored the magnitude of the quest and its potential implications for Jihan's journey in the gaming universe. In the vast realm of Battle.net, where divine beings and constellations bestow their favor upon players exhibiting remarkable potential. Gihan found himself on the cusp of an extraordinary opportunity. Shadow Queen, a constellation known for her absolute dominion over the stars and divine sponsorship, had taken an interest in his prowess. Recognizing the significance of attracting the attention of such a celestial entity, Gihan understood the potential for gaining unparalleled abilities, a privilege typically reserved for contenders in the Diamond League. With the Shadow Queen's gaze possibly hidden among the elven spectators, who remained fixated on Jihan, without diversion, he sensed an opportunity to uncover her amidst the crowd. This development, coupled with his exceptional performance, propelled Jihan into the spotlight across South Korea. News outlets celebrated his achievements, paralleling his feats to those of the legendary Sword King, catapulting his Battletube channel to newfound heights with a surge of subscribers and viewers. This remarkable turn of events not only underscored Jihan's ascending trajectory in the gaming world, but also set the stage for a pivotal encounter that could redefine his destiny within Battle.net. In a surprising turn of events, some members of the Sword family shifted their allegiance to Jihan, having been disillusioned with Golden Light's failure to fulfill their mission request. Recognizing the detrimental effect his defeat had on his standing, Golden Light contemplated a strategic pivot, 
aiming to align himself with Jihan, hoping to bask in the reflected glory of Jihan's rising star. Eager to change his fortunes, Golden Light envisaged a role as Jihan's editor, a move he believed would secure his place alongside Battlenet's new sensation. Meanwhile, at the Sword Palace, Sia confronted her uncle with curiosity and admiration, inquiring into the secrets behind his formidable strength. Jihan, faced with his niece's mixed feelings towards the outcomes of his battles, offered a pragmatic perspective on the harsh realities of competitive realms. Furthermore, Sia broached the subject of GP donations from the community, highlighting Jihan's oversight in enabling such contributions, a detail that had slipped his mind amidst the whirlwind of his recent ascendancy. This moment underscored the complexities and dynamics of their evolving narratives within the battle and universe, bridging personal growth, alliances, and the unyielding nature of digital competition. Sia suggested to her uncle the idea of setting a minimum donation threshold for his stream, proposing an ambitious figure of 10,000 GP, roughly equivalent to $10 million or $7,600 USD. The suggestion left Sia astounded by its boldness. Meanwhile, Jihan's thoughts were preoccupied with the epic quest he had acquired. The elusive search for the Shadow Queen, a task that remained mystifying despite his recent victories. Interrupted by Sia's offer of assistance, Jihan was reminded of his sister, recognizing the familial trait of stepping forward in times of need. Gratefully accepting Sia's offer, he detailed the quest's objective, uncovering any lead on the Shadow Queen, who is believed to be hiding among the spectators of his battles. Sia's determination shone brightly, enveloping her in a radiant aura of resolve. Retreating to his room to ponder, Jihan contemplated the implications of involving Sia in such a perilous undertaking. Yet, the thought of her eager participation filled him with pride. Deciding to prioritize his niece's safety and the quest's success, Jihan resolved to address the more pressing issues at hand, strategizing his next moves in the unfolding saga of their adventures within the Battle and Universe. Jihan, having previously invested 10,000 GP to acquire an additional class slot, faced a pivotal decision regarding his second class. With a confident smile, he navigated his options, his choice already crystal clear. Opting for the mage class, Jihan immediately felt the system's affirmation as a dark aura enveloped him, signaling the infusion of new potent powers distinct from the divine energy he was accustomed to. Eager to explore this newfound strength, Jihan understood that combining the supportive capabilities and the arcane prowess of the mage class could unlock another unique stat, potentially amplifying his abilities within the game, focused and determined. He began to experiment, channeling the synergistic energies of both classes. This strategic choice promised to endow him with force, a powerful attribute that could significantly enhance his combat effectiveness and strategic versatility in the digital battlegrounds of Battle.net. In an unguarded moment, fueled by inebriation, Baron, the leader of Jihan's guild, disclosed a profound secret of his formidable skill. This revelation came during a rare instance of vulnerability from Baron towards Jihan, where he hinted at a more favorable disposition had Jihan been a genuine American citizen. That night, Baron unveiled the concept of force, a potent stat achieved by the perfect synthesis of divine powers and mana, a secret that underpinned the strength of the most powerful human in Jihan's previous existence. This stat was heralded as a triple S-class gift, a pinnacle of power few could aspire to reach. Curiosity peaked, Jihan probed for further details on force, learning that attainment was possible only when both divine power and mana levels exceeded 10. Grateful for Baron's unwitting generosity, Jihan recognized an opportunity to wield a power that once reigned supreme. However, he soon realized that knowledge alone was insufficient for harnessing this unique stat. The journey to unlocking Force's potential was fraught with challenges, necessitating a level of mastery and synergy beyond his current grasp. Jihan, in his relentless pursuit to harness the formidable synergy of divine powers and mana, encountered significant obstacles. Despite the struggle and the tangible risk it posed, his resolve was unwavering. He was driven by the conviction that mastering this power was essential for Earth's salvation, a burden he bore alone. Each attempt to wield the force materialized as a volatile red ray, an unbridled energy. He found himself unable to tame. An explosive mishap, resulting from his inability to control the amassed force, left his room in disarray and Jihan nursing the repercussions of his endeavor. Regaining his footing amidst the chaos, he recognized the shortfall of his approach. Sheer willpower was insufficient to command such a potent stat, Reflecting on the ordeal, Jihan conjectured that an augmentation of his mana reserves might be prerequisite to further trials, having depleted his current supply in the explosive attempt. The realization that he was incapable of physically containing the force sparked a novel strategy, propelling him towards an innovative path in his quest to master this unparalleled power. Rising once more, Jihan embarked on an introspective journey to understand the intrinsic workings of divine power and mana, 
pondering a revolutionary method of harnessing this potent force. He envisioned a technique that didn't rely on manual control, but instead internalized the energy within his body. Focusing deeply, he aimed to merge the mana centered in his being with the divine power emanating from his core, striving to create a stable, contained force. This innovative approach, however, took an unexpected turn. The effort to condense this force further resulted in an internal explosion of energy, bringing Jihan to his knees in agony. The system's prompt confirmed his audacious attempt to unify three distinct energies. A venture marked by a glaring red warning of the peril it posed, Jihan's bold experiment to breach his physical and spiritual thresholds, though fraught with danger, underscored his unwavering determination to transcend known limits, even at great personal risk. Startled by the alarming sounds emanating from her uncle's room, Sia's heart raced with concern for Jihan. In the complex world of battle in it, Jihan had ventured too far in his experiment intertwining divine powers and mana and inadvertently involving his martial power. This perilous attempt to amalgamate inherently discordant forces risked catastrophic consequences. Given that safe manipulation of such energies demanded a player's stats to be significantly elevated, well beyond 100 points across the board. Rushing into Jihan's sanctuary, Sia's apprehension was palpable. She called out to her uncle, her voice laden with worry. The scene that unfolded before her eyes left her momentarily paralyzed, a mixture of relief and shock washing over her. Swiftly, she mustered her composure, fetching ice cubes and a towel in an instinctive response to alleviate what she perceived as her uncle's distress. Meanwhile, Jihan, having narrowly skirted the brink of disaster, feigned a severe headache to mask the true extent of his daring escapade from Sia, sparing her the weight of his ordeal. Apologizing for her outburst, Sia tenderly wiped away her tears, expressing her fears of harm befalling her beloved uncle. Jihan, recognizing his oversight, apologized for the undue stress he had caused. Sia, in a gesture of moving past the incident, playfully nudged her uncle, lightening the atmosphere. With a renewed sense of purpose, she mentioned her ongoing quest to unearth leads on the Shadow Queen before bidding farewell. Reflecting on the day's trials, Jihan resolved to shield Sia from witnessing his vulnerabilities again. Despite the system's indication of failure due to insufficient experience and levels, Jihan found solace in a significant breakthrough. He had successfully unified divine power and mana, although the amalgamation of all three forces eluded him. This experience enriched his understanding of the intricate dynamics governing these potent stats, marking a pivotal moment in his journey within the battle neat universe. Jihan discovered an unexpected synergy among his unique stats, establishing a fragile yet groundbreaking link between divine power, mana, and martial power. His force stat, intriguingly, initiated at a level equivalent to his martial power, standing at 12. The revelation that these interconnected energies could enhance each other was a game-changer, elevating both his unique stats to 14. This breakthrough felt akin to uncovering a hidden shortcut within the game's mechanics, a realization that both excited and cautioned Jihan about the dangers of overreaching with his current level. Intrigued by the newfound potential of his mage class, Jihan decided to test the simplest of spells, conjuring a modest fireball. The attempt yielded a small flame, its size limited by his depleted mana reserves, the discovery that Mana's absence directly influenced the potency of his magic left Yihan in awe, underscoring the importance of balance and resource management in harnessing his abilities. As dawn approached, Jihan reflected on these insights, aware that the path ahead demanded careful navigation to avoid the pitfalls of power's allure. Roused by the morning light filtering through the curtains, Jihan was greeted with a notification from the system, revealing an increase of ten divine powers. This boost came with a caveat. His collection of holy items of D rank and below had become obsolete. Twinge of regret passed through him for the resources spent on these now powerless artifacts. Stepping outside his room, Jihan sought out his niece only to discover she had dedicated the entire night to the task he had assigned. Her diligence was evident, though the quest to uncover information about the Shadow Queen proved challenging. Despite this, she unearthed a promising lead, a video from a streamer who had been recording the audience during the Colosseum match, focusing particularly on the otherworldly spectators among them. Jihan's initial irritation at the streamer's frivolous use of their gift was quickly overshadowed by Sia's findings. Among the captured footage of the royal elves, a pair stood out, one being a dark elf. This detail piqued Jihan's interest, suggesting a potential link to the elusive Shadow Queen they were searching for. Jihan, upon considering Sia's findings, realized the potential of the Shadow Queen's disguise as a dark elf. He praised Sia for her insightful work, though internally he doubted the simplicity of their conclusion. The quest to uncover the Shadow Queen's identity seemed far too complex to be resolved with such straightforward logic. However, Sia's determination to delve deeper into the mystery, by reviewing and editing footage from various streamers, including those abroad shed light on her unsuspected talent in video editing, a skill she honed by managing her father's match videos, 
This revelation brought Yuan Saijin back into Jihan's contemplations. He found himself pondering over the portrait of Saijin, questioning the man's motives and the depth of his actions. The visit from manager Yunsik, revealing Saijin's new love, Ito Shizuru, and her triple S-ranked gift, added layers to Jihan's musings. The woman of matchless beauty, gift capable of bewitching an entire country, left Jihan and Sia astounded, offering a glimpse into the complexities and unseen influences at play within their world. Jihan, contemplating the complex web of relationships and powers at play, surmised that Shizuro's unparalleled gift might have ensnared Seijin, leading him astray. This revelation shed light on the South Korean government's reticence to relinquish the legacy of the Sword King, safeguarding a secret potentially volatile to national prestige. Manager Yeon's cautionary advice underscored the gravity of the situation. Shizuro's influence had already swayed several of Korea's promising talents to switch allegiances to Japan, marking them as victims of her charm. Amidst this, Jihan recognized the imminent threat he faced as his own star ascended. Intrigued and wary, Jihan sought to uncover more about this elusive figure, only to find a conspicuous absence of information online, a testament to Japan's diligent efforts to shield her from public scrutiny. This lack of intel only heightened Jihan's resolve to stay vigilant, aware of the potential dangers posed by someone of Shizuru's capabilities. With a strategic mindset, he began to fortify his defenses, anticipating future encounters. Jihan understood the importance of preparation. The warning from manager Yunzik illuminated the precarious path ahead, where vigilance and foresight could mean the difference between sovereignty and subjugation. As the lift doors parted, Jihan and Sia were greeted by a crowd of dignitaries and press, marking their first public appearance since the controversy surrounding the Sword King. Clad in a suit, Jihan exuded confidence, reassuring his niece with a gentle reminder to remain composed and valiant, echoing the courage they both displayed during their recent livestream. Manager Yunsik approached with a warm welcome. Noting that preparations for the event had been meticulously arranged under his guidance. Thanking Yunzik, Jihan expressed his gratitude for the manager's thorough organization and attention to detail. The lobby of the Sword Palace buzzed with anticipation, the air charged with the gravity of the moment. This gathering wasn't just another event. It was a pivotal turning point, a deliberate step towards reshaping public perception and addressing the saga of the Sword King. As they moved through the crowd, Jihan's resolve was clear. With every step, he and Sia were not just navigating the physical space of the sword palace, but were also traversing a landscape of political and personal reclamation, underscored by Yunzik's meticulous planning and the collective hope for a new chapter. As Jihan and manager Yunzik made their way to the heart of the event, anticipation swirled around them. This wasn't just another public engagement. It was a meticulously orchestrated auction aimed at addressing the saga of the sword king, Yun Seijin, through the sale of his belongings. Among the items up for auction were Saijin's battle link and battle data, technologies that held immense value, particularly to Japanese interests. The strategy was bold and nuanced, designed to attract the Japan force into a purchasing spree that could potentially alter public perception. A luxury vehicle approached the Sword Palace, its passengers cloaked in mystery and significance. Inside two men, one of whom cradled two swords with a grip that spoke of years of mastery and memories. The presence of the Sword King at this event was pivotal for Jihan. It symbolized a chance for reconciliation and understanding, a bridge between past misdeeds and a future of potential harmony. Manager Yunsik couldn't hide his admiration for Jihan's foresight and strategic acumen. It was as if Jihan had a lens into the future, crafting plans with precision and depth that left even the most seasoned strategists in awe. As they approached the climax of the event, Jihan shared a profound insight with Yunsik. This event, laden with history and hope, might be their final opportunity to shift the narrative to recast the shadows of the past into a light that could guide Korea forward. The stakes were high, the atmosphere charged with a mix of anxiety and anticipation, as they prepared to unveil a chapter that could redefine their nation's story. That they were ready to start the auction. As they made their way to the main hall, Jihan's strategic mind was at work, setting a stage not just for a financial transaction, but for a pivotal moment in public relations between South Korea and Japan. Sia standing firm beside her uncle radiated confidence. Her earlier confrontation with her relatives not only silenced their criticisms, but also solidified her resolve to uphold her father's legacy on her own terms. The auction room buzzed with anticipation, the air electric with the prospect of rare items once belonging to the Sword King being offered. The presence of Japanese delegates added an international dimension to the event, underscoring the strategic importance of the auction. Jihan's request for the reporters to keep a close eye on the Japanese contingent hinted at the deeper layers of his plan to unveil the broader implications of the sale. Amidst this carefully orchestrated scene, Sia and Jihan stood united, not just as family but as architects of a new narrative, 
determined to reshape the legacy of the Sword King and navigate the future on their own terms. As the auction commenced, all eyes were on the stage, marking a historic moment that could potentially alter the geopolitical landscape of the gaming world. As Jihan and Sia took their places at the forefront of the auction room, the atmosphere was charged with anticipation. The gathering, comprised of representatives from leading company, was keen to secure artifacts of unparalleled value, formerly owned by Yuan Sakehain, the renowned Sword King. The first item announced was the Battle Link, renowned for its incredible defensive capability, reducing 90-90 abs in any player or company would covet for its potential to tilt competitive balance in their favor. The subsequent items were no less extraordinary, containing comprehensive analyses of Yuan Saijin's battle strategies and insights into the combat techniques of his adversaries. These compilations were not just historical records but blueprints for mastering the art of battle in the gaming world. The air was thick with the silent calculations of the attendees, each assessing the strategic advantage these items could offer. As bids were placed and the auction proceeded, Jihan's use of his newfound skill to maintain order underscored the seriousness of the event. This wasn't merely a sale. It was a statement, a turning point for Sia and Jihan as they navigated the legacies left behind by the Sword King. Their composed demeanor in the face of probing questions from the press further emphasized their resolve to steer their course, undeterred by external pressures or expectations. The auction, therefore, was more than a transaction. It was a moment of reckoning, setting the stage for new alliances and rivalries within the dynamic world of gaming. Each bid not only signified a desire for the physical items on offer, but also a bid for power, influence, and a place in the history shaped by the legacy of the Sword King. In a high-stakes moment that captured the attention of everyone present, Jihan faced an unexpected bidder during the auction. The bidder Takakuji, the recruitment manager from Japan's Neo Self-Defense Force, made an audacious offer of 5 billion yen for the entire collection of items belonging to Yohan Seijin, the famed Sword King. This move instantly shifted the focus of the room to him, underscoring the intense rivalry between South Korea and Japan. Jihan, sensing the strategic implications of Takakoji's bid, approached him directly, suggesting that their conversation remain public to ensure transparency. His insistence on openness was a clear stance against the secrecy often associated with high-level negotiations. However, Takakoji's dismissive attitude and veiled threats did little to sway Jahan, who remained firm and unflustered. The tension in the room escalated when a figure, carrying the unmistakable aura of Yon Saijin, accompanied by twin swords, positioned himself before Jahan. This development hinted at the complexities and intertwining loyalties within the virtual and real-world arenas. Jihan's resolute demeanor, in the face of such pressure exemplified his commitment to safeguarding his niece's inheritance and the legacy of the Sword King, all while navigating the intricate dynamics of international rivalry and personal vendettas. However, Jihan's unflinching gaze and decisive action left Shadow retreating in surprise. This confrontation was not just about personal bravado, but a symbolic stand against unwarranted influence and aggression. Jihan's decision to broadcast this encounter live added a layer of public scrutiny making it impossible for Takakoji to proceed without considering the international ramifications. Conceding to the pressure, Takaji retreated, offering an apology to Jihan and hinting at Japan's desire for a peaceful resolution. Yet beneath his conciliatory gesture lay a strategic intent, as Takakoji sought a private dialogue with Jihan and Sia W.A., suggesting that the auction stakes extended far beyond the sale of coveted items. In the midst of the high-stakes auction, the atmosphere thickened with anticipation as Mr. Takaguji representing Japan's Neo Self-Defense Force, placed an audacious bid of 5 billion yen for the entire collection of Yon Saijin's items. The bid, entwined with the promise of information about Sia's father, put immense pressure on her to make a decision. Despite the weight of the moment and the lure of resolving her familial mysteries, Sia guided by her principles and the protective oversight of her uncle. Jihan declined the offer, leaving the room in a state of stunned silence. Mr. Takakoji's strategy took an unexpected turn when Sia deferred the decision to her uncle, signaling her trust in his judgment over a staggering sum of money. This defiance against Mr. Takakuji's manipulation echoed through the auction room, galvanizing the audience's respect for her resilience. Undeterred, Mr. Takakoji persisted, maintaining his offer of 5 billion yen even without the private meeting, revealing that his instructions had always included this generous proposal. The situation reached a poignant climax when he presented Sia with a letter from her father, now bearing a new identity, sparking a mix of sadness and resolve within her. Ultimately, Japan secured the auctioned items, a victory tainted by the complex web of personal and political undercurrents. The outcome of the auction, while seemingly a defeat for Sia and Jihan, underscored their unwavering commitment to their values and the intricate dance of power, loyalty, and identity at play. In a turn of events that seemed meticulously orchestrated, 
the auction's climax was reached when Japan, through Mr. Takagi, secured the Sword King's treasured items with a staggering bid of 5 billion yen. The atmosphere, charged with tension and anticipation, shifted dramatically as Sia took the stage. Her reading of the letter from her father, Yon Saijin, silenced the room. A declaration of his final farewell, stating he was no longer her father, left the audience in a collective hush, punctuated only by Sia's sorrowful tears. Jihan, witnessing the profound impact of this revelation on his niece, was consumed with concern and suspicion. Known as Japan's calamity for his knack in enticing players from other nations, Mr. Takagoji's reputation preceded him. Jihan pondered the connection between Takakoji and the enigmatic player possessing a triple S skill, wary of the underlying intentions behind Japan's swift acquisition. The aftermath of the auction saw a mix of frustration and empathy among the South Korean attendees, disillusioned by the outcome yet moved by Sia's plight. Amidst the complex web of international intrigue and personal loss, Jihan stood resolute, committed to unraveling the truth behind the Sword King's change of heart and protecting his niece from the unfolding consequences of these global machinations. In a moment fraught with tension and unexpected turns, Sia's dramatic collapse amidst the crowded event drew immediate concern. Jihan caught off guard by her sudden fall, rushed to her aid, his mind racing with worry. The onlookers, previously engrossed in their attempts to recruit Jihan for their factions, were momentarily stunned, their motivations momentarily forgotten as concern for Sia's well-being took precedence. However, in a whispered confession laced with mischief, Sia revealed her act to Jihan, a clever ploy to extricate them from the overwhelming pressure and attention. Her subtle wink served as a silent communication of her strategy, leaving Jihan admiring her quick thinking. This moment of feigned vulnerability was a testament to their bond, a shared understanding that transcended words. Amidst the confusion, Jihan appreciated Sia's ingenuity, recognizing the lengths she would go to protect their unity against the voracious interests swirling around them. This intricate dance of appearances and reality underscored the complexities of their situation, caught between public scrutiny and private resolve. As they navigated the aftermath of the auction and the unwelcome advances of factions like Miss Tetedas, their familial ties proved to be their strongest asset, a beacon guiding them through the tumultuous landscape of power, intrigue, and the relentless pursuit of alliances within the world of battle. As Jihan announced the conclusion of the event, citing Sia's health as a priority, the scene took an unexpected turn. Mr. Takeda, amidst his attempts to salvage an opportunity for alliance, was met with a striking rejection from Jihan. His business card, symbolizing a bridge for future dialogues, was obliterated in a spectacle of force, sending a clear message of independence and refusal. This act not only stunned Mr. Takeda, but also exhilarated Jihan's stream viewers, who reveled in the dramatic refusal of a top guild leader's overture by a Bronze League player. Jihan's demonstration of his capabilities, both in magical prowess and strategic maneuvering, left the crowd in awe, marking him as an entity too vast for the conventional paths of alliance and team memberships. Amidst the unfolding drama, Seiya and Jihan stood united, their actions speaking volumes about their resolve to navigate the complexities of their world on their own terms. And Sia still reeling from the audacity of the event's attendees and their thinly veiled machinations, couldn't hide her disdain. Yet, the donation from Mr. Takeda, who now proclaimed himself as Jihan's number one fan, added another layer of complexity to the narrative. This gesture, though seemingly benign, carried with it an air of persistence, and perhaps a hint of strategy from the seasoned Mr. Takeda, suggesting that the battle of wits was far from over. As the mysterious woman greeted them, her presence raised numerous questions. Who was she, and what did her arrival signify for Jahan and Sia? The encounter promised new alliances, challenges, or perhaps the unveiling of long-sought answers, particularly for Jahan, who was still on a quest for knowledge and mastery over his burgeoning powers. This unexpected meeting outside the event hinted at the unfolding of yet another chapter in Jihan's journey, filled with potential for growth, discovery, and perhaps unexpected camaraderie. Jihan, momentarily lost in a sea of recollections, was taken aback by the sudden appearance of Lee Heon, alongside Gan, outside the bustling atmosphere of the event. Heon, confidently asserting her affiliation as the third department head of the Divergent Guild, extended a handshake, an action that prompted Jihan to sift through the corridors of his memory. The familiar cadence of her voice struck a chord within him, tracing back to encounters in his previous life where their paths had crossed under the guise of the victory guessing games. The encounter charged with the undercurrents of past affiliations and present revelations set the stage for a dialogue filled with potential alliances, insights, and the unraveling of long-held secrets. Jihan, now faced with the task of navigating this newly presented landscape, found himself at the cusp of decisions that could shape the future of his journey in the world of battle and Ed. Bolstered by the knowledge of Heian's true identity and her apparent interest in his capabilities. In the midst of a calm evening, 
As the twilight hues draped over the bustling city, Jihan found himself face to face with a figure from his past, Haiyan now revealed to be a key member of the Divergent Guild. This encounter, unexpected as it was, unfolded amidst a backdrop of intrigue and potential alliances. Haiyan with her commanding presence and the weight of her role within the guild, extended a handshake to Jihan, bridging the gap between their worlds with a gesture of mutual respect and recognition. Sia puzzled by her uncle's intense scrutiny of Haiyan, feared for a moment that the complex webs of familial and guild loyalties might be entangled with personal affections. Yet Jihan, always one to navigate the layers of the game with strategic acumen, chose this moment to recite a quote from Dostoevsky. A nod not just to the literary giant's genius, but also to the undercurrents of gambling that ran through his works. This choice of quote was no mere coincidence. It was a chess move in the grand strategy of minds meeting. Ganyan standing protectively by Heon's side was momentarily taken aback, her defenses rising at the mention of a detail so intimately connected to her master. It was this reaction that confirmed Jihan's suspicions about Heon's true identity as Zero, a player from his past life whose unique voice ability had propelled her to the heights of the game's echelons. This evolved entity now influences the abilities and talents of players, earning the title of one of the premier voice ability wielders globally. Known as Zero Heon, her recognition began to cause embarrassment for Gan, while Jihan viewed the Divergent Guild with admiration for their potent roster. Jihan fading casual knowledge mentioned a past broadcast where Haiyan discussed a memorable motto. Inquiring about her habits during streams, Dan received clarification from Haiyan, who was eager to dispel any misunderstandings, especially the unfounded gambler label. Jihan's amusement at her clarification did not go unnoticed by Sia, who deduced a fondness between her uncle and Haiyan. As Haiyan displayed her charm, suggesting a relaxed dance towards being mislabeled, if it fostered camaraderie, she handed her phone to Jihan. This act convinced Sia of Heian's reciprocal interest in her uncle. As they were poised to share contact information, Heian seized the moment to extend an invitation to Jihan, expressing her desire for him to affiliate with the Divergent Guild, aiming for future encounters. This revelation caused Sia to blush, mistakenly believing she was becoming an obstacle. Meanwhile, Heian exuded satisfaction and confidence in her interaction with Jihan, intending to demonstrate her prowess and charm to Gan, who appeared oblivious to the unfolding dynamics. This encounter showcased Heian's allure, yet Jihan, despite the evident attraction, respectfully declined her proposal, humorously claiming amnesia regarding his own phone number. This unexpected rebuttal left both Heian and Sia perplexed. Jihan's subsequent inquiry to his niece for his number further surprised Sia, prompting her to speculate about his motives, suspecting he might be feigning disinterest. Amidst this, Sia resumed her act of discomfort, maintaining her earlier pretense of illness. Jihan found himself at a crossroads, uncertain of Sia's sincerity but chose to proceed, informing Gan of their imminent departure. This decision left the woman, still clutching her business card, feeling spurned. Sia, observing with a complex expression, believed she was aiding her uncle in navigating his romantic interests. Meanwhile, Gan caught in a mishap, struggled to contain her amusement as she faced a similar rejection from Jihan, mirroring her master's experience, which irked Heian after the awkward encounter. Post-meeting, Sia remarked on her uncle's recent unpredictability, noting it was unusual for Jihan to don suits, especially those belonging to Yeon Seijin. She broached the earlier interaction with Haiyan, critiquing her uncle's outdated and unfashionable approach and humorously criticized the outdated strategy he employed, declaring herself as the first woman he ever rejected. Jihan, bewildered by the critique, listened as Sia advised that while playing hard to get might be acceptable, the fabricated excuse involving his phone number was poorly executed. Jihan clarified to Sia with a gravity that underscored his sincerity, that he was genuinely at a loss concerning her accusations. The earnest expression he wore served as irrefutable evidence of his honesty, casting a pall of silence over Sia who realized her misjudgment. In a moment of concern, she half-jokingly questioned if he had begun to show signs of dementia, reflecting on their misunderstanding. Following this exchange, a new challenge emerged, a familiar defense mission requiring Jihan's participation. Fatigued from the prior ordeal and the effort spent reassuring Sia, he now found himself reflecting on her mistaken belief in his romantic inclinations towards Heon. Jihan's encounter with someone from his past, known as Zero, marked a pivotal reunion. Zero, a pivotal ally in his mission to safeguard the world, shared a profound connection with him, rooted in their shared loss of their homeland. Their camaraderie extended beyond their quest, enjoying moments of leisure watching sports and engaging in friendly wagers, Despite Zero's notorious track record for backing the less fortunate contenders, this recollection also brought to light Zero's penchant for gambling, a trait that, while endearing, often led to misplaced bets. Acclaimed as the god of soccer, significantly impacted the game. Despite Jihan's counsel against gambling, due to her consistent misfortune, 
Zero was enthralled by the limitless possibilities it presented. It was revealed that the scar adorning Zero's visage was the toll for a pact with darker forces, a mark she chose to retain when others might have easily removed theirs. Their camaraderie deepened over shared drinks, discovering mutual experiences as refugees and more. Zero's curiosity about Jihan's formidable strength led to poignant reflections on past hardships. She lamented her own lack of power during their homeland's devastation, believing she could have averted a friend's demise with greater ability. This self-reproach and the guilt that followed forged a deep bond between them, united in their perceived failure to safeguard what mattered most. Jihan's stream took a reflective turn, prompting a wave of curiosity among his viewers. They wondered about his unusual attire, expecting the casual comfort of sweatpants rather than a suit. The audience's intrigue peaked when they noticed a formidable weapon in Jihan's grasp, known as the Irk Pointive's Horse Slaying Sword, a C-grade item distinguished by its unimpressive balance and size, making it a challenge for ordinary individuals to wield. This aspect contributed to its lower market value. Jihan's attempts to acquaint himself with the sword's handling were met with significant environmental disturbances, yet Jihan handled the weapon as effortlessly as if it were a mere stick. The viewer's fascination escalated, desiring a glimpse into Jihan's status window, eager to discern the secrets of his strength. While experimenting with the new sword, Jihan noticed the flood of comments, a mix of admiration for his martial prowess and speculation about his magical capabilities. However, the barrage of inquiries eventually proved too distracting, leading him to halt his practice session, visibly irked by the relentless messaging. With his audience reaching 12,000, Jihan considered sharing his status window, a request from his earliest viewers. This gesture aimed to showcase his achievements within the Battletube realm, Despite the ambiguity around subscriber gathering, Jihan introducing himself as Jihan devised a strategy to engage his audience further. He announced an ambitious goal, revealing his status window upon achieving 200,000 subscribers. Given his current tally of approximately 10,000 subscribers, this goal seemed daunting. Additionally, Jihan introduced another layer to the challenge. He vowed to secure first place in any game henceforth. Failure to do so would compel him to unveil his status window prematurely. This proclamation electrified his viewers, igniting a fervent hope among them for Jihan to encounter challenging teammates. In the wake of this excitement, three luminous orbs manifested in the sky, captivating the audience's attention. Jihan immediately braced himself as the trio of lights began to unveil the identities of his teammates for the upcoming defense game. Turning to face them, he discovered their identities, prompting disbelief at the lineup, a reaction mirrored by his viewers, who erupted in laughter. Their hopes realized, Jihan's team comprised golden like Kim Juhok, a figure from a nostalgic throwback and notably, Diego Masid remembered as sparkly by Jihan. Despite past annoyances with one teammate whose name escaped him, Jihan's focus intensified on Diego Masid. Known as Argentina's premier player in a former existence, Diego was recognized for his triple S gift, yet Jihan sensed a disparity in his current strength compared to before. Re-evaluating their roles, himself as support, sparkly as a warrior, and another as a mage. It dawned on Jihan that the archer role was designated for an individual he knew right before his regression. This strategic revelation about their composition hinted at a complex dynamic for the defense game ahead. Jihan was contemplating the recent turn of events when Kim Ju yuks anger surfaced, unexpectedly reunited with Jihan, who had inadvertently caused him to lose a valuable skill previously. Amidst this tension, Kim Ju kyu received a covert mission from a member of the Sword family, tasking him with a shocking objective to sabotage their own team by destroying crystals, aiming to lower Jihan's rank with a reward of 50,000 GP promised upon success. As the game commenced, the team began their defense of the tower. Diego, defying conventional expectations for an archer, showcased his exceptional talent with a soccer ball, earning him the moniker Soccer God. His unique weapon choice captivated onlookers. During the heat of the battle, Diego approached Jihan, requesting power enhancements. Understanding his pivotal role as a support, Jihan prepared to cast buff spells a first for him in the game due to previously lacking the requisite divine power. Jihan adeptly applied a strength enhancement buff, significantly amplifying the prowess of his team. The team, including Golden Light, expressed gratitude for Jihan's exceptional support, reaffirming his role despite his unconventional choice of a sword over a staff. Juhyuk's surprise to also benefit from Jihan's buff, faced a moment of reconciliation when Jihan inquired if he was prepared to cooperate for the duration of the game. Given the broadcast's visibility, Zhu Hyuk promptly agreed. Observing their interaction, Golden Light speculated a friendship between the two, a notion that reassured Jihan. Following this, the self-designated support leapt into action against the undead, entrusting the defense of the tower to his allies. This strategy baffled his teammates, save for Golden Light, leading Zhu Hyuk and Macy to question Jihan's rationale. 
Meanwhile, Ju Hyuk harbored unresolved resentment toward Ji Han, indicating a complex history yet to be fully reconciled. Motivated by the escalating reward of his clandestine mission, in the meantime, Ji Han boldly advanced towards the zombie hordes that eagerly anticipated his arrival. Ji Han, readying his mage abilities, summoned a fire in his palm, which he amplified with divine power. This enhancement not only intensified the fire strength, but also its destructive capacity. Ji Han unleashed a volley of azure flames upon the zombies, engulfing them in a conflagration that reduced them to mere effigies of ash. Amid the chaos, Ji Han brandished his colossal sword, swiftly dispatching any survivors of the initial inferno. His forceful strike rent the earth, augmenting the flame's terror among the undead. Diego and Golden Light, witnessing their unlikely Ali's prowess, were astounded by the performance of a player they had pegged for a Bronze League support. This spectacle of valor and tactical acumen was broadcast live across the battle tube, captivating viewers with the unexpected heroism of a support class warrior wielding powers and a weapon atypical of his role. Spectators were left in awe, questioning the origin of such a formidable player after Jihan, eliminated over a hundred zombies with a single maneuver. The scene intensified as blood zombies advanced towards Jihan, only to halt and tremble in his presence, a reaction Jihan anticipated. He recognized the true worth of his newly acquired power, a testament to the intrinsic value of the space control ability known as absolute territory. This skill grants the wielder a domain expansion, rendering them supreme within that realm. Any entity entering this domain finds their movements and actions severely constrained, subjected to an overwhelming pressure. This moment underscored Jihan's unique understanding of this intangible force, a comprehension rooted in his first-hand experience with its capabilities. The absolute territory skill epitomized a strategic advantage, allowing Jihan to dictate the battlefield's dynamics, showcasing a level of prowess that captivated both allies and viewers alike. Baron's indifference towards his secret's exposure was notable, especially as he appointed Jihan as his personal training ally. Their frequent sparring sessions were a testament to their commitment to enhancing their strength. In the present, Yihan, having retrieved his sword from the earth, had transcended to an unparalleled status, masterfully wielding mana and divine power concurrently. Additionally, he had gained two distinctive attributes force and martial prowess, rendering the Bronze League insufficient for his capabilities. His formidable presence alone, with a mere swing of his colossal sword, drastically escalated the zombie casualty rate. Jihan reflected on a previous unfulfilled objective of vanquishing 1,000 zombies, now realizing its attainability. The resurgence of a linked quest ignited his resolve to surpass all expectations. With remarkable agility and swordsmanship, he launched into the fray, his actions blurring the lines between his support role and a frontline warrior. His accelerating pace and precision left onlookers in a state of shock and awe, witnessing a spectacle that blurred the boundary between reality and fantasy. Jahan's viewers believed in his commitment, with some even embarking on a mission to rally 200,000 subscribers, convinced of his invincibility. Amidst this, Golden Light pondered over Jihan's current status window, while attention shifted towards a silent figure in the background. Kim Joo Hyuk, emanating a foreboding aura and revealing a menacing smile, became the center of intrigue. Urged to highlight their mage on the live stream, Golden Light turned to Joo Hyuk, only to discover him poised ominously before the crystal, amassing mana for his fireball skill. As Joo Hyuk inhaled deeply, he launched into a vehement denunciation of Jihan, labeling him derogatorily in a moment of intense provocation. This unexpected outburst resonated with Jahan and sent shockwaves through the viewing audience, who had not anticipated such a drastic turn of events. Juhyuk further inflamed the situation by accusing Jihan of manipulating his niece, alleging that he instructed Sia to feign illness. This accusation halted Jihan in his tracks, marking a clear overstep of boundaries recognized by all. He persisted in his provocations, questioning Jihan's actions towards his niece. Onlookers witnessing Jihan's composed demeanor commended his patience. Yet, beneath this calm exterior, Jihan was seething with animosity. The boldness Ju Hyuk displayed in confronting Jihan was fueled by the prospect of a reward 55,000 GP, a sum that promised to reinstate him financially and enable the recovery of a lost skill. Jihan momentarily set aside his quest to address Ju Hyuk's tirade, discerning the true motive behind his actions and manipulation from behind the scenes, suggesting Ju Hyuk's lack of a promising future. Jihan considered that Ju Hyuk intended to flee post-crystal destruction. While Jihan could disregard personal slights, the attack on his niece, Unsaw, crossed the line. Her innocence and purity were undeniable, making her the undeserving target of such base tactics, a fact all the more poignant from their past encounters. Jihan was haunted by a memory he wished to forget. The day he lost Sia, Jihan's heart ached recalling how his niece was enveloped in bandages, concealing the scars inflicted by the Sword King family. Holding her, he felt the chilling absence of warmth from her body, a moment of helplessness and profound regret 
for not being able to save his dying niece. It was this anguish that fueled Jihan's vow to prevent such a tragedy from recurring. Surrounded by a formidable aura, the chat noticed Song Jihan's rising fury, signaling his readiness to unleash a long-awaited power. The Nameless Divine Arts, determined to remind everyone of Yuan Xie Jihan's resolve, he prepared to deploy this formidable skill, reminiscent of his past life's overwhelming ability. At this pivotal moment, Jihan was about to merge his three dimensions again, demonstrating his unparalleled strength and commitment to protection. Aware of his newfound capability, Jihan was resolute in harnessing this formidable power. Amidst the chaos, as zombies surged towards him, he detected an electric surge beneath his feet. With a mere foot tap, he unleashed a torrent of lightning, annihilating the advancing zombies. Transforming into a variable thunderbolt, Jihan showcased the flashing sky thundersteps, a technique once used to fracture the heavens. At the pinnacle of their defense tower, Jihuk received an additional 100 GP from his main sponsor, alerting him to Jihan's approach. Despite his recent verbal sparring with Jihan invigorating him, his endeavor to destroy the crystal was thwarted. Golden Light attempted to intervene but was rebuffed by Juhyuk, who warned him against interference. Seizing the moment, Golden Light appealed to his viewers for subscriptions, hoping to harness their support to halt the mage's progress, albeit with limited success. Juhyuk was fervently accumulating mana for his next fireball, intent on concluding his quest with this decisive blow. His anticipation was palpable thrilled at the prospect of their impending last place finish in the game. However, his fiery assault on the crystal was unexpectedly neutralized by a soccer ball, a maneuver that took everyone by surprise. The originator of this defensive play, Diego Makaid, had expertly safeguarded their crystal, demonstrating his unwavering commitment to the game and a resolute stance against any act that threatened its integrity, particularly taking issue with Juhik derogatory outburst towards a pivotal teammate. Juhik's frustration with Diego escalated, his plans thwarted, Yet, the combined efforts of Golden Light and Diego, stalling for time, set the stage for the hero's dramatic entrance. A bolt of lightning signaled Jihan's arrival, much to the relief and satisfaction of his allies. As Ju Hyuk turned to assess the situation, the scene was set for an epic showdown, with tensions reaching a crescendo. Upon encountering Ju Hyuk, Jihan expressed his awareness of the latter's grievances, noticing the palpable tension born from his fury. Ju Hyuk found himself overwhelmed by a multitude of thoughts, realizing the extent of his missteps. Despite his attempts to further denigrate Jihan, an unseen force silenced him, signifying Jihan's readiness to unveil realities beyond Ju Hyuk's comprehension. Jihan confessed his initial impulse to decisively overpower Ju Hyuk upon their confrontation. However, reflecting a strategic shift in approach, he chose not to conclude their conflict swiftly. Jihan aimed to exploit the battle network's mechanics to extend the Maja's ordeal, emphasizing that pain experienced within the game's confines is typically mitigated upon a player's virtual demise. Understanding that Ju Hyuk would merely suffer a loss in levels upon defeat a well-known fact among players, Jihan opted for a different approach. He compelled Ju Hyuk to kneel solely by the overwhelming presence of his force, signaling the onset of a lesson Ju Hyuk was yet to comprehend. Despite Ju Hyuk's belief that any outcome resulting in his demise would be inconsequential to his level, he regarded provoking Jihan's fury as a personal victory. However, the sense of triumph quickly dissipated as Ju Yuk encountered an inexplicable torment, a pain beyond anything he had previously experienced. Jihan's intense gaze remained fixed on him, questioning why Ju Hyuk was already in agony when the real confrontation hadn't even commenced. This moment underscored a crucial warning. One should never underestimate or provoke someone with overwhelming power. The mage was enduring severe pain, urging Jihan to cease. The air was thick with desperate pleas, unsettling even golden light. Diego sharing golden light's sentiment was perplexed by Jihan's harsh actions. Golden Light questioned the cause of the agony, noting that battlenet connectors typically prevent such extreme distress. Diego observed Jihan applying a healing ability alongside, which Golden Light suspected might induce an adverse reaction. Golden Light clarified this adverse effect as a glitch, where applying a healing skill on a persistent damage effect could overload the connector, exacerbating the pain. The Mega's tormented expression validated Golden Light's theory. The situation escalated as Golden Light identified Jihan's technique as a disjoint, a martial skill that severely damages bones and muscles. The mage was in considerable pain, reflecting on his high-grade battle connector, designed to mitigate pain by 95, yet baffled by the excruciating sensations as if his organs were being shredded. He cursed Jihan, begging for an end. Jihan, with a resolute face, ended the mage's suffering, decapitating him as onlookers observed. As Jihan sought the mage's imminent return to life, Golden Light, still disturbed, was unaware of a zombie creeping closer. Golden Light, admiring Jihan, directly witnessed the formidable extent of Jihan's capabilities. Upon his return, 
The mage exhibited fear and agony, prompting viewers to question the familiarity of his expression. He implored for mercy but met his end once more, with one observer suggesting shock as the cause. Jihan maintained that the mage was simply unable to withstand his strength. Following another revival, the mage retreated, pleading with Jihan to keep his distance and expressing regret. Jihan addressed this earnestly, noting that the mage should have anticipated the repercussions. Nonetheless, Jihan's focus shifted upon receiving a 10,000 GP donation from Sia, who implored her uncle to halt his actions, cautioning that the spectacle might lead to a loss of viewers. The audience raised concerns regarding PTSD and the display of excessive force. Sia advised Jihan to concentrate on the game, catching him off guard. He acknowledged her composed suggestion with an intense look. Jihan confessed he believed the punishment was insufficient but chose to cease. He justified that they were living in peaceful times, and the lesson administered was adequate. The mage, prostrate on the ground, pleaded for salvation or demise. Jihan, feeling an urge to delve deeper, inquired about the source of the mage's audacity. In a state of panic, the Maja disclosed that the Sword King clan had promised 50,000 GP, admitting that the staggering sum had clouded his judgment, leading him to acknowledge his deserving fate. The members of the Sword Clan labeled the mage as ungrateful, maintaining hope for a different outcome in future endeavors, despite today's failure. Jihan sensed an anomaly, attributing the substantial payment to possible organizational backing, upon capturing the mage, who expressed gratitude towards Sia for her intercession. The Maja's mood shifted to happiness, Subsequently, Jihan expelled the mage from the tower, terminating his existence anew. Golden Light, holding a sign rated at 10, presented this event as a teachable moment aimed at reforming a troll player, inviting viewers to express their enjoyment through likes and subscriptions. Contemplating a return to zombie extermination after this distraction, Jihan reviewed his tally, noting 921 zombies eliminated out of a thousand, with an estimation of efficiently dealing with an additional 80. An overlooked alert took him by surprise indicating the completion of the zombie source chain quest. Observing the aftermath outside, he realized his earlier action inadvertently produced electricity, effectively neutralizing the zombie threat. Despite the favorable result, he critiqued his suboptimal skill usage and committed to enhancing his proficiency through diligent practice. Golden Light's request for Jihan's companionship resonated as it gleamed, seeking to join him in descent. Jihan, however, shifted his focus to Diego, exchanging a handshake as a sign of mutual respect. Jihan thanked Diego for protecting the crystal, acknowledging his actions as necessary, highlighted by Diego's modest smile. Jihan suggested a future opportunity to reciprocate Diego's kindness, hinting at a private matter he wished to discuss. Their exchange was interrupted by an unexpected earthquake that rattled their environment. As the ground shook, Golden Light inquired about their next move. Diego, noticing something unusual, pointed towards a particular direction. Jihan and the viewers alike were stunned to witness a gigantic creature emerging from the earth marked by the appearance of a massive hand equipped with a mouth, which emitted a thunderous roar across the landscape. As they surveyed the scene, contemplating the peculiar hand before them, Golden Light commented on its enormity. This ominous hand, encircled by zombies, emitted a scream that caused Jihan to shudder. In a sudden turn of events, zombies started being bisected, and upon closer observation, Jihan deduced the hand was consuming them. The gargantuan hand ingested the zombies, converting them into a vile green substance. This repulsive accumulation then descended to the ground, assuming a form reminiscent of zombies. Golden Light found this occurrence bewildering for a bronze-level game, expecting such phenomena in gold leagues or above. Jihan recognized the creature as a flesh golem, fashioned by disassembling and reconstituting bodies, which corroborated Golden Light's initial observation of its absence in the Bronze League. Jihan speculated whether this unusual situation stemmed from the chain quest he had received which stipulated defeating the flesh golem unaided by the crystal. Confounded, Jihan contemplated the system's intent. A system notification emerged, marking the defense map's completion with 10 towers. As a reward, they received a new quest to defeat the flesh golem. This prompted curiosity among players about the presence of bonus challenges in bronze-level maps and whether the system indeed intended for them to confront the creature. The directive was to halt the flesh golems crafted by the Black Hand, the Apostle of Destruction. Following the Flesh Golem's emergence, the Black Hand vanished, leaving its minions to cause chaos. Players debated the system's rationale for providing only one buff for the hunt, with some questioning if even a nuclear bomb would suffice to fulfill the quest, noting the difficulties faced by Gold League players against these foes. Jihan internally reasoned that the quest's difficulty indicated significant rewards. The system disclosed the bonus quest prize, 10,000 achievement points and a crystal fragment. Jihan viewed the crystal fragment as the primary reward considering the additional benefits as rare, 
Examining his sword, he assessed that the challenge was at least of epic quest magnitude. Golden Light emphasized the importance of exerting their utmost effort. Jihan retrieved his sword from the earth, and Golden Light proposed receiving a blessing first. Jihan queried the necessity, causing bewilderment among his team and sparking debate among viewers. Some speculated whether Jihan was apprehensive or contemplating withdrawal, while others viewed it as a reasonable precaution, given the formidable task ahead. Sparks danced around Jihan's foot as he advanced towards the flesh golem, enveloped by an electric aura. The focus shifted to the flesh golem, an undead creature renowned for its durability, to vanquish it, its core, nestled within a mass of intertwined corpses in considerable size, had to be annihilated, a task far from trivial. This entity was deemed a boss of moderate difficulty in the Gold League, representing a significant hurdle even for someone of Jahan's prowess, who exceeded the Bronze League standards. In a decisive gesture, Jihan instructed his allies to withdraw. Exhibiting extraordinary velocity, he surged ahead, etching a trail behind him. Golden Light and Diego were left in awe at the sight. They observed Jihan ascend towards the Flesh Golem, employing the unnamed Divine Arts, a martial technique inspired by the elements of heaven, earth, and humanity. Jihan unleashed the Three Talents technique, known as Mount Thy Crush, slicing through the formidable Flesh Golem in a singular, decisive move. Golden Light and Diego were rendered speechless by the spectacle. Jihan inwardly remarked that despite the technique's impressive name, it was essentially a straightforward vertical slash. A system alert confirmed Jihan's triumph over the Flesh Golem, signifying the completion of the bonus quest Fourth Tower. The victory stirred diverse reactions among viewers. Some celebrated while others cautioned against underestimating Song Jihan. One viewer suggested that Jihan's effectiveness was akin to that of a nuclear bomb, offering the only logical explanation for his success. Upon witnessing Jihan's swordplay, Golden Light was engulfed in a whirlwind of emotions, fear, despair, anticipation, and desire which coalesced into profound respect. Overcome by the intensity of these feelings, Golden Light found himself kneeling, confessing he had never before been moved to such a degree. Initially viewing Jai Han as a source of amusement, he now acknowledged the profound disparity between them and aspired to chronicle Jai Han's ascent to legend. Although Golden Light had resolved to dedicate his utmost efforts to Jai Han, it was this moment that marked the beginning of a significant bond between Sung Jai Han and Diego Massad. As the colossal monster overpowered them, the other players found themselves incapacitated. A notification emerged, declaring the third tower bonus quest a failure for those who hadn't overcome their adversaries. The system announced the conclusion of the bonus quest, rewarding successful participants with triple experience points and GP. Jihan, visibly pleased, commended the game for its generous rewards. However, his demeanor shifted upon glancing at Diego. He broached another topic that required discussion, proposing a meeting beyond the game's confines. Diego, expressing gratitude for the bonus, declined further rewards. Yet Jihan aimed to delve into Diego's unique skills, inquiring if they could discuss them further. Taken aback, Diego sought clarity on his abilities. Jihan, revealing a flame in his palm, disclosed his mage status and suggested an extended conversation over dinner. Diego, intrigued by the concept of being a mage, found his curiosity piqued by Jihan's impressive feats. While he might have dismissed such a notion from another, Jihan's prowess made the idea compelling. Contemplating the opportunity to identify an appropriate class, Diego eventually concurred and communicated his acceptance to Jihan. In response, Jihan inquired about Diego's culinary preferences to arrange the dinner meeting. Golden Light expressed a desire to participate, but Jihan specified the dinner was a token of appreciation exclusively for Diego. Despite Golden Light's attempt to steer the conversation towards streaming, Jihan declined to engage further and exited the game, leaving Golden Light astounded as the chatroom participants teased him. Positioning to the Twin Sword Building, Jihan received confirmation of his completion of the Zombie Chain Quest, rewarding him with 10,000 achievement points and a crystal fragment. The system presented Jihan with an additional quest to locate the Apostle, a task that would become available upon his ascension to the Silver League. Jihan considered the reward of 10,000 points justifiable, given the challenge's severity. He appreciated the early power boost, though the crystal fragment's utility appeared somewhat underwhelming. However, the fragment offered a one-time divine blessing, a distinctive boon for bronze and silver league contenders. This blessing, exclusive to the Apex support class Saintess, augmented all stats by 50 proving to be a pivotal advantage in the higher leagues. Jihan noted the one-time use of the divine blessing in either the bronze or silver league as a constraint, yet he looked forward to the distinct advantage it promised for securing a leading position. The reward of a 50 boost to both GP and experience propelled him to level 14 with his martial power and force reaching 17. He estimated approximately 12 levels to go until he qualified for the Silver League promotion match. Reflecting on his rapid advancement, 
Jihan pondered if any other player had experienced such swift progression. Abruptly, his weapon began to emit a glow, accompanied by a notification indicating that his sword had awakened. It had become an otherworldly weapon, enhancing his divine power by one and integrating it with his force. To Jihan's astonishment, however, the sword's rank dropped to E. This development puzzled him as his overall stats did not increase as anticipated. He came to understand that divine power and force did not correlate directly, implying a more complex relationship between these attributes. Suddenly, a red alert notification appeared, indicating the sword had lost control of its latent power, leading to its destruction. The sword exploded, releasing a significant energy burst. Jihan observed the three elixir fields contained within the sword dispersing into the surroundings. He speculated whether the sword could not withstand the immense pressure, akin to the legendary force of Mount Dai. The unleashed energy from the sword unexpectedly began to afflict Jihan. He endeavored to reabsorb the rampant energy, aware of the risks associated with ingesting too much simultaneously. The bright light emanating from his room became noticeable from the exterior, as Jihan's eyes widened in response to the escalating situation. In a neighboring room, Taktid felt vexation over his thwarted scheme. A flashback revealed Takeda receiving a quest to destroy the crystal and impede Jihan's advancement to the top rank. From his concealed spot, Takeda saw himself as a guardian, acting for the benefit of an ally, confident that his vendetta against Jihan would succeed. Back in the present, while savoring fried chicken, Takeda mulled over the collapse of his strategy, deciding to pause his disruptive actions in the game, lamenting the lost chance for victory. He humorously considered the possibility of another guild recruiting Jihan before he could. Takeda, a member of the Neo Self-Defense Force, forcefully hit the table caught in a challenging situation. Acknowledging the necessity to enlist Jihan, he realized the importance of acquiring tangible proof, specifically Jihan's status window, to bolster his case. Driven by a sense of immediacy, Takeda internally urged Jihan to be patient. Upon securing Jihan's status information and obtaining his organization's endorsement, he intended to employ a tactic akin to their approach with the Sword King, aiming to successfully recruit Jihan. Jihan received a message informing him of an increase in his divine power by one, which seamlessly integrated into his force, elevating it by a point. He deduced that for every three points of divine power, his force increased by one. Subsequently, another message arrived, announcing that both his force and martial power had risen by one. Grateful, Jihan acknowledged his martial power had reached 18. He speculated whether the sword had assimilated all the divine power, feeling a pang of regret for the lost weapon but consoled by the compensatory rewards. Then a notification highlighted that his force points had exceeded 17, restricting future divine power absorption to rank relics or higher. This limitation left him feeling thwarted, as if being perpetually teased with unattainable aspirations, labeling the predicament as regrettable. At that moment, Sia entered the room, exuberant, showcasing her phone displaying a bank balance of 50 billion. However, her joy faded upon noticing Jihan's disheveled state and the room's chaos, inquiring about the mess. Jihan, with a smile, explained his weapon's detonation and his minor head injury, downplaying the severity. Sia concern quickly turned to irritation. She insisted on him cleaning up, eager to celebrate with him. She remarked on his unchanged nature, expecting maturity, leaving Jihan slightly taken aback by her observation. The setting transitioned to a restaurant where Jihan and Sia were dining. For Jihan, it marked a significant moment, his first real meal since reverting to his original lifestyle. He expressed a fondness for the occasional dean out experience, showing a particular preference for Korean cuisine. Sai, slightly annoyed, remarked that since she was footing the bill, Jihan could have opted for something more upscale. Jihan casually mentioned that they would be sharing meals together for some time. Unexpectedly, Sia hinted that future shared meals might not be possible. This left Jihan puzzled. She clarified she was returning to school and, despite appearances, held the position of student president. She expressed regret over her hiatus. Jihan considered the possibility of taking a week off, as suggested by an instructor. Sia brought up her upcoming Blessing Day at the Gift Hall, a significant event she eagerly anticipated each year, viewing it as a symbol of hope. Her birthday on August 22nd marked her coming of age, even under challenging conditions. However, the enthusiasm for her awaited day turned to disappointment when the gift she received was graded F crushing her expectations. During their meal, Jihan considered the implications of prematurely disclosing the Efrank gift's nature, preferring to tactfully temper her expectations instead. Their conversation drifted towards her visit the following day, to which she affirmed Monday suited her schedule. Jihan offered to drive her personally, surprising Sia, who pointed out she was not a child requiring special care. Nevertheless, Jihan was firm in his decision, leaving Sia puzzled by his unusual attentiveness. Laughing off her inquiry, Jahan redirected the focus to their meal, 
Despite Sia's preference for public transport, Jihan persuaded her to accept his offer, expressing a desire to assist. The ensuing day brought an unexpected sight for Jihan and Sia, an empty parking lot, explained by Sia as the result of their collaborators selling off all the cars rapidly. This clarified Jihan's earlier confusion about the missing car keys. Contemplating public transportation, Jihan noticed Sia's mother's car, untouched likely due to its low resale value. Finding it unlocked with a key inside, they considered using it despite Sia's concern it might be deemed undignified. Her apprehension was subtly conveyed, shifting the scene as a man instructed Jihan to relocate the vehicle. Sia's actual worry, she revealed, was about their arrival at Sewell's Battleman Academy in such a modest car. Jihan hadn't anticipated the car drawing unwanted attention or provocation. Confronted by an irate individual claiming the parking space, Jihan inquired about the cause of his anger. The man derogatorily labeled Jihan a pauper, to which Jihan, asserting his role as a guardian to a student, cautioned the man regarding his choice of words. Bystanders recognized Jihan, sparking speculation about his presence at the academy. They referenced the attendance of the Sword King's daughter amidst rumors of her academic hiatus. The episode quickly circulated online under the title Jihan at the Academy, where commentary varied from skepticism about Jihan's age of 27 being at an academic institution to affirmations that learning knows no age limit. Simultaneously, within the Seoul-based Divergent Guild company building, Lee Hyun summoned Lim Gae Young, directing her to accompany her to the Battle and Ed Academy upon discovering Jihan's whereabouts. Gae Young's request for rationale behind the abrupt itinerary adjustment was met with Hyun's vehement expression of indignation indicating Jahan had neglected her, and she intended to confront him directly. In the parking lot, the man was visibly incensed upon seeing someone who, in his eyes, resembled a beggar stepping out of an ancient car. He advanced towards Jahan with a fist raised, imperiously demanding that Jihan show deference by bowing. As the man's fist neared, Jihan's eyes emitted an unusual glow, and despite the man's aggressive demands, his punch inexplicably halted just short of Jihan's face. Sia witnessing the scene, displayed a mix of shock and concern, shouting out to her uncle, the surrounding crowd observed, intrigued by Jahan's resilience. An onlooker highlighted the curious halt of the man's fist just inches from Jahan, prompting confusion about why he was suddenly immobilized. Attempting another curse, the man found himself silenced by a red glow that sealed his lips. So with a mere gesture from Jahan, the man was compelled to bow, while Jahan reprimanded him for his uncouth behavior. Jihan surmised the individual might have been habitually intimidating students around the academy. He openly admonished the man, urging him to either behave as a positive role model or cease his bullying altogether, all while under the watchful eyes of the gathered crowd. Upon Sia's plea for her uncle to cease, the sudden call of her name redirected their attention. Kim Hizu, the 18-year-old vice president of the Battle and Academy Student Council, was in disbelief at the scene from her car. Recognizing Hizu as Sia's acquaintance, Jihan deduced their friendship. Sia acknowledged Hisu, and their cordial exchange was followed by Hisu's lighthearted comment on the subdued aggressor, who humorously blamed the slipperiness of the ground, eliciting quiet chuckles from Sia and Jihan in acknowledgement of the jest. Hisu then shifted to a more serious tone, expressing concern over Sia's father's vanished vehicles and her arrival in a modest car. Sia disclosed that her father had liquidated his car collection, prompting Hisu's concern. Despite initial reluctance, Sia was swayed by Hisu's insistence on offering her a ride home post school highlighting the undue attention the old car would garner. Hizu assured her of discussing the matter with Sia's father. Jihan, observing their interaction, pondered the depth of their connection, feeling an inkling of discrepancy in the timing and nature of this bond, casting a thoughtful gaze at Hizu, sensing an inconsistency in the unfolding events. Upon their arrival, Gai Young and Hyun approached the bustling scene. Hyun, with an air of urgency, inquired about the events transpiring in Jihan's whereabouts. Given his recent arrival merely 10 minutes prior, the increasing agitation in Hayon was palpable as she learned from an onlooker that Jihan had already left in his vehicle. Gang calmly reminded Hayon of her earlier prediction of such a scenario unfolding. Hayon, caught in a moment of anxiety, nibbled on her nail, voicing her fears that if they delayed, international scouts might secure Jihan's allegiance before them. Gang intervened, gently coaxing Hayon to desist and reminding her that nail-biting wouldn't remedy their situation. She emphasized her presence was at Hayon's behest for this very reason. Acknowledging Gai Young's point, Hayon conceded, reflecting on her near misstep. When Gai Young inquired about Hayon's forthcoming strategy, Hayon pondered their available avenues. As a loot, Hayon accessed BattleTube and initiated Jihan's live stream, sporting a confident grin, revealing their intent to monitor Jihan's movements through the digital landscape in real time. The chat buzzed with enthusiasm as viewers voiced their unwavering belief in Jihan's triumph. He showcased his extraordinary strength, dismantling adversaries with ease, 
his hands becoming instruments of destruction against shields and armor. Jihan momentarily paused, channeling the essence of his nameless divine technique, the footwork Heavenly Thunder steps. With the agility of lightning, he navigated the battlefield, rendering foes incapacitated with his electrifying maneuvers. Opponents fell in quick succession, and Jihan, acknowledging the acceleration of his pace, steeled himself for continued exertion. As he surveyed the dwindling opposition, the anticipation of their inevitable defeat hung heavily in the air. Among them, Song Jihan, renowned for his singular ability to vanquish a gold-ranked flesh golem, stood a colossus among mere contenders. For those in the Bronze League, the challenge of facing Jihan was akin to navigating a relentless inferno. The arena, now a testament to Jihan's dominance, resonated with the fervent exclamations of spectators, their awe akin to witnessing an unstoppable force of nature. Upon returning to the real world after the game concluded, Jihan secured the top rank, a testament to his prowess. The system congratulated him on his fifth consecutive victory, rewarding him with a substantial 200 increase in experience points, a boon Jihan deemed a windfall. Following this, he received a notification indicating a level increase by two and a special bonus for achieving level 15. Access to the game map known as Dungeon. This feature, reserved for players of level 15 and above, introduced a novel game mode blending combat with a series of traps, mazes, and puzzles, challenging the player's strategic acumen and problem-solving skills. However, the dungeon dandied collaborative efforts for success, emphasizing the game's focus on teamwork over solitary conquest. Back in his apartment, a sense of apprehension shadowed Jihan. He understood the potential pitfalls of teamwork, particularly if his teammates harbored ill intentions. The thought of aligning with a guild for safeguarding crossed his mind, yet he swiftly discounted it aware of the complications that might arise upon departure. With resolve, Jihan decided to face any forthcoming challenges head-on. His ambition was clear to ascend to the Silver League and thereafter, to forge his guild marking the beginning of a new chapter in his journey. The following morning, as Jihan prepared eggs, he requested Sia to arrange the table, a task he undertook with joy. As they commenced their meal, Jihan signaled it was time to enjoy their breakfast. A brief silence ensued, filled only by the sounds of their satisfaction with the meal. However, Sia couldn't contain her curiosity about Jihan's culinary skills, inquiring how he had become such an adept cook. Jihan modestly attributed his skills to improvising with available ingredients, prompting Sia to commend the meal's exquisite flavor, acknowledging Jihan's exceptional cooking prowess. Jihan, touched by her appreciation, vowed to prepare more elaborate meals in the future, reminiscing internally about the value of his cooking experiences in the U.S. Sia expressed delight at the prospect of Jihan cooking more frequently, the conversation then shifted to her mode of transport to school, specifically whether she intended to continue utilizing Heza's car. Sia decisively declined, requesting that the topic be dropped due to the discomfort experienced during her previous ride with Heus, which was highlighted by an intrusive barrage of personal inquiries and unwarranted sympathy, painting a vivid picture of her unease. Jihan's reaction to Sia's recounting was one of visible irritation, a sentiment echoed by Sia, who then contrasted her experience with the familiar comfort of her mother's car, describing it as cozier and more agreeable. Jihan, surprised yet pleased by her preference, concurred, reflecting a shared moment of understanding and agreement on their preferred choice of transportation. As they approached the academy, Jihan noticed a group eagerly anticipating their arrival. He pondered whether they were scouts or journalists. Sia, with a hint of exasperation, remarked on their conspicuous presence from the day before. Jihan concurred, suggesting their persistence bordered more on intrusion than interest, and proposed a swift vehicle change to avoid further attention. However, Sia's focus shifted, urging Jihan to notice Heian and Gaoyang standing among the crowd. The moment Jihan's vehicle was sighted, a buzz swept through the onlookers, confirming his arrival. As Jihan brought the car to a halt, Sia inquired about the unfolding situation. The appearance of Heian and Gaoyang heightened the anticipation, leaving Jihan to muse over the palpable tension, addressing the unexpected encounter. Hyun revealed her deliberate anticipation of Jihan, an admission Sia interpreted as excessively zealous behavior. Upon handing Jihan her business card previously, Hyun noted he hadn't initiated contact. Sia, observing their dynamics, speculated that Hyun's interest might extend beyond professional curiosity, perhaps veering into personal territory. As Hyun approached Jihan to request a moment of his time, they agreed to relocate to a cafe for a more private conversation. The scouts, Witnessing this development exhibited signs of frustration. One lamented that Heian had once again outmaneuvered them, while another expressed concern over the gold-level contract they had prepared, doubting their opportunity to present it. Nonetheless, a colleague encouraged them to attempt engagement regardless. Jihan, wary of attracting undue attention, voiced his concerns to Heian, who dismissed the potential for discomfort, 
citing her familiarity with public scrutiny due to her Nepo baby status. Hanan expressed mild surprise at Jihan's apologetic stance for his delayed response, attributing it to his hectic schedule. Offering reassurance, Hanan conveyed that she found the chase somewhat novel, marking a first in her experiences of someone eliciting such an effort from her. Gayong presented a platinum-level contract to Hayon, revealing a meticulously prepared proposition of significant value. The nearby scouts watched in disbelief as Hayon extended such a high-tier contract to a player of bronze rank. Disheartened, one scout announced their departure, their voice tinged with resignation. Jihan was taken aback by the magnitude of Hayon's gesture, recognizing the considerable effort she had invested. Hayon, leaning closer, attributed the gesture to her personal sentiments towards him. It was apparent to all, including Gai Young and Jihan himself, that Heian had orchestrated this scenario with deliberate intention. Jihan noted that Heian's fragrance was reminiscent of Zero's, adding a layer of complexity to the moment. Meanwhile, Heian found herself surprised by Jihan's composed response to her revelation. As Heian's cheeks turned a shade of red, she found herself grappling with a sense of wounded pride upon realizing she had yet to secure Jihan's phone number. She requested that Jihan forward the contract after his review and also asked for his contact information. Jihan, however, hesitated, questioning the necessity of sharing his number, which only added to Hyun's embarrassment. Gai Young couldn't help but find humor in the situation. Jihan shifted the conversation by introducing a wager, mentioning his recent advancement to level 15 and his forthcoming expedition into a dungeon. This revelation stunned both Hyun and Gai Young, bewildered by Jihan's rapid progression to level 15, a feat achieved in less than a month. Hyun was astounded both by Jihan's swift leveling and his proposition for a bet. She inquired about the bet's stipulations, to which Jihan detailed his intention to access Battlenet without the aid of any pain mitigation devices. Jihan laid out his terms. If he failed to secure the first rank, he would enter into an agreement with the Divergent Guild and also share his contact details with Hyun. Hyun, perplexed, pointed out the considerable interest from various parties aiming to target Jihan. Again questioned Jihan's strategy to venture into a dungeon without aligning with a guild or assembling a party. Jihan, undeterred, considered it a challenge worth undertaking. Heian, intrigued by his proposal, sought clarity on his motivations to ascertain Heian's true identity as zero. Jihan stipulated that his victory condition would involve Heian revealing her status window, curious if she retained her cultivation gift and previous abilities. Heian hesitated, pondering the necessity of disclosing her own status window, to which Jihan explained the significance of cultivation as an experience booster in the current context, acknowledging the potential embarrassment of such exposure. Observing her reaction, Jihan surmised she possessed the cultivation gift but sought visual confirmation. Heian, acquiescing with a sigh, warned Jihan of potential regrets, urging a change of location for Jihan to initiate his connection. Jihan, however, indicated no need for relocation, vanishing into the battle net with a promise of a swift return. He commenced his battle to broadcast, with viewers immediately anticipating an extraordinary event. Jihan was set to delve into a dungeon, specifically the Imperial Tomb of the Conqueror, intriguingly represented by an icon of a venerable, bearded figure astride a horse, setting the stage for an epic undertaking. The Imperial Tomb of the Conqueror, renowned for its formidable challenges, lay deep beneath the earth, serving as the final resting place of a legendary conqueror. Beyond the myriad of monsters that prowled its depths, the labyrinth was notorious for its intricate puzzles and perilous traps, demanding not just bravery but astuteness from those who dared to navigate its confines. The paramount challenge lay in ensuring the survival of every team member until the very end, underscoring the indispensability of cohesive teamwork. Upon arrival, Jihan assessed his teammates, concluding that their assembly was promising. They hailed from the Black Eagle Guild, as evidenced by the emblem adorning their gear, a testament to their affiliation and collective strength. Since their sights set on clinching the first place, the team harbored expectations of a seamless victory with Jihan amongst their ranks. Despite the team's proposition to spearhead the expedition, Jihan volunteered for the leadership role. Buoyed by his confidence and proven might against adversaries in past encounters. This decision was met with approval from viewer who deemed Jihan a dependable force. The teammates, recognizing Jihan's capabilities, pledged their trust and allegiance, offering Jihan reassurance of their sincere commitment and dispelling any concerns of potential sabotage within their ranks. With resolve, Jihan led his team into the depths of the Imperial Tomb's first basement level, where they were promptly met by Imperial Tomb Guards. These were animated statue golems, ready for combat. When the green-eyed teammate suggested clearing a path with magic, Jihan opted instead to advance on his own, navigating through the enemy ranks with agility. He dismantled the stone adversaries with sheer force, leaving his teammates trailing behind puzzled by their inability to keep pace. As they ventured further, conquering the eighth passage with remarkable speed, the team demonstrated their proficiency. 
By the time they reached the third floor, spectators were mesmerized by Jahan's prowess. Discussions flourished among the viewers, speculating on whether Jahan would continue to forgo weapons, reminiscent of his earlier exploits in the Bronze League. Confidence abounded among the audience, convinced that with Jahan's historical performance, this expedition would be effortlessly surmounted. However, the unfolding events took a slight detour, as Takeda made a substantial donation of 10,000 GP to Jihan's stream. Jihan, noticing the contribution, pondered the motives behind Takeda's action, contemplating potential underlying strategies. The message accompanying Takeda's donation prompted Jihan to inspect his memo box, revealing Takeda's intention of bestowing a significant gift upon him. Viewers expressed their dismay towards Takeda, suspecting hidden agendas behind his actions and critiquing his overt attempts to recruit Jihan into the self-defense force. Amidst the unfolding drama, one viewer earnestly cautioned Jihan against any affiliation, while another voiced intentions of relocating should Jihan decide to join forces with Takeda in Japan. Jihan, addressing the concerns head-on, firmly stated his resolve to not pursue any ventures in Japan, regardless of the stakes involved, subsequently opting to block Takeda. His viewers, moved by his unwavering loyalty, rallied in the chat, echoing Jahan's name in a chorus of support. The teammate with green eyes expressed astonishment at the rapid conquest of the third basement floor, revealing his typical challenges in surpassing the first floor alone. The remark highlighted the stark contrast brought about by Jahan's presence. The heavily armored team member, injecting humor into the conversation, quipped that Jihan's exceptional performance was tantamount to single-handedly propelling the team forward, particularly noting how Jihan effortlessly subdued formidable foes using mere physical prowess. As they ascended towards the next level, the man with green eyes expressed his gratitude to Jihan, acknowledging their heavy reliance on his prowess. He offered an apology, to which Jihan responded with understanding, noting apologies were unnecessary so long as there were no deliberate attempts to undermine the game. Upon reaching the fourth basement floor, they encountered a deceptively simple corridor, its surfaces plastered with warning signs. Initially, the green-eyed man underestimated the potential dangers, only to find an array of traps densely packed throughout the area. Jihan queried if they could expedite their progress, receiving an eager assent from the green-eyed man, though the others exhibited reluctance, their demeanor hinting at concealed motives. The archer and the knight, their intentions veiled, clutched their weapons with apprehension. Unbeknownst to Jihan, both harbored plans to secure a bounty of 1 million GP for themselves once Jihan had departed. A system alert disclosed that Sword King Clan 787 had issued a bounty mission urging members of the Black Eagle Guild to avoid capture by opting for a swift exit from the game with the promise of a lucrative reward. This directive was a direct consequence of Takata's actions, the same individual Jihan had decisively blocked earlier, illustrating the intricate web of alliances and betrayals within the game. Takeda, monitoring Jihan's progress on a vast display, remarked on the predicament Jihan faced. He admitted that resorting to financial leverage wasn't his initial strategy but deemed it necessary under the circumstances. With a cunning smile, he rationalized that circumstances dictated this approach. Takeda speculated on Jihan's next steps, highlighting the considerable expense incurred to maintain secrecy around his plans. Confident in his maneuver, Takeda anticipated Jihan's entrapment, suggesting the start of Jihan's troubles should he attempt evasion with the caveat that this outcome was inevitable barring any unforeseen interventions. Meanwhile, Golden Light appeared content, radiating a sense of accomplishment, hinting at his possible involvement or awareness of the unfolding events. Back in the dungeon, Jahan navigated a corridor laden with traps, poised and ready. The individual with emerald eyes offered assurance of his capability to deflect the imminent arrow assault. However, Jihan, untroubled, demonstrated his own formidable ability. The Absolute Zone, effectively halting the arrows in their tracks. This display left viewers astounded, showcasing yet another aspect of Jihan's remarkable skills within the game's perilous environment. Man with the green eyes, caught off guard, turned to his teammates only to find them on the brink of committing suicide. He quickly informed Jihan, urging immediate action to thwart the grim resolve. Jihan, employing his nameless divine art steps, harnessed energy underfoot, startling the archer who realized the knight harbored the same dire mission, witnessing Jihan's heavenly thunderstep. They were taken aback as he materialized, instantly before the archer, neutralizing both the archer and the knight with precise, debilitating strikes. The archer collapsed, while the knight winced from the impact to his arm. Jihan then immobilized them with a gesture, shrouding them in a crimson aura. The green-eyed man, arriving promptly, expressed concern for Jahan's condition and queried about the game's progression. Jahan exhaled in relief, acknowledging the narrowly averted crisis. Amidst their recovery, the knight and the archer exchanged heated words, with the archer's realization of their shared suicidal mission sparking further discord. The knight's curt response underscored the clarity of their predicament, 
signaling a moment of tense acknowledgement between the two. The man with green eyes, puzzled by the unfolding events, sought clarification. Jihan elucidated that they had been ensnared in identical missions aimed at a grim. The game would terminate for the individual who succumbed to the directive of self-destruction first. Reacting with a hand over his heart, the green-eyed man expressed his dismay at the contemplation of such a dishonorable tactic, subsequently offering an apology for his guildmate's actions. Jihan, with a gesture of understanding, dismissed the need for apologies, underlining his intervention that averted the dire outcomes. Upon noticing the green-eyed man's contemplation of his own demise, Jihan promptly acted, encasing his hand in a crimson aura to halt the act, revealing his awareness of the shared suicidal directive among them. The green-eyed man, overtaken by astonishment and incredulity, vocally confronted Jihan, questioning how he had deciphered their concealed intentions without witnessing any overtly dubious behavior. The Jihan confirmed that the situation unfolded as he had surmised. The directive for all Black Eagle Guild members was indeed self-termination. This revelation left the chat viewers perplexed, pondering the method by which Jahan had arrived at such a precise conclusion. Amidst the confusion, a notification signifying a new donation appeared. This time, the benefactor was Golden Light, who contributed a substantial 10,000 GP. Accompanying this generous donation was a message aimed at Jihan, urging him to exercise caution. It revealed a startling plot an entity had orchestrated a scheme, allocating 1 billion GP to incentivize the collective demise of the Black Eagle Guild members. Golden Light, with a radiant smile, introduced himself as Jihan's dedicated assistant in the unfolding drama. The chat community was abuzz with intrigue, pondering the backstory of the revealed events. Golden Light took the opportunity to shed light on his actions, confessing his steadfast admiration for Jihan. As a regular viewer of Jihan's streams, including sessions featuring the current team members, Golden Light had been privy to the moment Sword King 898 initiated the perilous mission with a staggering reward of a billion GP. The revelation sent ripples of astonishment through the chat, with the audience struggling to comprehend the enormity of the bounty placed on such a dire mission. Speculation arose regarding Sword King 898's identity, mirroring suspicions of past encounters. Golden Light validated these suspicions and detailed his communication with Jihan concerning the ominous scheme. Despite initially questioning the prudence of a 10,000 GP donation message, Golden Light deemed the action a pursuit of justice, driven by an unwavering commitment to Jihan's welfare. Emphasizing his role as a loyal supporter, he underscored his determination to make a difference, affirming the value of his contribution in the face of adversity. Jihan, engaging with the unfolding discourse, pondered the anomaly of the situation, questioning the logic behind setting a billion GP as the reward for a mission. He posited that, even accounting for the mission's dire nature, the valuation seemed excessively high. This sentiment resonated with the chat participants, with one viewer expressing skepticism about the justification of such a sum regardless of the Sword King Clan's involvement, while another questioned the authenticity of the Sword King Clan's role in this scenario. Jihan proceeded to theorize that the individual commissioning the billion GP missions likely holds a significant position within a renowned guild or belongs to a distinct faction, separate from the Sword King Clan. This hypothesis found a receptive audience among the chat participants, who deemed Jihan's surmising as a credible interpretation of the events. Jihan elaborated on his perspective, indicating that expending a billion GP merely to access a stat window bordered on fixation. This prompted a viewer to jest about the similarity of the situation to a certain individual known for his ample girth, subtly hinting at Tegea. Meanwhile, Takeda, unable to contain his frustration and feeling the pressure of the conversation, let slip a derogatory remark directed at Jihan. This outburst did not go unnoticed, with a viewer remarking on Takeda's long silence breaking in such a manner. Jihan shared his disappointment over the length some would go to merely to glimpse his stat window. It was at this juncture that he considered a revision to his earlier vow, sparking curiosity among his audience about a possible withdrawal of his promise. Contrary to expectations, Jihan unveiled a rope from his inventory, signifying a commitment adjustment rather than a retraction. He declared his intention to elevate the subscriber milestone from 200,000 to 1 million, reaffirming his pledge to achieve the top rank, thus escalating the stakes of his commitment amidst the unfolding drama. The viewers, intrigued by the unfolding events, speculated about the timeline for Jihan to achieve the monumental milestone of a million subscribers. Despite their irritation with Takeda, relief washed over them as Jihan maintained his commitment. Jihan himself found satisfaction in the turn of events, given his prior concerns about rapidly nearing the 200,000 subscriber mark. He viewed the revised goal as an opportunity for enhanced earnings, allowing himself to dream about the potential of reaching a million subscribers. Observers, noticing Jihan's amused expression while holding a rope, were initially puzzled about its intended use. Jihan's subsequent action of binding his three teammates with the rope elicited laughter, 
from the viewers, who enjoyed the sight of the problematic trio being subdued. Initiating movement, Jihan dragged the rope, causing the bound men to experience discomfort as they collided with the ground. Upon reaching their next challenge, the tied-up archer, filled with dread, sought clarification on the ominous setting they had entered. Echoing through the environment were warnings against disturbing a profound slumber, alongside proclamations of an emperor's everlasting reign. The emergence of numerous golden eyes reiterated the caution, amplifying the eerie atmosphere. Jihan and his team had ventured into the enigmatic realm of the sixth basement floor, a domain shrouded in mystery and guarded by unseen forces. Jihan persisted in escorting the three beleaguered individuals along their path. As they were hauled over the terrain, they internally critiqued Jahan's methods as excessively harsh. The audience, finding amusement in their predicament, expressed confusion over the trio's lack of verbal retaliation. Unbeknownst to them, Jahan had tactically rendered them mute with his abilities, effectively silencing any objections. Amid their silent protest, one speculated on Jihan's true power level, questioning whether his capabilities truly matched their bronze classification, given his evident superiority just moments before. Jihan, perhaps feeling a momentary lapse of severity, decided to lift the seal on their speech. The trio's immediate response was less than gracious, resorting to derogatory remarks and threats towards Jihan, signaling a clear disdain. This reaction prompted Jihan to reconsider his approach, opting to release them to avoid further aggravating the situation with the Black Eagle Guild, thereby demonstrating a strategic withdrawal in the face of potential widespread animosity. In response to their defiance, Jihan demonstrated his prowess by effortlessly penetrating the knight's armor with mere finger thrusts, which left the knight in disbelief. Jihan then questioned the loyalty of their guild to members who so readily resorted to threats. The knight felt a sudden weakness, a direct consequence of Jihan's precise strikes. Jihan applied the same technique to the archer, neutralizing any potential threat they posed. The knight, reflecting on Jihan's actions, speculated whether he was subjected to a specific martial technique, recognizing it as targeting vital pressure point a skill indicative of advanced mastery within the martial artist class. This realization forced the knight to reassess Jihan's combat role, acknowledging him as more than a mere support figure. Recollecting a past instance, when a mage had disparaged Jihan, the knight noted how Jihan had preemptively silenced any further dissent, emphasizing the immediate concern was the discomfort from being dragged rather than any guild allegiance. Jihan, demonstrating compassion, healed them, which the archer acknowledged gratefully, though he was quickly advised to maintain silence by the green-eyed man. Jihan's intermittent healing underscored a strategy to preserve their lives for the journey ahead. Upon reaching the sixth floor, Jihan harbored aspirations that surpassing this level would mark a significant milestone towards the completion of his expedition. As he ventured into the domain of the sixth underground floor, he encountered an army of clay soldiers, their golden eyes fixated on him. The number of soldiers increased, encircling him in a formidable assembly prepared for battle. The presence of the clay soldiers incited panic among Jihan's companions. Jihan, with swift and decisive actions, shielded them from harm and navigated through the clay adversaries with a prowess that mimicked swordsmanship. Despite the absence of a physical blade, showcasing his exceptional combat skills and strategic acumen in the face of overwhelming odds. The chat was thoroughly impressed by Jihan's adept handling of the situation. A system alert then notified Jihan that the tomb's guardians were on high alert, echoing warnings to refrain from disturbing the emperor's rest and emphasizing his eternal slumber. Observing the soldiers' illuminated eyes, Jihan deduced their enhanced berserker mode state. Subsequently, Jihan received notification of a special quest, challenging him to eliminate all the guards for a reward of 1,000 achievement points. This quest marked the first of its kind he had encountered since his participation in a defense map. To ensure the safety of his three companions, dubbed the clowns, Jihan activated his shield skill, creating a protective barrier around them. He evaluated the shield's robustness, enhanced by an activated force field, which proved significantly resilient. With his companions secured, Jihan deployed his skill forced absolute territory, drastically decelerating the tempo for anyone within its radius. This ability allowed Jihan to orchestrate the battlefield with mere gestures, a skill he recognized was underutilized by Baron solely for mana amplification. Determined to resolve the confrontation, Jihan employed his swordsmanship, swiftly dispatching the clay soldiers. A grin adorned his face as he received system confirmation of the quest's successful completion, showcasing his strategic prowess and martial capability in navigating the challenges of the tomb. Suddenly, the tomb's boss emerged, extending a grand welcome and presenting a philosophical riddle about gold hinting at the dual nature of desire and its pursuit. The boss then set the condition for granting their deepest desires, urging respect above all. Jihan, understanding the gravity of their challenge, recognized that success in the tomb hinged on the collective survival through this final ordeal. 
The chat erupted in excitement as Jihan and his team encountered the boss on the sixth underground floor. Four ceremonial circles materialized before the boss, signaling for them to pay homage. Jihan, with swift action, astounded onlookers by adeptly managing the group, initially perceived as a direct method to compel their compliance. In reality, Jihan utilized telekinesis to liberate the group from their bindings. With concentrated effort, evidenced by his eyes glowing a fierce red, Jihan articulated his belief in their potential success, leveraging his formidable force attribute. He orchestrated the group's movements, guiding them to fulfill the bowing gesture within their assigned circles. Despite the challenge posed by the distance, Jihan's strategic positioning at the center enabled him to effortlessly coordinate their actions, showcasing his exceptional control and leadership in navigating the intricacies of the tomb's final test. In a display of teamwork, Jihan led a coordinated bow, inadvertently causing one team member to bump their nose on the ground, much to the chat's delight. The audience lauded Jihan's finesse following the gesture, setting the stage for what they anticipated to be a flawless conclusion. The boss, pleased by their display of respect, granted them leave, affirming their triumphant navigation through the seventh underground floor. This swift dungeon clearance left the chat in awe, particularly as they learned the team currently in second place had only managed to reach the fourth floor. As the gate of return appeared and opened before them, the archer expressed contentment over securing the top spot, despite the elusive 1 billion GP reward. Meanwhile, the green-eyed man noted Jihan's lack of movement towards the exit, prompting curiosity among the viewers. They watched as Jihan, hand to face, contemplated their journey's conclusion within the dungeon. His expression shifted to one of amused disbelief, sparked by the latest quest he had encountered, hinting at the unexpected and, perhaps, absurd nature of the new challenge laid before him. Upon discovering a concealed quest that required him to pay genuine respect to the statue of the Conqueror, with the enticing offer of 5,000 achievement points and the legendary Conqueror's arrows as rewards, Jahan weighed the significance of the task at hand. The prospect of acquiring such a substantial number of points, coupled with the chance to possess the Conqueror's arrows, piqued his interest. He subtly glanced at the green-eyed man, contemplating the essence of genuine respect. As the green-eyed man grew restless, probing about Jihan's hesitation and the status of their competitors, Jihan, utilizing his telekinesis, focused intently on the boss. In a bold move, Jahan addressed him as the king of plunderers rather than the tomb conqueror, declaring it his earnest form of homage. This unforeseen action propelled the green-eyed man toward the boss, culminating in his grim demise by the emperor's horse. The incident left the knight in a state of shock, and the chat reeled from the abrupt turn of events. Bewildered by the drastic measure Jahan resorted to in demonstrating his respect. Taken by surprise, the boss inquired if Jihan had indeed dubbed him the king of plunderers. Jihan expounded on his reasoning, stating that a true conqueror masters the art of plundering. He clarified his intention wasn't to covet gold, but to honor the conqueror's legacy by desiring the weapon. He esteemed highly the conqueror's arrows. Jihan considered his aspiration for the arrows as a form of plundering, embodying his sincere respect. This explanation set the stage for fulfilling the hidden quest's unique requirement. After a brief pause, the Conqueror's demeanor shifted to one of amusement, his face breaking into a wide, sinister smile followed by hearty laughter. He praised Jihan's boldness and acknowledged the genuineness of his tribute. As Jihan reached out, the Conqueror acknowledged his valor, rewarding him with the coveted treasure for his authentic display of respect. Grateful, Jihan braced himself for the impending battle, signaling his readiness. The Conqueror then poised his arrow, the Phoenix Arrow, towards Jihan, setting the stage for a formidable challenge, inviting Jihan to prove his worth by attempting to claim it. As the Conqueror poised to launch the Phoenix Arrow, instructing Jihan to make his best attempt at intercepting it, anticipation built among the chat, curious about the tomb's mysteries and impressed by Jihan's acumen. Abruptly, the atmosphere intensified for the archer who began exhibiting signs of extreme distress, sweating heavily and gasping for air, as if on the verge of combustion from the unbearable heat, threatening the integrity of their gear. Before the Conqueror could unleash the arrow, a system alert notified them of a reduction in their ranks, leaving only two members in the team. Jihan, recognizing the impracticality of directly countering the arrow, redirected his focus towards the bow, inspired by a sage's counsel to advance straightforwardly during crises. Leveraging this insight, he swiftly executed a move that effectively severed the bow, a strategic maneuver that underscored his adaptability and quick thinking under pressure. The conqueror acknowledging Jihan's prowess, inquired about his name, likening him to a fellow plunderer, Jihan buoyed by his achievement, introduced himself, earning the Conqueror's admiration and the title of the Phoenix Arrow's rightful bearer. The Conqueror expressed a wish for a future encounter of greater honor, a notion Jihan contemplated with interest. A chat intrigued by the unfolding events, debated the weapon's form noting its resemblance to a spear. Jihan, embracing the moment, 
began to experiment with his new acquisition, contemplating its utility as a spear. When queried about the technique that secured his victory, Jihan credited the sage's near instantaneous guidance, highlighting the necessity of precise control and targeting. Having earned the conqueror's recognition, Jihan was spared further trials on the seventh underground floor. The chat, bewildered by Jihan's fortune amidst the loss of his entire team, watched as he prepared to exit the dungeon. Confronted by the knight, grieving the archer's demise, Jihan demonstrated no leniency, decisively using his spear to conclude the knight's life. A smirk crossed Jihan's features as a system notification confirmed the reduction of his party to a singular member, encapsulating the dungeon's harsh reality and Jihan's unwavering resolve. Upon completion of the dungeon, a notification confirmed the end of the game. Jihan returned to the real world, now in possession of his formidable new weapon and having secured the top rank. The recruiters in proximity observed his achievement with admiration, noting the exceptional performance for a bronze-level dungeon. Jihan then inquired of Heyon if she had witnessed the live stream of his triumph. Gaeyong commented on her inability to grow accustomed to such feats, regardless of frequency. Hayon commended Jihan, acknowledging his remarkable prowess. Subsequently, Jihan prompted Hayon to fulfill her earlier commitment to disclose her status window. Initially reluctant, her hesitation stemmed not from fear but from being awestruck by Jihan's newly acquired weapon, which she found slightly daunting. Upon Jihan setting the weapon aside, Hayon revealed her status window, albeit with a warning of potential regret on Jihan's part. Despite her reservations, Jihan, with a confident grin, reviewed her status, unveiling Heian's unique gift of fostering. She implored him to keep her ability confidential, while Gaeling pondered Heian's comfort level regarding the disclosure of her talent. In a reflective moment, Heian recalled her initial envy towards the newcomers from the Turtle Guild. Adorned with their impressive abilities, she lamented her own fortune, having invested significantly in both finance and faith, only to be granted the fostering gift which left her feeling underwhelmed. Presently, Gai Young pointed out Heian's tendency to critique the academy and her own gift, yet she chose to disclose her unique ability of fostering. Caught in a flush of embarrassment and anxiety, Heian puzzled over Jihan's silence. Interpreting his smirk as mockery, she defensively inquired if he found amusement in her situation. Jihan reassured her, explaining his smile was not born of ridicule but of genuine contentment. He then proceeded to ask for her phone number a request she countered by reminding him of her bet's outcome. Jihan, nonchalant, expressed his interest in simply acquiring her contact details, presuming they were included on the business card she previously handed to him. His admission of misplacing the card left her astonished, casting doubt on his interest in affiliating with her guild. Heian wrestled with her thoughts, puzzled over Jihan's request for her number after misplacing her business card. She speculated whether her fostering ability intrigued him, yet the notion seemed perplexing. The possibility that Jihan was toying with her emotions stirred within her, her pride complicating the act of sharing her contact information. Nevertheless, she eventually acquiesced, giving Jihan her number. Observing the entry, Jihan's reaction to the heart next to her name was a subtle smirk. As she departed, Heian cast a defiant look back at him, her smirk a silent challenge. Yet she found herself disconcerted by Jihan's composed demeanor, his smirk leaving her in a state of deeper confusion. As he walked away, Heian was left pondering Jihan's character, his unfazed attitude rendering him an enigma in her eyes, and despite her efforts to maintain a stance of indifference, she couldn't help but find him exceedingly perplexing. Inside the academy, Sia and her friends were captivated by Jihan's stream. A friend commended Jihan's exceptional skills, a sentiment Sia echoed, noting his daily progress and his impressive achievement in the Conqueror's Tomb. Amid this admiration, Hizu observed Sia with a look of irritation, her annoyance palpable. When the conversation shifted to Jihan's drastic change, since their last encounter a month prior at Sia's house, Hizu recalled Jihan's previous, less favorable impression as an unemployed, unkempt individual. The conversation sparked curiosity among the group, with one girl expressing a keen interest in meeting Jihan, marveling at his transformation. Sia, filled with pride, internally expressed gratitude towards her uncle for his significant growth. The discussion then veered towards Sia upcoming 18th birthday, a milestone that would officially grant her player status and unlock her status window. This transition sparked a mix of anticipation and apprehension among the group, acknowledging the profound change that access to battle Annette would bring, highlighting the significance of this coming-of-age moment in their lives. At Battle and Academy, anticipation buzzed in the air as students looked forward to the gift room event, a hallmark occasion where the Academy's diverse training and classes translated into unique presents for the students. A peer speculated on the caliber of gifts Sia might receive, suggesting her prominent family lineage might predispose her to an S-class gift, considering her father's SS rank, her mother's SS rank, and her distinguished title of saint. Rumors even hinted at her uncle possessing an S-rank gift or higher. 
Sia, however, dismissed the notion that DNA had any bearing on gift allocation. When a fellow student cited statistics suggesting otherwise, she chuckled, maintaining an optimistic outlook for receiving a favorable gift. With her 18th birthday looming on the 22nd, and today being the 13th, Sia couldn't shake off a growing sense of anxiety. Hiesu, attempting to allay her friend's nerve, assured Sia that there was no need for concern, urging her to anticipate the birthday gift she planned to give her. Despite Sia's protests against the need for any presents, Hisu persisted, her gaze carrying a subtle undertone of resentment. In Tokyo, Japan, the aftermath of a confrontation laid bare at the Neo Self-Defense Force First Training Hall, with a man defeated, emblematic of the Sword King's daunting presence and might. And lookers were astounded by the display of power, with murmurs acknowledging the Sword King's enhancement through rigorous practice. Observations circulated about the all-around enhancement of the Sword King's abilities, setting the stage for heightened expectations at the forthcoming battle in a national competition where Korea was slated to compete against Japan on August 15, 2023, at 17. Meanwhile, at the Gangnam Seoul Divergent Guild headquarters, Heian found herself embroiled in a heated telephonic exchange, challenging the judgment of the caller on the other end. The conversation veered into the realm of personal decisions, with Heian vehemently opposing the idea of being matched in marriage to someone of their choosing, thereby rejecting the notion of relinquishing her autonomy. Her stance was firm, echoing her reasons for departure and asserting her independence in matters of matrimony. The call's conclusion revealed her conversational partner to be her father, underscoring the familial tensions and Hyon's determined assertion of her self-determination. Gang stepped into the room, her expression laden with concern for Hyon. Hyon confessed she was far from fine, revealing the root of her frustration stemmed from an unexpected arranged date, worsened by the realization her suitor was not what she expected. The situation, she lamented, was absurd, with Gae Young concurring that wealth didn't shield one from life's complexities. Expressing gratitude for Gae Young's empathy, Heian faced a gentle suggestion to retreat home for some rest, which she politely declined, finding solace in their current setting. As they shared a moment appreciating the city's vista, Heian offered an apology to Gae Young, acknowledging the personal sacrifices made due to her demanding role as a bodyguard. Despite Gae Young's notable s rank skills, which could offer her broader prospects, she remained dedicated to Hyun's side, pledging to stay until the eventual transition of company leadership. Gae Young's commitment underscored a deep sense of loyalty, reinforcing the bond between them amidst the challenges they faced. Hyun shared her hesitance to take over the family company, revealing her yearning for personal autonomy, to forge her own path without the looming pressures of marriage dictated by her parents. Gae Young, acknowledging Hyun's quest for independence, lamented that Hyun's chosen avenue was gambling. Heian defended her gambling as a strategic, lawful method of investment, predicting wins based on calculated risks. Gae Young, skeptical, questioned the investment's validity without assured returns. Undeterred, Heian maintained her optimism for a substantial win in the upcoming event. The conversation shifted to the highly anticipated Korea versus Japan round, which Gae Young deemed a relatively prudent gamble. She remarked on the peculiar trend of many Koreans placing their bets on Japan's sweeping victory, despite their public allegiance. As Heian mulled over this irony, her train of thought was abruptly interrupted by a notification. Receiving a message from Jihan left her momentarily bewildered, her focus shifting to the contents of the unexpected communication. In a vibrant city restaurant, the air was filled with the aroma of sizzling Korean beef. Diego Masid, overseeing the grill, expressed his excitement about experiencing the renowned delicacy for the first time, despite a slight concern over the expense. He inquired if Jihan found the indulgence acceptable. Jihan, ever generous, reassured him and even proposed ordering more, if Diego found it to his liking. When Diego mentioned wanting a beverage, Jihan recommended wine, leading to Diego showcasing his adeptness and uncorking two bottles and serving them both. Their glasses met in a toast, with Jihan internally commending Diego's flair in blending soju and beer. Diego immersed in the culinary excellence before him, was nearly at a loss for words, enveloped in a sensation of sheer delight. Jihan took pleasure in witnessing Diego's appreciation of the meal. Post-meal, Diego shared reflections tinged with a sense of loss regarding his transformed existence, attributing his current lifestyle to the emergence of battlement. He delved into his past as a celebrated soccer player, whose life took a drastic turn, leading to financial hardships that estranged him from his wife and daughter. Jihan empathized with Diego's plight, acknowledging his former stature as an international soccer icon, living a life many envied, yet the advent of Battlenet redirected the world's attention away from traditional sports diminishing his fan base and relegating him to obscurity within the soccer realm. Presently, Diego found solace in Korea, imparting his soccer knowledge to children, a journey marked by resilience in the face of profound change. Diego, driven by curiosity, 
inquired into Jihan's reasoning behind encouraging him to pursue the path of a mage. Jihan unveiled that Diego's unique gift amplified the power of any equipment that bore resemblance to a soccer ball, a revelation that explained Diego's constant companionship with one. Despite this, Diego harbored skepticism regarding his suitability for magahood, citing his less-than-stellar mana statistics as a significant hurdle. Jihan, undeterred, introduced Diego to an extraordinary item that could potentially alter his trajectory. The item known as the Arachne Orb was a B-ranked mystical artifact originating from the Arachne Spider Tribe. Wrapped in durable spider silk, the orb boasted an unparalleled elasticity, its design inherently making it an ideal tool for Diego's skill set. Given that spiders primarily utilize their feet, the orb's characteristics rendered it a perfect match for Diego's unique abilities. Jihan, intrigued by the prospect, eagerly awaited Diego's reaction to this serendipitous discovery, believing the orb to be a catalyst that could awaken Diego's latent capabilities. He posited that the Arachne orb held the key to unlocking the formidable prowess Diego once wielded in a previous existence as the most formidable mage known to history. Diego's curiosity was immediately sparked, leading him to inquire about the cost of the orb. Jihan disclosed the price as 500,000 GP, which translates to approximately 50 million in standard currency. The figure left Diego astounded, likening it to a down payment on a house, and he humorously noted that even a decade of savings wouldn't suffice for such a purchase, though he appreciated the insight. Yet Jihan had not reached the crux of his proposition. He announced his intention to not only gift Diego the orb, but also to extend financial assistance whenever necessary. Baffled by such generosity, Diego sought clarity on Jihan's motivations. Jihan then unveiled his aspiration for Diego to become a cornerstone member of his guild, a venture he aimed to formalize upon achieving silver rank. Taken aback by the revelation, Diego questioned Jihan's financial capability to sustain such ambitious plans. In response, Jihan affirmed his current and prospective financial stability, offering a glimpse of his phone screen, which contained startling information. This revelation prompted Diego to question Jihan's rationale, wondering if such audacious plans bordered on recklessness. Heian, deeply immersed in contemplation, was interrupted by an alert on her phone, a message from Jihan presenting it as a gift. The message outlined the expected outcomes of the forthcoming game, suggesting Korea would clinch a single victory while succumbing to three losses against Japan. With a dismissive scoff, Heian doubted Korea's prospects, particularly against the legendary prowess of the Sword King. The stage was set for the Korea vs. Japan showdown, with the Sword King embodying determination as the competition loomed. Jihan had placed a wager, based on the prediction that South Korea would secure one round, with Japan emerging victorious in three. He had pinpointed Lee, Yanuk, and Ito Ru as the MVPs for the South Korean and Japanese teams, respectively. Diego, while not underestimating the Korean team, questioned Jihan's grasp of the Sword King's might, describing him as a formidable force capable of single-handedly deciding the outcome of the match. This insight cast the Sword King not only as a competitor but as a significant obstacle in their path. Jihan, with a gesture towards the television, suggested that the complexity of his prediction might be more easily understood through visual demonstration. Activating the TV, he tuned in to witness the unfolding match, anticipating that the live event would elucidate his rationale. The competition's commencement was officially announced, detailing the victory prerequisites, a series of five rounds where the first team to achieve three wins would triumph. The announcement sparked an uproar of excitement among the audience. As the match proceeded, the Sword King attempted to rally his teammates, proposing a strategy that required their cooperation. However, an uncomfortable silence ensued, eventually broken by the team's clear refusal to accept his leadership. When the Sword King probed if their resistance was rooted in his Korean heritage, they clarified that their allegiance was with C, a valued teammate they believed was sacrificed due to the Sword King's previous decisions. This revelation underscored a division within the team, highlighting the complexities of loyalty and the shadows of past actions on present alliances. As the Sword King sought to clarify the apparent misunderstanding enveloping the tension with his team, a sudden burst of golden light caught him off guard. His teammates, aware of the impending confrontation, braced themselves for the ensuing battle, recognizing the Korean team's arrival. The attacker, taken aback by the success of their strike on the Sword King, was astonished, having not anticipated their move to be effective. Another player speculated that the Sword King's distraction with the dispute might have left him vulnerable to the unexpected supporter skill. As the Sword King's form began to pixelate, indicating damage, the Korean team seized the moment to launch an offensive. Their strategy was preemptive aggression, swiftly moving to engage the Sword King. Contrary to expectations, the Sword King retaliated with a swift slash of his sword, creating a substantial fissure in the ground, halting the Korean team's advance. 
A teammate, bewildered by the Sword King's drastic measure, confronted him, their voice laden with mixed feelings. The Sword King, addressing the Discord and their refusal to unite under his leadership, chose to impale himself with his sword, effectively removing himself from the contest. This act of self-sacrifice, spurred by the team's Discord, led to his withdrawal from the match. As he dissipated, he acknowledged the strained dynamics and opted out, his departure marking a surprising turn of events. This unexpected development was solidified by a system notification, announcing the Korean team's first kill, the Sword King. The audience, including Diego, was left in disbelief by the unforeseen turn of events. While Jihan maintained his calm, indicating his anticipation of such an outcome, the match's commentator voiced astonishment over the unexpected development, attributing the pivotal final strike to Divergent Guild's Lee jin -wook, which potentially nominated him as the round's MVP. Curious Diego questioned Jihan about his foresight, to which Jihan playfully referred to it as a company secret, advising to keep their attention on the unfolding battle. Simultaneously, Jihan consulted his phone, observing the steady dividend rate and noting the predictability of events, which seemed to align with his earlier conjectures of manipulated dynamics within the competition. His revelation came as the Korean team demonstrated superior strategy and strength, decisively outmaneuvering the Japanese team to clinch a victory in the first round. The system's declaration of South Korea as the round's winner marked a significant moment in the competition, underscoring the unpredictability and dynamic nature of the battle in international competition. The match commentator attributed South Korea's unexpected victory to a strategic withdrawal by the Sword King and spotlighted Jin Wook as the anticipated MVP of the round. It was clear that the turn of events had taken both participating nations' players by surprise. Amidst the ensuing shift in dynamics, a teammate confronted the Sword King with heightened anger, vehemently questioning his decision to voluntarily exit the match despite representing their country. The teammate's exasperation escalated, manifesting a confrontational demeanor. The Sword King, unfazed, retorted by denouncing his teammates' professionalism and sensibility. He attributed their recurrent defeats to their inability to unite under a singular vision, making it clear that without their acceptance of his guidance, he would prefer to step aside. He presented them with a stark ultimatum, to either secure victory under his leadership or continue facing humiliation as they had in the past. With a mix of reluctance and frustration, the teammate released the Sword King's collar, conceding to the compromise despite muttering discontentedly about their limited options. This pivotal moment underscored the internal conflict and the critical decision to either embrace unity for potential victory or persist in disarray, risking further defeats. As the second round commenced, the atmosphere was thick with anticipation and uncertainty regarding the Sword King's prior actions. Rumors swirled, suggesting the Sword King might be a traitor from within, but the Korean team's captain dismissed this idea, sensing a distinct and foreboding presence emanating from the Sword King as he confronted them with a daunting stance. The team was cautioned to remain vigilant, but their preparations were in vain as the Sword King launched a devastating assault with his dual blades, decimating the Korean lineup, sparing only one bewildered survivor. The audience, including Jihan, watched in disbelief as the Sword King exhibited a formidable prowess far beyond human capabilities, leaving an indelible mark of astonishment on all present. Sword King Raihu Hai's merciless technique, demonstrated through a swift and lethal pair of strikes, led to the downfall of the entire Korean team during the critical fourth round, securing a momentous victory for Japan in the third round, thereby altering the competition's dynamic with a two-to-one lead in favor of Japan. The commentator, amidst the frenzy of excitement, proclaimed Japan's triumph while simultaneously rallying the Japanese competitors to consolidate their advantage, steering clear of the overwhelming defeat experienced in the prior round. A member of the Korean team launched an attack towards the Sword King, who skillfully dodged and delivered a swift counter. This action prompted a rallying cry among the Korean players, urging them to keep the pressure on the Sword King. One of them, using his unique ability, transformed his hand into a golden weapon and ensnared the Sword King's hand with chains. Concurrently, additional team members, donning protective helmets, surged forward in a unified assault, embodying the spirit of sacrifice and determination. In an unexpected turn, the Sword King relinquished his conventional sword, instead conjuring a mystical blue blade that parried an incoming strike from one of the helmet-clad warriors, effortlessly breaking free from the golden bondage. He launched a rapid counterattack, incapacitating his helmeted adversary. As a mage attempted to subdue him with magic, the Sword King shattered the magical constraints and overcame the mage's spell, showcasing his dominant prowess. Amidst the escalating tension, the focus of the remaining Korean participants narrowed exclusively to the Sword King, inadvertently neglecting their other adversaries. This oversight led to the swift elimination of a Japanese team member by the Korean side, illustrating the unpredictable and dynamic nature of the battle. In the heat of the competition, 
the Japanese team member cautioned the Koreans against underestimating their adversaries. This warning was swiftly underscored by the surprising appearance of the Sword King, who materialized, levitating ominously behind the Korean contenders. Taken aback by this unexpected development, a Korean player with a mix of surprise and sarcasm inquired if the Sword King had journeyed all the way to Japan merely to master such an impressive levitation technique, playfully suggesting it was a more visually appealing stance than mere standing. The Sword King, with a hint of regret in his voice, lamented the Korean team's focus on taunts over tangible combat skills, implying their current position in the match might have been different otherwise. And phased, the Korean player summoned a vibrant blue aura around him, boldly inviting the Sword King to observe his prowess firsthand. Accepting the challenge, the Sword King raised his dual swords, declaring his readiness to demonstrate a newly perfected skill. As a brilliant golden radiance engulfed his weapons, he executed a formidable strike, calling forth a titanic golden sword from the heavens. This overwhelming force struck down upon the Korean, leaving behind a monumental crater and decisively concluding the round in Japan's favor. With a score of 3-1, the audience, momentarily paralyzed by the sheer magnitude of the display, could scarcely believe the level of destruction unleashed. The commentator acknowledging Korea's defeat, pointed out that while this battle ended in loss, it was but a single chapter in an ongoing saga, underscoring the philosophy that a singular defeat does not dictate the entirety of one's fate. After witnessing the surprising turn of events in the match, Diego expressed his amazement to Jihan, inquiring about his uncannily accurate prediction. Jihan, with a hint of humor, suggested he had foreseen the outcome in a dream, which left Diego both skeptical and impressed. Jihan conceded that he had placed a significant wager on the match's result, yet he was contemplative about the sheer magnitude of Sword King's power displayed during the competition. Internally, Jihan evaluated his own journey towards mastering the nameless divine art, an SS rank skill, and contemplated the uphill battle to surpass Sword King, especially given the latter's mastery of the dual blades named Ultima. With a renewed sense of purpose, Jihan vowed to strengthen his resolve and eventually confront the Sword King in a direct battle. In a different scene, Heian was practically vibrating with disbelief and excitement as she observed the outcome of her bet on her phone. Her astonishment was palpable as she realized her initial investment had multiplied exponentially. Though initially thrilled by her windfall, Heian's excitement was tempered by the realization that her confident bet on South Korea's absolute defeat had backfired, resulting in a significant financial loss. To reflecting on her bold wager of 200 million, she lamented the missed opportunity for a more secure future acknowledging the gamble that led to her unexpected financial downturn. In the serene ambiance of a city restaurant, Yihan inquired whether Diego would consider forming an alliance by signing the contract. Puzzled, Diego hesitated, unable to grasp why someone of Jihan's caliber would seek out someone like him for a partnership. He reflected on his value and significance in such a collaboration. Jihan responded with a smile, his confidence shining through, just as it had with his precise prediction of the outcome between Japan and Korea. Intrigued by Jihan's enigmatic assurance, Diego pressed for more information. Jihan elaborated on his belief in Diego's latent potential to ascend as a peerless mage. He described the contract not merely as a formal agreement, but as a faith in Diego's untapped capabilities, urging him to join hands for the future ahead. Diego, moved by Jihan's faith in him, a sentiment he hadn't felt in ages, felt a resurgence of worth and purpose. He agreed enthusiastically, vowing to exceed Jihan's expectations first promising a thousand-fold effort, then ambitiously increasing it to tenfold. Jihan, pleased by Diego's spirited commitment, looked forward to their future endeavors together, marking the beginning of a promising alliance on the battlefield. In a distant battle arena, Ga Young, with unmatched agility, confronted two assailants. Her blade danced through the air, neutralizing the threat with minimal effort. She stood amidst the fallen, victorious yet introspective. Her triumph in the survival game, standing as the sole survivor among fifty combatants, was overshadowed by her relentless drive for excellence. Her thoughts wandered to legends like the Sword King and Jihan, whose unparalleled achievements cast a shadow on her own. Ga Young's resolve hardened. She knew she had to escalate her training to not just keep pace but to redefine her limits and forge her path among the elites. Elsewhere, Sia perused an article detailing her father's decisive victory in the international battle and net competition. The silence in the car was broken by her friend's concerned inquiry about her well-being, despite Sia's reassurance. Her friend's intuition sensed the underlying turmoil. An offer of companionship was kindly refused by Sia, who cited a pending engagement with her uncle as her next commitment. The conversation took a lighter turn, discussing potential plans, but was abruptly interrupted by their arrival at the imposing gates of the Sword Palace. The sight of the crowd gathered outside sparked curiosity and a hint of apprehension in Sia's heart, leaving her to ponder the cause of such an unexpected assembly. 
Jihan is at the topmost part of a building, admiring nature and reminiscing on his times in the US. At that time, he used to space out in high places and it helps him remember the good old days. It feels realistic to him at that moment. He begins to think about the kind of person Yeon Si Jin is at the time. However, he remembers that he had not even had a match with Sejin before. During the period of the turbulence, when more than half of the world disappeared, he had stood shoulder to shoulder with high-ranking people. However, it is strange that Yuan Si Jin, who had kept his top one rank, had suddenly disappeared. He does not know the reason for the disappearance himself, but at that moment, the current Yuan Si Jin is at a level comparable to his prime. Ji Han, however, will not stop working because he is growing fast as he needs to get stronger than he was in his past life. He needs to obtain the name Less Divine Art faster. He is lost in thought as he bumps into a group of reporters trying to interview Miss Say Ah. They ask her what she thinks about the Sword King's battle. However, before she could say a word, her friend had already stepped in to stop her. She is shocked to see them and does not utter a word as they continue, stating that there were responses stating that the previous statement he made stimulated the Sword King even more. They try to compel her to say something to the people as Jihan interrupts them. He tries to distract them and tells them that he will hold the interview with them instead. They tried to make a fuss because Jihan intervened. He beats them all and tells them to stay out of his way. They confront him for trying to hurt the reporters. They threaten to give a report about his misdemeanor. However, he says that he would have punished them even further if he didn't think of what the masses would say. He warns them and states that he will let them go, because that was the first time. He would have beaten them and even sent them to prison if he was permitted. They were always loitering around Yuan and trying to get something out of the innocent girl. Jihan did not even know the backstory before intervening. The reporters on their part were not even expecting anything like that from a stranger. It gets even worse when they try to threaten him as they retreat on finding out that he is not scared of their threats. He then finds his way to where Sei Ai is and tells her to come outside. Yon had gone to hide somewhere she could not be easily found. She just wanted to get out of where the crowd was. She was obviously tired of questions and would do anything to get away from the reporters. He volunteers to take her home as they appreciate him for guarding her. They then refer to Jihan as her uncle and ask him to take care of her. He is stunned but does not deny them the privilege of misunderstanding their relationship as strangers. Kim Hisu, who was watching everything that is happening, begins to laugh at Seiya. After she leaves with Jihan, the other students watch and talk about her. She then remarks that Seiya is doomed. However, on getting Jot Jihan, and Seiya review a tape of Yuan Saijin stating that he does not have a daughter, and that he had buried everything in the past and had become a citizen of Japan. He says again that he does not have a daughter and even warns people, and tells them to refrain from asking non-constructive questions. Jian notes that they are making a fuss because of the tape from the interview with Yuan Sijin. He asks if he should beat him up for her. However, she is still looking sad and dejected and does not pay attention to him. She had begun to see him as her uncle, so she speaks to him casually and reminds him of a promise he had made to her some time ago. He had promised that he would grant her all her wishes provided she asks for any. He had promised to grant her wish on a condition. The condition is that he will grant her wish when he finds the Shadow King. He is shocked when she tells him that she had found him. He had tried his very best to trace the Shadow King all these while and had not even successfully found any useful information, or even the slightest clue about him, only for Yun to approach him with some good news. He listens on with interest. Dihan then remembers that he had tried to look up the Shadow King a day before Sei, it tells him that she had found the Shadow King. Jihan is playing a game where a poor employee in the game asks him to wait and then proceeds to ask if he is in the right room. He asks Jihan what he is doing as he says that he's going to break for a while. However, the game continues as Bori Cracker and Arrowroot Man converse. Bori Cracker says that someone has prepared something strange again, while Arrowroot says that he likes it. Jihan says he will take a look at the Shadow King to detect if he is real or not. Back to Seiya's confession of having seen the Shadow King. She states that she thinks that it might be the Shadow Queen instead. She says further that she is not sure if she is the strongest candidate after which he asks her if there is any reason at all why she thinks like that. However, she remarks that they were originally suspicious of the Elf Queen sitting on the throne, and both of them are openly acting like queens. However, the Elf seems closer to a shadow. Jihan is still confused as she tells him to take a look at the material that she just sent. She then begins to point out things like the color of the eye. She says that it's not like there are absolutely no elves with black eyes, but it appears that it is rare that even the whites of her eyes are black too. He begins to understand her slowly, as he says that he has also noticed other strange things. He states that the elf was always eyeing the first rank even before the game began. She said that the elf was strangely always looking at Jihan, who was dumbfounded at how far Yoon had researched. Yoon says that she took time to look closely at the other matches also. 
However, it appears that in two places and on two occasions, she was staring at the player who would become first even before the match started. It was as if she knew the future. It seems strange even to Yuan. How can a shadow-like thing be studying Jihan like that? It is not clear if she meant harm or good, so Yuan did not take any action but to watch with keen interest and do research. She could not just jump into conclusions as she must make her findings and be very sure before approaching Jihan to tell him anything. Jihan find this very strange as it no longer seemed like a coincidence. However, the most important thing is in the last video. They decided to take time to observe the shadow under her feet. Yon explains that it is not so clear because of the quality but she also finds it very weird and that it is not only Jihan that sees something wrong with it. He says that it is worth checking out, however he is flabbergasted about the whole thing and pauses for a while only to ask if Yon organized and made all the findings alone. She tells him that it is her doing and that she had taken time to put everything together over time. He asks her if she is very sure that she is not overdoing things on his account. However, she quickly dissuades him of such thoughts and states that she had nothing better to do anyway. He thanks her and tells her that he will check things out in the next Colosseum. She states that he is welcome and that she only hopes that she is right. He then states that he is ready to carry out his promise. Yuan is stunned and transfixed to a spot as he asks her to state anything she wants. She is reluctant, but he tells her to say anything she wants as he's ready to grant her wish. She tries to make a wish, however before she could say anything else, Jahan suddenly breaks into the game session roughly again. He had achieved 10 kills with a sudden breakage. That should be enough to place first. He then proceeds to breaking the bleacher's barrier just as planned. The involved personnel in the game begin to talk about how Jihan had planned to break barriers and they try to see if he would be able to blow the bleachers away. At the time a barrier is placed between the stadium and the bleachers of the Colosseum, it also appears that its strength is equivalent to the barrier skill of a diamond supporter. It is not only equivalent to the barrier skill of a diamond supporter, its job is also to block all attacks coming from the stadium. It also appears that her true state can be seen with the wanderer's eye. Jihan finds out that he just has to do little by creating a gap that permits him to see outside the barrier. The game personnel again begin to talk, saying that he might eventually break it successfully. However, the other states that everything might just be mere bluffing, and it is not feasible. He ignores them all and states that it is very much possible. He is prepared to break all the barriers irrespective of the side comments and distractions. He forged ahead with the intention of achieving his aim as they kept watching him in disbelief. He relies on something very valuable, and he intends to use it in breaking the barrier. The thing he relies solely on happens to be the phoenix arrow that he had gotten from the dungeon. The arrow happens to possess so many qualities such as a censor. Arrow of the Conqueror, made from the phoenix feathers which shows the greatest power when flying. It also has the trait of returning to its owner's hands. Also, as the phoenix flames are sealed within, it is programmed in such a way that it will disappear after being thrown five times. It happens that it cannot give Jihan the maximum power because of risk. However, if he is prepared to break the barrier, just piercing through it is enough. He then calls out to Limitless Tri-Talent and asks to see its face. He instructs that the way be pointed to immortality. He strikes really hard after making these statements. The game personnel begin to talk about his exploits again. They seem to find hope in him again, stating that it might really work, but they are not blinking at all. However, before they could finish talking, Jihan begins to break barriers. He breaks many more to their surprise after which the Wanderer's eye becomes activated. Jihan then states that she must act fast before the barrier recovers. However, he sees something strange as the Shadow King seems to be standing opposite him, and then asks that he reveal himself. Jihan is stuck and shocked and cannot remember what had led him where he is. He asks to know where he is as everywhere is dark and silent. It seems as though he had been thrown into the middle of a dungeon as there is not even a single soul to answer his question. It looked as though he had been abandoned somewhere far away and difficult for him to be heard or to even get out of. He called out for help, but no one replied. Sun Jihan is just waking up from sleep after a game mission. He remarks that he had a tiring day and struggles out of bed. He had tried to sleep earlier, but his effort was futile. He had experienced the stress with a bronze body, which was impressive. Even when he had considered his life after regression, the power was incredible. It will be immensely helpful as he moves on. He gets out of bed and goes to check his achievement shop. He had upgraded the achievement shop to level 5 with the points he had saved, this made it easy to add the extra constellation slot. He can now pick more than one constellation. He scrolls up and sees an information that says that Earth is currently in the tutorial season, and that if he purchases anything at that moment, it will not appear in his status window until the tutorial season ends. He says that he does not need it just yet, and he will prefer to save it for later. He then proceeds to buy an extra title slot. 
The good news is that since Jihan has reached level 22, he was only three levels away from being able to participate in the silver promotion match. Also, since he has force martial power and a title, one could say that his promotion was pretty much already guaranteed. The reason for purchasing an extra title slot is so that he can earn the martial god's successor title. However, he will not be able to earn this title until when he reaches level 30 and also successfully obtain the Nameless Divine Arts. In the process of doing this, he will be able to connect with the Wandering Martial God and be granted the title. It is a title he had used before his regression. He makes up his mind to go and get it at all costs as he will be in need of it. This is because he will need it to fight against an enemy. Later Jihan and a girl whose name is Yon and whom Jihan happens to be an uncle to are seen with an estate agent. It appears that they need an apartment. He shows them around and tells them that the place is located in Gangnam's central area and there are also many prestigious schools around. He also shows them that it has a view of the Han River. That is the best apartment he has for sale. He asks them if the 200 square meters is enough for them both. Jihan asks to know how small the room looks as he takes them to another room so that they can have a good look at it. It appears that Yuan does not look like she fancies the room or anything about it, although she had nothing like a disapproving expression on her face, or even in her countenance. Jihan could just feel it in his gut that it is not so convenient for her, and they might have to search other places. He finds it hard to believe that she wishes to be away from everyone. She just wanted to leave the Sword Palace. She just could not wait to leave it, and to leave everything about it behind. Being there seems to be a very difficult thing to handle for her. Jihan thinks that it is perfect that the rooms are not big, and there is a reason why there were no vacancies irrespective of the price. He might have to search other places. He turns to her and states that they might both have to look into other places that have more space. The girl does not seem satisfied with the room. This is because she had lived in the Sword Palace penthouse for her entire life and a normal apartment might not be suitable for her. She wishes to leave the house because it reminded of her father. They need to get a house with a bigger space. Jihan turns to the agent and says that his supposed niece will soon become a player and they will be needing a room for a connector. The agent then assures that he will try to fix the problem. It is quite obvious that he cares about Yoan and Jihan as he is trying his best to get a comfortable accommodation for them, so that Yoan can be convenient. He commends Jihan for being such a reliable uncle. Jihan does not take the credit as he remarks that he still has a lot of things to put in place and many other things to improve on. The agent says that he has always cheered Jihan on as a fan. Jihan says that he is grateful. However, the agent cuts in again stating that he is most grateful. He explains that he had always been a member of the Sword King fan club and that he had to leave immediately he took off to Japan. Also, he says that he is very worried about Yoon's well-being and had even imagined that she was going through a lot as she might even be having some negative thoughts. He remarks that he feels quite relieved that she's okay. He then stops addressing Jihan and turns to Miss Yoon and tells her that he is happy that she is now awake and that he is very sure that she will receive a great gift. Jihan thinks it is bad for her and dangerous that interest in her has grown after the Korea-Japan game. He is quite sure that the entire country is waiting for her awakening in her gift. However, the moment they find out that it is an F-rank gift, it is most likely that the attention will turn into toxicity. The news that the Sword King's daughter Yuan Sei Ah had received an F-rank gift will make many come for her. They will certainly remark that it is an F-rank despite how eager they were. They will even be more agitated to note that there is an S's rank traitor and an F-rank daughter. It is going to be very bad for Yuan and he must do something about it immediately. He must do everything within his power to stop all that is happening. And that will start by stopping everyone from approaching her at the moment, especially reporters. However, the reporter is somewhere in her office planning to interview Miss Yoon. The reporter happens to be Kim Hisu, Taewon Daly's granddaughter. She tells her colleague, who is also her brother, that Miss Yoon will be visiting their academy's gift hall for an interview. The man is happy to expect Yoon as it disgusts Hisu, who secretly hates Yoon and is looking forward to tarnishing her image using the interview. Her brother teases her a bit, stating that such is expected from a media conglomerate family, and it merely an act of hypocrisy. This infuriates Hayasu, who states that he can leave it if he does not like the way they operate. She tells him not to be judgmental, as she has reasons for all her actions. However, it appears that he is more concerned about seeing Yeon. He does not understand why his sister hates the innocent girl so much. However, he also does not have a good plan for her, as he only remembers her in his perverted thoughts and talks. Hersuo says that Yuan talks to her as though they are equals, and that she would have been a peasant originally if it weren't for Battle.net. She intends to use Yuan as a perfect subject for breaking news. If Yuan ends up getting a trash gift, Hisu thinks that she might have the chance to bully her. However, her uncle, Jihan, might be a great barrier as he always stays close to her. 
She asked her brother if he can defeat Jahan in a fight. He says that Jahan does not even stand a chance. She tells him that she will give you unto him when she is done with her as it was their deal. He had planned to have her to himself after trashing Jihan and after his sister must have had her way with her. Just 14 hours before Sayahe awakening, at the Seoul Gangnam Battlenet Academy, the deceitful Hyu so tries to convince Sayah to do the interview with her grandfather's press company Taewon Daily. However, Sayah insists on not doing it, but he so would have none of this, as she continues to plead with her to reconsider, claiming that the entire interview would benefit her greatly. When she notices that Sayah remains adamant, she flips over from begging to trying to manipulate her. To do this, she claims that she is really disappointed in Sayah. This is because the news on her father, the Sword King, made her a victim of various criticism from everyone even after it is glaring that she is innocent. To cover this up and make people believe that she truly is innocent, he so suggests she does the interview. She reveals that she had asked her grandfather multiple times to get this opportunity to help her and urges Sayah to take it. However, Sia mind seemed to already be made up, and she thanks he so for her concern, further insisting on not wanting the interview at all. Then, to avoid any further disturbance from Heiso, she goes to the restroom. When she leaves, Hiraiso reveals her true colors, referring to her as a bitch and claiming not to like her one bit. She is frustrated that Sei would not agree to this interview, which she had hoped to use to destroy her, after finding out what her gift is. However, she rests assured remembering that her men are waiting in front of the gift room to ambush her, remembering that CR Awakening would be happening that night. He so wonders what gift she would get. Although she doesn't care about any of that and is only concerned about how she can milk the situation by getting an article out of Sayar. After that, she doesn't mind if Sayar go to hell or gets an F rank as a gift. Meanwhile, Sayar spends time in the bathroom pondering on how things have been for her lately. She affirms the fact that it was really hard for her to hold herself back from reacting to all Hiso had said. Apparently, she knew who Hiso truly is and saw through her mask of friendship. Earlier on, while in the bathroom, she had heard some students asking Hiso if she was still friends with her and she had blatantly denied this. Surprisingly, she had told them of her plans of sending Say Ah to hell and cutting ties with her. Although she accepts that, she intends to get as much as she can out of her first. These students, knowing how much of a goner Say Ah father is, remind Hiso wondering what she hopes to get out of a girl like this. In response, she reminds them that her family runs a media company and the best time to suck anything out of someone is when they are falling into hell. After saying this, she hopes that Seiya get an f rank gift which would make her breakdown completely giving Hisu the chance to take some pictures of her in this face of despair. She believes this would be very interesting to see and capture making her get a lot of views. Back to the present, Seiya is left utterly disappointed at seeing who he so truly is. However, she didn't let herself wallow in this disappointment. Instead, she is more bothered about what she would get at her awakening, hoping not to get an f rank gift. The possibility of this makes her feel very scared. After feeling this way, she begins to pray that she doesn't get an f rank gift. Over and over again, her prayer blurts out of her mouth in hopes that she avoids this impending disgrace of getting an f rank gift. Anything but an f rank gift, which would make her a subject of scorn and laughter to he Su and everyone around her. While praying, she opens her eyes to find herself in the gift room. On the outside, and five hours to say awakening, her uncle Jihan had already made provisions for some security personnel. On arrival, he seeks to know if she is doing all right, and they assure him that she is being protected by the security. On hearing this, he charges them to ensure that no outsider gets into the building or close to her. When he said outsiders, he specifically was referring to reporters. In response, they assured him that measures have been put in place to stop even school personnel from going in since the government is paying extra attention to the situation. While we wonder how Jihan was able to get the government involved in this, he had been on a call with the government official, manager Park Yonsik, due to a problem that arose from the Sword Palace donation. The manager had sought to know if the next night was when Sei Ah would be awakening as a player. When Jihan confirms this, manager Park realizes that someone might trespass and get into the awakening room to disrupt this process. To stop this from happening, he asks to be allowed to request for some extra security in the building. On hearing this, Jihan is thrilled and pleased that manager Park has got a good grasp of their current situation. The fact that the government provided security to ensure C. Isle's safety is really pleasing for him, and he is happy to receive help. All this time, while he recounted the events of yesterday that led to securing the security personnel, he was being led to the gift room where Say Ah Awakening was happening. The security personnel informs him that some chairs have been prepared inside, and he just has to take a seat and wait. With this, he is pleased at how well they have done their jobs and thanks them, promising to see them after 12 p.m. when all this is over. In response, they ask that he lets them know if he needs anything while waiting. 
After that, they go back to their post, leaving him behind. While seated, Jihan cannot stop thinking about the worst-case scenario. He co tinges to worry about his niece. After a while, he comes to the conclusion that he shouldn't worry too much and focus. Most especially since he would be by her side to protect her if anything goes wrong. Instead, he only hopes that whatever happens, the mirror he had brought as a gift for her, would bring great comfort to her. Five minutes to say I'll awakening, he so arrives with one of her lackeys and is surprised to see Jihan here. She wonders why they have been seeing each other pretty often. Looking closely at her, Jihan recognizes her as one whom Seiya had introduced as her friend. Apparently, Seiya hadn't told him about what she said about her and how he so hates her so much. Meanwhile, looking at her lack eye, Jihan wonders if he is a reporter. He's, however, less bothered about this and more bothered about how they managed to get in with the security personnel placed at the entrance to block anyone from coming in. On hearing this, he so laughs at how stupid he is. She reminds him about how much media companies have connections that can help them do things like this so easily. After that, she reveals that she got help from someone she knows. With this answer, Jihan realizes that she is just bluffing and has secretly sneaked in. She feels insulted that he would think this way. However, she reveals that she had simply come in because she had something to do in school. This something she had to do happened to be an interview with Seiya, who clearly had told her over and over again that she didn't want to be interviewed. At this point, Jihan regards all she says as complete rubbish. He urges her to leave since Seiya would be going straight home after her awakening. With this, he makes his first and last warning to her. On hearing how serious he sounds, he so's lackey gets scared. He wonders if it's okay to remain here since they would probably get in trouble if they stay and are forced to go up against Jihan. He so, on the other hand, doesn't seem to care about anything Jihan has to say. She remains insistent on carrying out the interview, no matter what. With this response, Jihan gets angry and reveals that he would not just stand by and watch this happen. Since Jihan is clearly stronger than her, he so wonders what her next line of action would be. This was just a show to buy her powerful level 50 warrior sometime and distract Jihan, who is just in level 27, enough to get him attacked from behind. At this moment, Seiya completes her awakening and is gifted with a late bloomer gift rank F. On seeing this, Seiya is utterly disappointed. She had prayed and hoped for a miracle, but with this, she believes that it is all over for her. This happened to be the same for her uncle, whose head just got smashed from behind by the powerful level 50 warrior. On getting it, Jihan loses his balance and is about to crash to the ground. While he falls, the level 50 warrior, who is weirdly obsessed with Seiya, reveals that he will do his best to take care of Seiya. He uses the collective pronoun R, making it seem like they are one big family. This annoys Jihan to the bones, and he wonders how the warrior would dare say that with that filthy mouth of his. Angered by this, Jihan resists falling. Seeing him endure this, the warrior is thrilled. This makes him realize that Jihan is more powerful than he looks. His thoughts are however halted by Jihan's swift response to the attack as he tries to punch the asshole. Unfortunately, he realizes that his opponent has stone skin, making it hard for him to land any good punches. Instead, the warrior tries to use this as an advantage and begins to attack Jihan repeatedly. Watching this, Hiso is so confident that her warrior would win the fight. Meanwhile, the warrior gets more and more pumped to beat the hell out of Jihan. He is angry that people would refer to Jihan as the rising star and even go on to praise him without really understanding just how weak he truly is. When Jihan refuses to reply to all he says, he gets angry and goes ahead in an attempt to land a strong blow. However, the reverse happened to be the case. As Jihan got really tired and pissed off at the warrior's constant nagging, he gives him a clear-out uppercut as a souvenir in hopes that this would shut him up permanently. This shocks the hell out of he so and her lackey who are left dumbfounded at the sight of this. With the warrior still in the air, Jihan taps into his power and grabs the hair of the warrior with an extended magical hand. This shocks the warrior who wonders how he is able to do this. In response, Jihan calls it a vulgar stunt and reveals that he is doing this just because he can. He is determined to make sure the warrior is unable to do something bad again and pulls him hard by the hair, slamming his body to the ground. On seeing this, Hiso's lackey is scared beyond redemption and runs for his life. Hiso, on the other hand, stands still in shock. Meanwhile, Sei is still in the gift room. She is so distraught and begins to cry from how bad she feels about this gift which she had hoped not to get. However, she comes to the realization that crying won't solve anything, so she gets up to leave since her uncle, Jihan, will be waiting for her outside. Looking at her stats, she wonders what she would do from now on. Most especially since she believes that as a player with an F-grade gift, all she can do is tremble in fear in bronze rank. Furthermore, she finds the description of her gift, referring to her as a late bloomer, pretty ridiculous. Even after she prayed a lot, she is disappointed that she still ended up with such a rank, making her feel like an idiot. At this moment, she opens the door to the gift room, 
only to find her uncle just after he had torn the hair off of the now bald-headed warrior. On seeing this, she seeks to know what is going on, but he tells her that the warrior deserves it. Meanwhile, Hiso is so angry that Jihan did this to the man. She once again resorts to reminding him of who her grandfather is, blurting that he is the chairman of Taiwan News, but Jihan couldn't care less. He shoots some lasers at her to shut her up. Then he informs her that he doesn't care if her family runs a big press company, threatening to mess with them if she continues ranting. Now frustrated, he so seeks to know if he thinks he can end her family so easily. She threatens him with the fact that they can make fake news which would portray their family as the most disgusting family in the world, making them so disgusting that anyone who runs into them would feel sick. Since she believes that people don't care about the truth, it would be easy to make this happen, most especially since say our father. The Sword King had made public opinion about her family pretty bad. Not bothered a bit by her threats, Jihan urges her to go ahead. He is confident that they will be able to handle whatever he so, and her family throat them. However, before this happens, he intends to make her pay the price for committing such an atrocity. To do this, he prepares a flame of fire. Seeing this, he so gets scared once again. She commands him not to mess with her and refers to him as a coward, who would not be able to do anything if not for Battle.net and Yuen Cell. To prove to her that he can do anything he wants on his own, and seeing that she is someone who will never reflect on their bad actions, he surrounds her with flames. With this, he gives her a glimpse of what will happen if she ever messes with them. The pain from this causes her to let out a very loud scream. With this done, Jihan and Sei head to the car. In the car, Sei is worried about her uncle's actions towards Hiso. Although she is pleased that he helped her get revenge on Hiso, she thinks he is too worried. The fact that they have just drawn the battle line against Taewon News makes her worried. However, Jihan urges her not to be worried since he believes nothing will happen. He's confident that they wouldn't make any rash moves all because of the chairman granddaughter. Also, since he is a player who is currently receiving lots of attention from the people, he is optimistic that they wouldn't dare to touch him. Seeing how confident her uncle is, Say Ah is amazed. Just then, he asks her about the gift she got. Reminded of her disappointment, she reveals that it is a late bloomer of grade gift. On hearing this, Jihan is not surprised as he had expected it to be so. On the other hand, Sayer believes she wouldn't be able to succeed as a player with such a gift. To rekindle her hope, Jihan shows her his status window, looking closely at it, she sees that her now powerful uncle was given the same gift as her, an F grade rank. She seeks to know how he got so strong, and he shows her his battle net stats. When she sees the stats of his power and force, she gets very excited. However, he reveals that they are unique stats which most people don't know about the hidden conditions for acquiring them. Like this, he makes her believe that her gift isn't everything, telling her that there are also unique stats that she can acquire. Before revealing this, he hands her the gift he had got for her, a mirror, which he claims will show her the path. After Jihan hands Seiya, the mini mirror gift, the time is taken aback to the times before regression, global rank 2. Jin Yohawa of China is seen and accessed with a special gift of a late bloomer. Jihan was reminiscing about her and her powerful skills. Back then, he couldn't even believe his own eyes that the F-grade gift led Seiya to death and despair. He tells her that such a secret is kept for a long time for no particular reason. Seiya re-examines the mini mirror and finds out that the gift can be upgraded more than the base effect. He asks her if it does not look like a real gift to her. However, he tells her that the item does not work and that he had checked it. It is called Monocles of Hermes, and it is a hidden item that was obtained by repairing the C-grade item called Messenger's Broken Monocle. He uses emergency recovery to retrieve the item. He had made it a day before Seiya's birthday. He faces her and tells her that it is already surprising that its grade is upgradable. However, the base functionality is not too bad since the 100 increase in growth rate would mean that she will train twice the efficiency compared to others. She is delighted and asks him if that isn't an incredible effect then. He replies to her with delight and says that it is a good thing and that with the effect, she should be able to quickly obtain the rare stat that he mentioned to her. He asks her if she does not believe that she can also aim to be a top player. She begins to cry and asks if she got a good gift. He says that it is a good gift while he wonders how hopeful she must have been about the gift. After her father had left her, all he has been doing is yap about how he does not have a daughter and this had made people use Say. Ah is the topic of some cheap gossip. Originally Seiya, I would have wanted to overcome her difficulties not as the daughter abandoned by the Sword King, but as an independent player by the name Yun Seiya. Jihan thought that she must have been really nervous and must have thought that a useless gift would come out. He extends a handkerchief to her and tells her that she did well so far. He also tells her that he knows that it must have been really hard for her so she can cry until she is satisfied. She then refuses and says that she is going to stop crying immediately since she does not even have enough time to laugh either. 
She had already dried up her tears at the time, as she affirms that she thinks that Jihan is mystical, and it is as if he knows about the future. He then chuckled and said that one can just say that he is lucky. She relaxes and states that she feels hungry now that it looks like her nerves are finally settled. Jihan gets up immediately and offers to cook for her. She is surprised and asks to know why he agreed to cook at such a late hour. He then reminds her that he had once made a promise to her that he will cook something delicious for her the next time she ever feels hungry. He said he had prepared a lot for her birthday feast while she watched with surprise and keen interest. She then smiles and says okay. Meanwhile, in Hisu's house, she screams in a hilarious manner only to announce that Jihan had burnt everything including her hair and eyebrows. She says how she is supposed to explain to her parents when one of her attendants walks in. He announces his entrance as she gets more infuriated. She insults him and asks if does not know how to knock. He then tells her that he had brought the CCTV recordings according to her request. She shouts at him and tells him that she understands so he can leave. Hisu says that she cannot just back down like that, and she must find something to ruin him at all cost. She then laughs for a while and mentions Seiya. She knew that using CA was a good way to hurt him. She had captured her sad teary face and will now publish an article with it. She further states that it seems like she got an F grade and she wonders how she was able to come up with such a ruinable face. Meanwhile, Jihan is already aware of her plans but he has decided to ignore her because she was ignorant and she will soon learn. However, there was a light guy somewhere admiring Jihan. He seemed like a light guy who had been long forgotten and has been heartbroken. He had always wanted to serve Jihan and remove every obstruction from his way. He would even give his life for Jihan, but it is heartbreaking to note that he will be employed as a mere manager to Jihan. This breaks his heart deeply. He begins to destroy things out of frustration and screams out for Jihan to read his direct messages. However, Jihan was somewhere playing games. He'd even completed his quest in the game and had come first place which happens to be a recorded success. He had reached the top 10, which would now determine a lot of things for him. However, he finds out that to attain a very powerful stage, he had to go head-to-head -head with a very powerful player whom he had never won in history. He knew that things were getting bad, but still believes that anything can happen. He questions if he is going to lose the game, since he had never won against Baron. He knew he was still going to meet with Baron, but he never expected it to be so soon. Later on, Song Jihan is seen performing a little magical trick. The decisive factor for Jihan to get within the top 100 happens to be the unique stat force. However, while magical power is a great unique stat, it is also nothing more than strength, stamina, and speed together before unlocking the nameless divine arts. It happens that it cannot match up to force, which is a power that transcends reality, such as absolute territory, mana reinforcement, and telekinesis. Irrespective of this, there are different weight classes. The power of the force Baron used was on another level entirely. Force is a stat in proportion to mana and divine power. Baron has been born with great mana, so his force is at least double the force of Jihan's. Even if Jihan has precise control, it still amounts to nothing in the presence of absolute power. Baron had reached first in ranking with just his power alone. Jihan is exercising and thinks aloud to himself that Baron was not keeping his first place because of pure luck. He had been famous for his diamond rank, mana ever since he was a bronze, and fighting him head-on will be an act of suicide. He immediately sits down and retires from the exercise with the intention of unlocking the nameless divine arts. He learns about five most dangerous android apps. He is shocked to see some personnels and cannot believe what he had seen. He come across Baron. He had heard that Baron tried to look more mature once he became a guildmaster. And he had really changed so much. Suddenly his phone rings out loudly, and it happens to be Li Haiyan. He picks it up but she says something he does not understand, so it leaves him hanging while she eventually gets off the call without telling him beforehand. Meanwhile in her office which is also referred to as the Divergent Guild AAT, her worker, Guy walks in a few minutes later and says he had come to escort her to the next meeting location. She is surprised to find out that it is already time as she gets ready and suddenly remembers something. She tells him to give her five minutes. He is worried so he asks if anything is wrong. Li Haiyan finally states that she had called Jahan earlier for some pics. Gaon gets angry and asks her if she is not ashamed. She quickly stops him from nagging her and states that she is already losing her mind and she will appreciate it if he can be nicer. He pauses and inquires about what Jihan had said. She answers him and states that there is a viral news already and that Jihan is attending the Global Top 100 this time. He is shocked as he tells her that he also heard that the US Baron is also attending. She tells him that she had been compelled to bet on him winning first place. He says that his confidence is high and that is a good one. Jihan had never defeated Baron and it is only strange for him to come out with such boldness. It might be a good thing to bet on him, but it is also very risky because of how rated Baron happens to be in the game. However, they are dealing with Baron, 
And how is Jahan sure that he will ever win against Baron? It is quite hard to win against someone who flies around raining down attacks. Baron is powerful, and there is no doubt that he will most likely win against Jahan. Jihan, on the other hand, happens to be training seriously. And he is also a trusted player because of all his successful exploits, except that he had been unable to defeat Baron. Jihan happens to be determined and is working towards beating him in the next meeting. However, she thinks differently and asks if she should bet on Baron instead of Jihan as he appears to be a safe choice compared to Jihan who had never won against him. She believes that betting on Jihan would only waste her resources or put her at risk. She said that she was a bit shaken because he got the betting results too accurately for the Japan-Korea match. Having said this, Gaon also begins to feel like he should bet on Baron. Baron apparently had higher chances of winning, which is because he had always won against Jihan and no other player has been able to break his record, not even Jihan with how powerful and rated he is. However, for some reasons, Gaon wanted to disagree. He's in deep thoughts as she jolts him into reality, asking if his battle net scores are good. She also says that he seems to be working too hard recently. He is lost in thought. Meanwhile, Jihan is improving tremendously with his skills. He has fulfilled all his conditions successfully as his martial power increases from 1 to 30, and then his wanderer's eye is reacting effectively. His constellation is checked, and it appears that he has the ability to detect people through his traces. There is only darkness in Jihan's eyes, and he cannot see anything. However, he can definitely feel it. It happens to be the same feeling as the previous times. The wandering martial god looks upon him, after which he is acknowledged as the successor. Jihan had received a lot of help from him even in his past life. He also receives a new skill called Nameless Divine Arts. Normally, a constellation's sponsorship has great consequences, but the Wandering Martial God did not ask for anything else. The martial arts techniques Three Talents Martial Devotion had been learnt, alongside the flashing sky thunder steps. Jihan greedily seeks to reach 30 in martial power, which makes the Wandering Martial God frown at him. The connection gets cut off immediately. It happens that he is displeased that Jahan's three Dantians are already open. He is notified that the wandering martial god is wary of him because his three Dantians are open. Jihan is shocked that someone who is a divine being can be wary of him because of such a reason. He tries to cancel martial arts technique succession. He breaks down as the wandering martial god takes back his traces. It appears that there is a disaster. It is sad that his gift had vanished with the top 100 promotional round just ahead of him. He had lost his most important aspect. It might get harder for him to fight Baron even after he had cajoled people to place a bet on him. He had caused the wandering martial god to be wary of him, and now the connection has been cut off and it appears that he had lost everything. It gets more difficult and complex to face Baron. Later on, CA finishes from school, and when she sees Jihan in the car, she teases him. After that, she gets into the car and greets Jihan and he replies to her greetings just before starting the car for them to leave. While in the car, Jihan starts a conversation with CA, and he asks her if she feels like a burden has been lifted off her shoulders and she replies that she feels refreshed completely after awakening. Sia decides to drop out of the academy because she knows that the general notion is that students attend the academy to get their own gifts and they all drop out of the academy after awakening. Sia proceeds to post on her social media platform that she needs advice from her friends on what to do after awakening as she is stuck between dropping out and continuing the academy after her breakthrough. She adds that she got a C-rank gift and someone replied to her telling her that she would need to drop out because if she continues with the academy, her friends are going to sign contracts with guilds and get training, which would make them ahead of her in life. Later, Sia decided that she would take her training from Jahan, who agrees and continues to train her so as to give less reasons for her to continue the academy. While driving, Jahan begins to think that he is glad that Sia would not encounter any problems again in the future, as she also has nothing to worry about. But he adds that he is the biggest problem they would both have. He remembers that the following day is the top 100 position games, and he has nothing to do about it as he has not only lost the Wanderer's Eyes, but he has also failed completely to inherit the Nameless Divine Arts. He recollects how the system has shown him that his skill rank is ranked at S level, and he has a skill that is passed down through the fragments. In his status bar, the system shows Jihan that he can remodel the three Divine Secrets to fit him or he should find the real name of the Nameless Divine Arts, and the two reasons are the only ways he can awaken to the Nameless Divine Arts. Jihan continued to wonder that the Nameless Divine Arts is only ranked S instead of SS, but it is only two skills as well. Sia notices that Jihan is not in a good mood and she asks him if it is because of the top 100 promotion round that is coming up the following day, and he admits that it is the competition that is bothering him. Jihan begins to think that he is really bothered about his twisted future, but Sia distracts him by assuring him that she believes he is going to win as he has always managed to find a solution amidst hard problems. She proceeds to tell him that she is not worried as she is so sure of him that he would come back home. 
to tell her the good news that he has won the competition again. Sia becomes excited, and she tells him that she might consider betting on him getting the first place in the competition. But Jihan tells her that she should not think about betting because she would get into a lot of trouble if she does. Sia reminds Jihan that he streamed a betting game live as he can bet, but she does not have the permission to bet. But Jihan tells her that she is too young for betting. Then C tells Jihan that it is a ridiculous idea, but she is not interested in betting at all. As Jihan is about to reply to C, he suddenly feels a huge surge of electricity in his left eye, but he decides to act as if he is okay so as not to make C.A. suspicious. Later that night, Jihan sits alone, and he begins to wonder why his left eye feels weird, and he thinks out loud that he is feeling strange as he has never experienced such sensation before, and he immediately decides that he has to get rid of the pain urgently. In order to get rid of the pain, he decides to slowly approach the eye by using force to get its precise location, but as he tries to use his powers, the pain in the eye becomes much, and he gets hurt. Jihan begins to wonder if his eye looks okay, but the system gives him a notification that he has eliminated the traces of the wandering martial god and because of that, he is completely free from the constellation's domination. On seeing this, Jihan becomes shocked and confused as he does not know what the notification meant, but while in his confused state, the system brings up another notification that he can now receive sponsorship from another constellation. Jihan begins to wonder that he could not receive any sponsorship before, and he was not aware of that, but he also adds that the status window does not lie, and that means that the martial god was in his way the whole time. Jihan becomes happy that he has conquered the martial god who he thought was like the giving tree, but was actually more like a parasite. The system tells Jihan that the martial god is more weary of him and Jihan becomes shocked at that, as he asks the system what it meant by that. But the system tells him that the wandering martial god has suddenly vanished. Jihan begins to wonder what has happened with the martial god as he's weary of bronze to the extent that he has run away. Jihan adds that he is supposed to be the god of martial arts, and is still acting like a coward. Then Jihan begins to talk out loud that he is in his second round of life, and he still has a lot of questions that has no answers yet, and as he is not able to use the wandering martial god's power, he would have to use the opportunity to look for another constellation. Jihan stands up, and he checks his status bar, and tells himself that he has a new opportunity at the perfect timing, but the system tells Jihan that he has a new quest to find the Shadow Queen seated in the audience of the Colosseum map and provoke her. The system adds that his reward points is 50,000 achievement points, but Jihan thinks out loud that if he says the Shadow Queen will sponsor him, he would not be sure of what will happen at the top 100 position competition the following morning. Jihan immediately decides that he needs to compensate for the lack of the martial god, but he suddenly remembers that he has something other players do not possess. The following morning, as the bronze top 100 promotion round is about to begin, the system lays down the rules by telling them that the last man standing is the winner. Jahan tells himself that he does not have the time to fight all of them one by one, but he suddenly sees that they are all coming to him at the same time. The game starts, and the participants begin to attack Jihan, and he also fights them by using his powers. While fighting one of the participants, the man sees that Jihan has dropped his weapon, and he immediately sees the opportunity to attack Jihan by asking him why he is making it easy to be attacked. The man tries to punch Jihan, but he immediately grabs him and defeats him. Jihan begins to think that the other participants are weak, compared to Baron and he would make sure he does not waste his energy on them. But while Jihan is still thinking about his approach to the fight, he suddenly sees a sharp sword aimed at his head. He becomes shocked and when he checks who the owner of the sword is, he realizes that it is Lim Gaeong. Jihan sees this, and as shocked as he is, he also wonders what Lim is doing in the competition. Jihan immediately remembers the story of how the Space League began, and they started getting used to the fact that dying in the game means dying in real life, but Japan's representative player in the final was the Sword King Ito Ryuhi. At that time, no one in Korea could put up a fair fight with I2, because they were all afraid of death, but the only person who was against the Sword King as the representative of Korea was the Sword King's successor candidate, who is also called the Plum Blossom Sword, Lim Gaeyong. Jihan begins to wonder why she is in the tournament, as she was never in the top 100. Lim and Jihan begin to fight, and Jihan tries to avoid all of her attacks as he continues to wonder if the future has changed. While fighting, Jihan sees that Lim is getting an upper hand in their brawl, and he immediately uses his power to summon his weapon. And he also tells himself that the future did not change. During the fight, Jihan tries his best to defeat Lim once and for all, but when he sees that she is taking all of his attacks and also attacking him back, he then asks himself if she was always strong, but he answers himself and says that she has grown as she is different from the dimension he saw her the last time. Jihan begins to analyze all of Lim's movement, and he tells himself that she has decreased all of her unnecessary movements, and all of her attacks are heavy which makes her footsteps lighter. 
As they continue to fight, Jahan looks into Lin's eyes and he wonders what had happened to her that time. He did not see her. Meanwhile, Lim also remembers the conversation she had with a lady a few months back. She remembers that the lady asked her how her battle net grades are, and she immediately replies to the lady that she just got into the top 100 bronze competition, and the lady becomes surprised as she asks Lim if she is already in level 25, then Lim confirms it and tells her that she just got to the level. And continues to tell the lady that she has been getting the first place in the competition until she met Jihan who immediately got the position of the winner upon his arrival in the competition. The lady becomes excited for a while, and Lim suddenly tells her that she wants a favor from her, but when the lady asks what Lim wants, Lim tells her that she wants new equipment. The lady asks Lim why she is requesting for such and Lim explains further that she does not want to blame her equipment. But she noticed that the sword is too heavy for her. Lim adds that she did not want to say anything about it before, because the sword is a precious sword that was given to her by the lady as a gift, but she cannot handle the weight of the sword. The lady tells Lim to be calm, as she should not worry about the sword as she would get it changed for her, because the sword has been preventing her from doing well, and she is trying to hide it all under the excuse of it being a precious gift. The lady assures Lim that she would get her another sword. Even if it means for her to use her personal money, she would not hesitate to do so. And she also adds that Lim should throw the weapon away. But Lim asks her if she had not thrown all of her belongings away due to gambling. The lady leaves, but on her way out, she tells Lim that she should make sure to show everyone all she has got for the promotion round. Lim begins to wonder how the lady knew that she was comparing herself to Jihan all along because she said that she can win Jihan if she puts her mind to it as she has always been the rising star of the Bronze League in Korea, but she only needs to prove herself to the others. Lim continued to fight with Jihan and she thinks to herself that she doesn't think she would be able to win against Jihan even after the motivation she got from the lady. Jihan sees the way Lim is moving, and he thinks out loud that Lim knows she cannot win against him. But he also wonders why she is trying so hard as she could have survived for a long time if she had fought with the other players that are visibly weaker than her. While Jihan is still thinking about how he is fighting with Lim, Lim suddenly yells out loud telling him that she knows better than anyone that she cannot win against Jihan as she is the. She adds that she would never be able to win against him, but if she gives up, it would be over for her. Before her final strike, Lim tells Jihan that if she is not able to surpass him, she would at least try her best to keep up with him. Jihan immediately notices the kind of person. Lim is as she is the kind of person that would keep fighting to improve despite knowing that she cannot win against her rival, but he also wonders as he remembers that Lim was killed by the Sword King in his past life, but in his current one, she is in the top 100 Bronze League. Jihan also adds that he is curious on how his regression would affect the future, but the only thing he needs is to have Lim on his side. Lim suddenly uses her secret technique, which is the Plum Blossom Hurricane, but as she uses it against Jihan, he tells her that it is not synergistic with a spear and the only skill perfect. For such situation is the three Calamity Marshals devotion skill which would eventually cause a thousand rampage effect. If you like this recap do let me know in the comments. And obviously leave your likes too. Do not forget to share with your friends and subscribe. Above all, activate your notification bell so you don't miss the next recap when it drops. Until next time, do take care and stay safe. A USA bronze player in the third rank named Clark screams at the top of his voice to another player, telling him that they have met again. However, the other player whose name is Baron Williams is also from the USA and he is America's first supporter and mage. Baron looks at the other players and the system tells them that the game would go on until there is only one person standing, but Clark faces Baron and tells him that the system is a mess as Baron is just a coward who has always buffed others from the back and has become the world's top ranked player. Baron smiles and yawns as he tells Clark and the other players that he would show them that he is different from them. And he also tells them that they all came to him like ants but all they are doing is to bore him with their talks. The players become surprised as Baron insults them, but he tells them again that they should stop chatting and they should all attack him at once as he cannot wait to defeat them. The system immediately tells Baron that he should prove that he is the strongest then Baron suddenly begins to use his powers, and he yells at the other players that he would make sure he burns them to ashes which is because he is very obsessed with fighting. Clark and the other players begin to attack Baron and as Clark jumps to land on Baron, Baron immediately uses his powers to strike him on his bald head, which also affects the other players trying to attack him. One of the players sees this, and immediately tells the others that they should make sure they take Marin down before he kills Clark. But Baron looks back at them, and he laughs at the other players as he tells them that they may not be able to kill him because they are all looking like parasites to him. As a result of his arrogance, Baron uses his powers to defeat Clark and the other players and he laughs at them as he tells them to die because they are all inferior to him. After defeating the other players, 
Baron suddenly notices Jihan who is fighting with other players, then he immediately walks up to Jihan and calls his attention. Jihan looks at Baron and Baron asks him if he is Jihan which means a thief in his language, but Jihan becomes confused but he smiles and corrects Baron in which he is not sure if he intentionally called him that. Jihan then tells Baron that Jihan in their language does not have a good meaning but Baron immediately apologizes and tells Jihan that he is sorry as he does not really know the languages of the third world countries very well. While Baron covers his face in shame to laugh at himself, he intentionally calls Jihan a thief again and immediately uses his powers against him, but unknown to him, Jihan is prepared for any attack from him. Baron sees how fast and agile Jihan is and he tells Jihan that he knew all along that Jihan is a good warrior, but Jihan replies that he knows he is good as well. Baron begins to float midair and he tries to use his powers to defeat Jihan. But Jihan also takes his spear and jumps to go and meet Baron. But Baron turns away so as to avoid any form of attack from Jihan. Baron begins to laugh and he yells at Jihan as he asks why he would dare to come up to where he is in order to attack him because he is nothing but an insect to him. Baron launches an attack towards Jihan. But Jihan bends down and uses his own powers to protect himself from Baron. Baron proceeds to make a huge impact with his powers which calls the attention of the audience and the other players. But Baron does not care as he is focused on killing Jihan. Baron also adds that his powers would give Jihan and the rest of the players the death they all deserve because they are not meant to be competing against him. As Baron launches the attack in the stadium, it affects the players except Jihan who is protected by his powers, which also makes it easy for Jihan to kill the other players. And as he kills them, the system begins to calculate the amount of kills he has as he has entered his thousand rampage mode. While killing the other players, Jihan tells Baron that he is grateful to him as he has made it easy for him to be able to get more points which makes him the top player on the rank chart as he has a total number of 20 kills. Jihan also adds that he is already in first place but Baron becomes shocked and he begins to wonder how Jihan had survived his huge attack of his flames combined with his force which is supposed to make him burn till he dies. As Baron continues to wonder, he also notices that the flames are not touching Jihan and immediately, he realizes that Jihan may also be able to use force like him. And when he asks Jihan, Jihan confirms his use of force by giving Baron an affirming look. Baron becomes confused and he tells Jihan that it is not possible because he is supposed to be the only one who is able to use force because he possesses two status windows. He also proceeds to accuse Jihan of playing a trick on him, and Jihan replies that he did not use any trick as the use of force is not exclusive to Baron alone and after he got the ability to use force, he realizes how unskilled Baron is. On hearing this, Baron becomes furious and he uses his strength to summon his powers to create a huge effect. Then he tells Jihan that he is pretending and he is also using the opportunity to mock him as well. Baron adds that he would make sure he burns Jihan alive without remaining any ashes of him. But Jihan replies that he would never let that happen as he has not used all of his powers in the competition. Jihan immediately brings out a crystal fragment but he immediately recounts how he has checked his status bar the previous night, and in order for him to make up for the lack of the martial god abilities, he found the crystal fragment which only has one use, and it gives the user a divine blessing which could only be used in bronze or silver zones. Jihan uses the crystal fragment, and the system tells him that the crystal fragment has been activated, then he yells at Baron, that he has been waiting for the moment where he would have chances to meet Baron in a duel in order to defeat him. The system also tells Baron that Jihan's stats have increased by 50%, but Baron continues to challenge Jihan as he tells him that they should go all out to see who would win and Jihan also tells Baron that he would make sure he destroys him. Jihan remembers Baron's story, and he recounts that Baron used to be a coward who was shy and not as muscular or tall as the other players in his group. He was also a player who was very afraid of other players, and the players refer to him as a waste of a gift as he is unable to do anything good apart from hiding in the rear during battles. Baron has two status windows and two classes which would have been of great advantage for him to dominate the battle net if he had utilized it, but Baron chose the supporter and the mage rank, so as to stay clear of danger when in a battle because the rank he chose gave him that opportunity to always be at the rear of any battle. Suddenly Baron changed when he earned force and he began to dominate the field with the help of the mana he possessed. A lot of players who were regarded as rising stars fell under the feet of Baron and he became arrogant because of what the players who had fought with him said. The players reported that Baron has two types of disasters in the palm of his hands and they describe his two deadly attacks as disasters because no one makes it alive after being hit by those powers. The first one is called the fire wave which allows him to sweep through his enemies at once with a tsunami of flames and as a result of this all of his enemies die after being hit and that is what made him angry that Jihan is not dead after being hit by the fire wave. Baron begins to think of what to do and he immediately remembers that he has not used his second skill to attack Jihan. But Jihan uses his powers and with the help of the crystal fragment, 
He's able to use one stabbing attack to clear the tsunami of flames caused by Baron, so that he would be able to see Baron when he wants to launch his attack on him. Baron sees this and he becomes surprised and he wonders how Jihan is able to clear out his tsunami of flames, and Jihan tells him that he knows that Baron is a coward, and he also knows that he is only looking strong on the outside. But he is weak inside. Jihan jumps after telling Baron that he is nothing, and when he tries to use his spear to pierce Baron's chest, he first uses his powers to hit Baron while he tells him that he is too busy trying to hide his lack of skills from the worlds instead of making up for them and training harder. He adds that Baron is useless, and weak as he has no precision over his life, then he immediately tries to pierce his spear into Baron's chest and Baron immediately dodges it and Jihan suddenly knocks him down. Jihan stands up after bringing Baron to the ground, but Baron becomes weak and he tells Jihan that he is talking as if he knows everything about him. But Jihan tells him that he is similar to someone he knows who also has the same attributes as he does. Jihan also tells Baron that no matter how much he pretends to be strong and confident, he cannot hide the feeling of inferiority and guilty conscience, which is already dogged deep in his heart. Jihan adds that all of Baron's efforts to build his muscles and change his appearance are all to cope in the wicked world of players, and there is no point of him being the best if he cannot change his core but Baron replies Jihan and tells him that he does not like the way he is talking to him it's with such arrogance but Jihan smiles and tells him that he is supposed to have said that to him when they started fighting. Jihan begins to wonder if Baron would change after learning his lessons, but he immediately tells Baron that they have had enough conversation and they have to end the fight already. Jihan takes his spear and aims for Baron's chest, but Baron suddenly attacks Jihan with his second power which is the lightning skill. The lightning skill is unlike the fire wave, which is a wide range mana attack, as it is a high level skill that concentrates the mana to pierce the opponent. The lightning skill is the best weapon for Baron as it puts more emphasis on the amount of power he has rather than precise control. Baron sees that Jihan has been hit, and he immediately begins to float, and he tells Jihan that he does not know how he is able to take a full force of his two disasters and still survive but he remembers that while he attacked Jihan, he used his spear to block the attack so as to avoid lethal injuries for himself. Baron also commends Jihan that he has a fast reaction time, but he is sure that he was not able to block the attack perfectly because he was able to block it the first time. He knows he would not escape the second time. After this, Baron immediately uses the lightning on Jihan again, and he yells at Jihan that he would be sure to use all of his might so as to defeat him. The other players who have gone away from the field watch as Baron is trying to launch another attack on Jihan, and they begin to feel pity for Jihan because they all conclude that he would not be able to block the attack for the second time. Jihan looks around him and he sees the look on people's faces, as they have all concluded that he would not be able to survive the second attack from Baron. But while everyone's mind has been made up, Jihan knows that he would be able to win and defeat Baron, not because not because of anything but because he knows that the Shadow Queen is watching him. Jihan stands very well as he maintains his posture and grip of his spear. Then he sets his spear to aim at Baron who is getting ready to use his lightning power. The two players immediately let go of the power and the spear at the same time which makes Jihan's spear meet the lightning skill, in the middle and Jihan smiles as he knows that the arrow would vanish after using it five times, but he is sure if his actions as the arrow was not heading towards Baron, but he had aimed the phoenix arrow at the Colosseum's barrier. The incident makes it the first time in history that the Colosseum's barrier was shattered due to the duel between Baron and Jihan. Just then, the system announces Jihan as South Korea's rising star who is defeating Baron who is USA's biggest player. The whole stadium is in shock as news spreads that Jihan is defeating the all-powerful and arrogant Baron. Lee Ga Young, who has been watching the live stream on her phone, becomes angry as she sees that Jihan is winning against Baron whom she had placed all of her money on. Ga Young begins to wonder why Jihan is so good at fighting, and she also rants that it does not make any sense to her that Jihan is winning against Baron because she would lose all of her money if he is declared the winner. Lim comes in and she sees Ga Young talking to herself in an angry manner as she laments that she would lose the money she had earned in the past months because of Jihan. Lim calls Ge Young's attention as she asks Ge Young if she did not think that she was going to win against Jihan, but as Ge Young notices that Lim is in the room with her, she becomes confused at the question Lim asks her. Lim continues as she tells Ge Young that she was expecting to lose the fight between her and Jihan, but she is sad for the outcome as well. Ge Young replies to Lim that she should not be sad as she knew she had already lost the fight immediately. The fight started, and Lim should have made it further in the game, if she wanted her to pay attention to her on the battleground. Lim keeps quiet and Gay Young asks her why she is in a good mood even after losing the fight to Jihan whom she wanted to defeat so badly. But Lim replies her that she feels like a weight has been lifted off of her shoulders as she was able to learn from the fight that she is improving, and she has also decided that she would continue to improve. Gay Young becomes happy for Lim as she tells her that she would make sure she cheers her on, 
But while Lim thanks Gae Young for her support, Gae Young becomes distracted as she focuses her attention back on her phone, only for her to see that it has been announced that something unbelievable is happening in the stadium. Gae Young begins to lament about her money and Lim asks her if she is still gambling. But Gae Young ignores her question and faces her phone where she suddenly sees a news that is shocking to her. Meanwhile, in the stadium, Baron becomes surprised as Jihan's attack did not hit him. Then he realizes that Jihan did not aim his spear at him. The system announces that Jihan has destroyed the barrier in the process of him attacking Baron, and while everyone is thinking about what Jihan has done, the spear hits the Shadow Queen and goes back to meet Jihan who smiles at the Shadow Queen and tells her that it has been a long time since they say each other. The Shadow Queen begins to emit a dark aura, then she immediately vanishes and the people begin to wonder what is going on in the stadium. Amidst all of these, the system begins to show an error message to show that the signal is bad in the stadium. Gae Young, on the other hand, also sees that she could not get the live feed from her phone, and this makes her disappointed and angry as she believes that her money is gone. In the stadium, everything gets dark, and Jihan begins to look for the Shadow Queen, and he also notices that the air is cold and heavy as he is unable to breathe well, but he is aware that the Shadow Queen is looking at him. Jihan begins to wonder why he has not gotten any notification, because he is supposed to get one so as to defeat the Shadow Queen, and suddenly the system brings up a notification that he has an epic quest to find the Shadow Queen, who is seated somewhere in the audience of the Colosseum and provoke. Here, Jihan becomes excited at the quest, and he immediately prepares himself for his new task. But he immediately uses the Path of the Immortal Sage ability with his spear, so as to find the Shadow Queen in the stadium. When Jihan sees the Shadow Queen, he attacks her with a sword key, but the Shadow Queen absorbs it, but Jihan continues to attack the Shadow Queen, but he soon realizes that his attacks are having no effect on her. The Shadow Queen suddenly releases a lot of Shadow Beings and the Beings begin to fight with the crowd. But when Jihan hits one of the Shadow Beings, he realizes that they are just Shadows. But the other fighters continue to try to defeat the Shadow Beings but they are unable to do so as the Beings attack them. The other players begin to wonder why there are Shadow Beings. But as the Shadow Beings attack them, Jihan finds a way to fight with the Beings using his spear. A few minutes later, Jihan realizes that his attacks are not working on the Shadow Beings but he resorts to using his divine powers since physical attacks are not working on the Shadow Queen and her beings. Jihan attacks the Shadow Queen with his powers and he notices that there was no huge damage on her, but it made some of the Shadow to get erased. Jihan smiles as he discovers that shadows would normally disappear when exposed to light then he stands well. And after thinking about what he would do to defeat the Shadow Queen, he remembers his previous life and how he had expelled lightning around himself when he was not proficient with the flashing sky thunder steps. Jihan immediately surrounds himself with lightning, and he notices that the shadow beings are unable to move closer to him because of the lightning around him. Jihan assures himself that his battle with the Shadow Queen would be easier than he had expected, but while he thinks of what to do next, he sees a huge shadow floating above him, then he immediately recognizes the huge shadow as the Shadow Queen herself. The Shadow Queen wields a huge sword using her shadows, and as she tries to pierce through Jihan's chest with her sword, Jihan looks up and he asks the Shadow Queen if she is trying to tease him. The Battle Net Connection Chair is not just a seat, it's a modern marvel that offers utmost comfort. It's indispensable for participating in Battle Net because it significantly reduces the pain players might experience during the game. Injuries like burns or even losing limbs are unfortunately quite common in Battle Net. Players experience these pains as if they were real, which is why the use of this connection chair is highly recommended. Over time, the connection chair has become more than just an option. It's a necessity. The preferred model can reduce pain by as much as 80%. Most top players opt for a higher-end model that can alleviate pain by up to 90%. This enhancement allows them to engage in the game more daringly as the fear of experiencing pain is virtually eliminated. But what about Song Jihan? At this moment, he's standing serenely in the middle of a battle he's obliged to participate in. He's not using the battle net connection device, but his face shows a confidence that he's in full control of the situation. The reason is straightforward. He always knew that battle net would eventually become reality. Relying on the connection device to minimize pain is just a temporary measure. When the real game named the Bank Cup starts, all those precautions prove futile. He's always fought as if he's fighting for his life, treating it as reality. That's why Jihan doesn't use the connection device. Even when fire burns his skin or when he's struck by a million volt electric shock directly to his heart. Jihan has borne these pains, something beyond the imagination of an ordinary person. Now he finds himself facing a grave danger being sliced in half by a 10 meter long sword. His face clearly shows worry, and with a lost gaze, he mutters a curse. Outside, two other male players are anxiously observing the situation. One asks, what is that? The other answers, 
I'm just as confused about what's going on. What exactly is that? A dark, towering figure with a long sword is continuously attacking Jihan, making him dodge with difficulty. Strangely, it appears to be attacking only Jihan. Baron's recent attack has drawn all eyes on him, making many players jump at the chance to get rid of him once and for all. These villains aren't shy about showing their intentions. Their glares are filled with the intent to kill. Jahan realizes he can't always be on the defensive. So no other option? He takes a deep breath and decides it's the only way forward. With a firm grip on his spear, he unleashes his divine power, causing his eyes to turn a vivid, menacing red. Upon boosting his mana and fire, the spear in his hand erupts into a gigantic, intense flame, relentlessly consuming the dark figure without mercy. Jihan decides to confront all his opponents head-on, while the dark entity gradually gets devoured by the flames and dissipates into smoke. Standing calmly, he raises his spear ignited with flames. He whispers to his opponent, if you wish to drown me in darkness, his razor-sharp gaze throwing a threatening look. Face the ultimate move of the unnamed martial art, the Supreme Sky Martial Technique. The other players can only gape, their eyes wide in astonishment at this spectacular display. At this moment, as Jihan fiercely swings his spear and finishes his sentence, then I'll use a light even stronger to banish your darkness. A storm of fire follows the path of his swing to attack. Jihan shouts the name of his special technique, Mountai Overwhelming Pressure, accompanied by an explosion that makes the already dangerous flames even more terrifying. A spark from the explosion hits the ground, causing debris to scatter all around. Jihan maintains his stance, executing his special move. Magical rings continuously appear and rotate around the tip of his spear. At this moment, he finally lets out a sigh of relief and slowly lifts his head to see the outcome for his opponent. All he sees in front of him is a sea of flames still fiercely burning. Pleased, he wonders to himself, Is that enough, I wonder? Then, he turns to glance behind. What about the other players? He sees them scrambling away like ducks after witnessing the horrifying display, talking amongst themselves as they run. Let's go somewhere else. What on earth was that? Another agrees my grandfather always said that knowing when to retreat is also a way to win. Seeing that the situation around him is calmed down, Jihan turns back towards the sea of flames. At this point, a black mass is slowly starting to gather again. He thinks to himself, so, it's just you left now. The Dark Queen gradually takes shape again, looking as she did before. Her gaze remains unchanged, still firmly fixed on Jihan as her main target. Surrounding him is a mysterious black circle of darkness, clearly her special technique designed to counter Jihan. Frustrated, he exclaims, not this again. I'm really tired, you know? He realizes this will never end as long as the Dark Queen's main body remains intact. Clenching his spear tightly, Jihan is visibly furious, his veins popping out on his arms. He silently vows not to let this drag on any longer. His energy center starts to tremble, and his spear, sensing his anger, vibrates and glows intensely. Now he can perform even more advanced martial arts techniques, such as using the Supreme Sky Martial Technique without needing the unnamed martial art. His entire body suddenly glows a strange yellow, and his inner power keeps rising rapidly. The ground seems to crack under his feet, creating a scene that truly amazes onlookers. Yet, he thinks, of course, with his current level, the advanced techniques won't be perfect. But he can use the power of the Phoenix Arrow. It's an A-grade item made from Phoenix Feathers. Throwing the Phoenix Arrow activates Phoenix Fire, which after being sealed inside vanishes after five uses. Jain decides to use it to compensate for the power he lacks. Since ancient times, thunder and lightning have been associated with the wrath of the heavens, a punishment from an angry god upon humanity. During a time when the world was still shrouded in darkness and chaos, Siren stands tall in the arena, lifting his spear above his head. He utters a single word, light, and suddenly, a lightning bolt from nowhere strikes, gathering atop his spear with terrifying force. This magical power grows, confronting the dark forces, lighting up a corner of the arena with a brilliant golden glow. A warning appears, stating this power exceeds a player's capacity, and the player's life is in danger. Jihan seems unfazed by the warning, shouting, this is the martial art of the Thunder God. Gritting his teeth and twisting his body to the limit, like a bowstring pulled tight, he prepares to launch his spear at his opponent, determined to purge all demons and evil. It's with all his might, Jihan spins and throws the spear at a terrifying speed. Divine Thunder Technique, Lightning Strike. Even though only about 80% of his power was completed, Jihan's face shows clear signs of exhaustion. Initially, the lightning strike was just a technique of many lightning bolts striking down together. However, Jihan's lightning couldn't achieve perfection. It flew but couldn't match the speed of the phoenix arrow and was not perfect. The spear hurtles towards the dark entity, with the sound of the wind whistling sharply non-stop, 
surely everyone thought this was the end for that dark entity. As soon as the spear hits the target, a deafening explosion rings out. Suddenly a witch with long platinum hair, black eyes, and sharp elf-like ears appears. Her eyes sparkle at the sight of the thundering spear heading straight for her. Surprisingly, just as the spear tip is about to pierce the face of the strange witch, it suddenly stops and hangs in midair. The lightning effect also mysteriously fades from the spear. In an instant, it becomes a normal, harmless spear floating in midair, in front of the newly appeared peculiar witch. Clearly, Jihan's recent move wasn't strong enough. It only managed to reveal the face of the Dark Queen but couldn't inflict any damage on her. In a fleeting moment, she thought so but unexpectedly, a small cut, inexplicably accompanied by a tiny spark of lightning, appears on her cheek. Her face is shocked and stunned upon realizing this. Her eyes filled with fear turn towards Jihan reassessing her opponent. He stands opposite her, completely calm, not even bothering to assume a defensive posture. Even though his arm, which launched the lightning spear, is scorched black from the movie's backlash, he slowly lifts his face with a satisfied smile. It's done. The spear slowly floats back to him. He silently thinks he was lucky because the lightning strike move was delayed, only holding off the attack for a few seconds. The Dark Queen gently touches the cut on her face, her expression hard to read, pondering her thoughts. Meanwhile, Jihan is reunited with his spear, surprised that such a move could create such a variable. Now he decides to launch his finishing move, his eyes turning serious and filled with a killer intent. Have I provoked her enough? He wonders, while the Dark Queen cautiously scrutinizes him from a distance. Suddenly, she breaks into a sinister smile. Congratulations, you have completed the task of provoking the Dark Queen. An unexpected notification pops up. Jihan seems a bit surprised and confused by the Dark Queen's attitude at this moment. He can only sigh in frustration. Damn it. Then, a stream of dark energy swiftly heads towards him. Jahan timely jumps to dodge the numerous dark energy streams that strike where he was just leisurely standing moments ago. Before he even lands these dark energy streams change direction, aiming straight for him again. Jihan skillfully wields his spear, sweeping away all the attacks. His right arm scorched black from the backlash of the lightning strike earlier screams in agony. He wonders if he overexerted himself just now, given his current condition, he doubts he can hold on much longer, her attacks grow in number and speed by the moment. While deep in thought, a stream of dark energy suddenly strikes towards him, forcing him to dodge awkwardly. Glancing behind, he realizes that at some point, the Dark Queen has captured the other players as hostages. They are tightly bound by invisible dark energy ropes, appearing to be in great pain and suffering. Jihan wonders why she has only captured them without killing them. What could her plan be? Suddenly he notices something unusual. It turns out, while he was distracted, the dark energy streams had bound his legs to the ground. Now it's too late to react. Jihan can only curse to himself. Damn it, does she want to kill me first? He looks up to scrutinize the Dark Queen standing above, who immediately summons her giant sword, hovering over his head, aiming to strike down. Jihan hastily tries to activate his divine thunder technique, but it seems useless against the dark energy binding his legs. He and the three other players stand immobilized in the middle of the arena, unable to move or do anything else. Worried, he thinks, can I move at all? The giant sword hovers above, ready to plunge down. Jihan realizes the attack has slowed him down, and he needs to find a solution. He taunts his opponent, so you want to kill me slowly and painfully, huh? That's quite a vile preference, he says. But the Dark Queen seems uninterested in his comment, her hand extended in front as she continuously utters incantations in a strange ancient language. Seeing this, Jihan grows anxious, thinking he might lose his top position if this continues. I must eliminate the other players first. The other players seeing Jihan in trouble realize they have a chance to move up in the rankings. They smile with despicable joy. Jihan looks at them with disdain. Look at their faces, thinking I'll be the first to die, he smirks. Even though his entire body is bound, his fingers can still move. He begins to channel his energy into his fingertips, secretly preparing a special technique. The three other players, still not understanding what's happening, stand behind Jihan quite pleased with themselves. One says, I don't know what's going on, but I like this situation. Another agrees, I think so too. The Dark Queen just wants to kill Jahan, that's all. Suddenly, something unexpected happens to all three of them. Their bodies stiffen, shocked by a mysterious and strange sensation. One starts foaming at the mouth, veins bulging prominently on his face and neck, wondering what on earth is happening. Why has my body suddenly become so strange? All they know is that what follows is a series of notifications on the screen player has died, leaving only one player, one out of a hundred. The Dark Queen seems slightly surprised by this rapid turn of events. 
Jihan sports a triumphant smile. Oh no. I accidentally killed all the players. At the same time, a green notification pops up. Congratulations, you have ranked first among the top hundred. You will be logged out in a few seconds. The Dark Queen's face instantly scrunches up in annoyance, clearly furious at the prospect of losing her prey. She quickly swings her arm down, attempting to execute a final move to kill Jihan. He looks up indifferently and murmurs, Well, this might be a bit much. The giant sword above him plunges down at a terrifying speed. He manages to yell, This is gonna hurt, before the sword completely pierces through him. This is the end. Leave a comment Jihan below, if you want us to do next part.